but I, I did. I kept my mouth shut. I took a lot of notes. I had an old veterinarian in Creston, Chuck Jamison, was a good guy, a real mentor to me. He said, Kurt, just take your time, but take notes. And one of the things that really bothered me for a year and a half is my dad busted his butt every day feeding calves. When I was young, my Uncle John that I showed you in the picture, John was about seven, eight years younger than my dad. He was like a fun uncle. You ever have a fun uncle, a guy that you really enjoyed being around? So he milked the cows, so my brothers and I would run out to help him milk. My dad fed calves. As we all got older and we took over the milking responsibilities, dad kept feeding calves. My brother and I, when I came back in 1994, our main job right then, we had milking 140 cows. Was to milk. We milked the cows, dad fed the calves. So for 50 years, my dad fed calves. He fed calves the morning, the morning of his passing. And in those 50 years, the first bunch of years, he fed calves in a bank barn with a whole bunch of calves run together with no ventilation. And I kept track, and we had about a 30% death loss. And I finally convinced, we convinced my dad to move outside to the hutches. You know, there's an old saying, no calves have died that were raised outside. Or no, many calves have died that were not raised outside, but nobody's ever died feeding calves outside. And my dad, when we moved to the hutches, my dad raised a hundred and some calves in a row before he lost his first one. And it was amazing. And that was the first thing that I brought back to the dairy where they started to listen to us a little bit. Now, another story I want to say about my dad real quick was my dad stuttered real bad. But I could slow my dad down and I could put my hand on his shoulder and get him to slow down a little bit and say what he was going to say. And one morning, and this is not an advertisement for Perina, but one morning he came into the parlor and he was really stuttering. And I got it out of him. We had started that cows match program and one of those calves literally leaped over top one of those hog panels. It was so healthy. And that told me that day. Not only did my dad raise calves in a bank barn for a bunch of years, I think that was the first time he ever truly saw a healthy calf. I mean it after all those years. We saw the genetic potential and the, and the beauty of a healthy calf. Now one other thing we did to get, our, to get uh, started and how we came back to the dairy was my brother and I went to a meeting one time that Bill Bicker talked about. Bicker was the guy at Michigan State University who did buildings. And I'll never forget what he told us. He says, how do you guys plan on farming around here with all these barns all cooped up? And uh, he says, you gotta open these barns up. And this has been a couple years after I was back on the farm. And that afternoon, my brother and I went home and we cut the sides off the dairy barn with a skill saw. And my uncle and John came home and that's what they found, was the sides off the old, old dairy barn. We have since tore it down or I'd show you pictures. So I'm not telling you young guys to go home and tear the sides off the dairy barn. You might be out the door today's day and age, but I'm here to tell you, somehow you got to get across, you're going to make some changes. And, and that was what, how we did it. Now, we built this barn, you know, in 1994, 95, I came back to the dairy and we built just a common dairy barn in 95 and 2002, we added on to it. We had an old parallel or an old herringbone parlor we were milking in. This is in 1998, and our dairy, one thing I want to tell you about our dairy, we're proud of our dairy, but our dairy is, is it's, not, it's not all add-ons and attachments and all that kind of thing, but we do try to, to do, um, make good decisions and, and spend money where money needs to be spent. We had an old hair, uh, herringbone parlor. I was ready to go out and build a brand new parlor. We had went and looked at a lot of facilities. And then a guy walked in one day and he says, why don't you just convert your herringbone parlor double six into a double ten parallel? And we did it. And uh, we have milked a lot of cows in that parlor. We're milking almost 20 hours a day right now, three times a day. And the guys that are in milk, this thing has really held up for us. We've made a few adjustments to the vacuum and that kind of thing, pulsation and takeoffs and things like that. But we've done well. And Eric and I, my brother, have talked different times about you know, is it time now? I'm 56, he's 52. Is it time to go out and, and build something different? Or do you, do you wait for the kids to come back if they're going to come back and then build it? That's one of our questions. We'll get to that in a little bit. So we, we don't have a super fancy facade on the front of our parlor and we don't have our name anywhere and things like that. But we do have a, a nice little setup and um, we had a little fake brick on the front when we expanded the milk house to make it look nice. And we try to do things to keep our place looking nice around there. You know, I just do believe that there's a guy down in our area who owns a wood company called P. Graham Dunn, and I was reading his book the other day, and he said, you know, there's just something about a clean facility. 
Now, I got a neighbor whose place is so clean, I couldn't possibly keep it that clean. But we try hard to keep our place clean and, and, and keep the, ad, the atmosphere nice around there. So in, in uh, 2009, we built this new dairy barn. It was, a, it was uh, added uh, 300 and some stalls. And so now we have our dairy consists of 650 milking cows, and we have about well, because we live in Ohio and 700 is the maximum, you shouldn't be over until you get a permit. We have, uh, see, if we have 650 milking cows, we have 49 dry cows, I guess, and then we're 699 cows at the dairy. And one of the things that we really try hard to do is cow comfort. It's all about cow comfort at our place. And, you know, I have had people come through our dairy at different times. I tell them I wouldn't be afraid to sleep in the first freestall in this barn for about 10 months out of the year. It's a good environment up there. The cows are laying on sand. It's cool. Um, the fans are blowing all the time. We've got misters and sprinklers. We really try hard to take care of our cows. And I just believe that, you know, the healthier we are taking care of cows, the, uh, the cows are, the better off we're going to do. Now, I'll tell you a little story. This, uh, we've had groups come out to our farm already and things. And I had a group out there one time. It's probably been seven, eight years ago, and I had a group came out, and I could tell it was a group out of Worcester. In fact, the dog warden was with them. Somehow this group included the dog warden, and I kid you not, the dog warden took a look at our family dog, and it didn't have tags, and they threatened to give me a fine right there on the spot. I said, you got to be kidding me. So I invited you to my dairy, and just because my dog doesn't have a tag. So we had a little discussion about that. But uh, anyway, a guy in there, our dry cows were in had the ability to go out to pasture. But on this particular day, they were all inside. And they got to asking me, how come your cows aren't out on pasture? And, and, and this conversation started to, you know how they start out. They start out kind of nice, and then they start pushing a little bit. You know, are you, are you against your cows being out in the pasture? I said, no, I'm not. A, and so I said, let me show you something. So I went out to this dry cow barn, and we pushed all the cows out into the pasture. I knew exactly what was going to happen. It was about 95 degrees out that day. And they went out there in the pasture, and we walked back around into this barn. It was cool in there and everything. And I was giving a little talk at the end of this barn. And I was watching those dry cows go back in that barn. And I asked the guy, I grabbed him when I got done talking. I said, hey, did you see where those cows went? And he said, they went back in the barn. And I said, uh, talked to him about a little bit, the value of that. And then I said, um, hey, where's your dog at today? And he goes, how do you know I got a dog? I said, everybody has a dog. I said, where's your dog at today? He said, I locked him on my back porch. I said, why'd you lock him on the back porch? He said, it was, it's hot outside. I said, see, that's exactly the same thing we got going in our industry. We may not have massive big fields for our cows to be in, but we take care of them. And I've seen cows already. When we built this barn in 1990, or excuse me, in 2009, I had a crazy thing happen the first morning I put the cows in the barn. I was walking up to the barn to bring them down to milk them, and we had waters right inside the first gate. There was a water, and we have a massive concrete structure behind the water. I couldn't see through, and there wasn't a cow in the barn. You know where they were? They were all laying down. And that's the first time I had ever seen that in my life. The other barn's a sawdust barn with mattresses. And every time I'd go get cows to get them, there'd be some mingling around. I went up to that sand barn that first morning. I took a picture. I don't have it anymore. I looked over that concrete, and I thought they were gone. I mean, literally gone. And, and the concrete was about this high. And I crawled over and looked, and every cow was laying in a stall. And that's when I knew we had made the right decision, and it was a good thing for cow comfort. We don't have sand lanes and things like that. In fact, today I told my boy, well, yesterday when I left, I told my boy, get that crew rounded up, and when I come home, I'm hoping that sand pit's hauled out. I know it's a little bit, you know, we'd like to reuse our sand. A lot of guys in our area do, but we've chosen not to. Sand's not that expensive, and uh, it's a simple way of doing it, and it works really fine for us to help us get to the numbers that Alan talked about. Now... I, you heard that thing about Bickert said about tear barns down, and I never forgot that. My dad and my uncle in 1970 moved to our dairy, and they moved to the dairy in 1959. In 1970, they built, kind of added on to some barns. They built a lot of concrete. They, they built a freestall barn. They uh, 
decided that they were going to have a, we had an outside feeding area that we converted into. A lot of cows were fed outside. Mm -hmm. And my brother and I decided we were going to tear it all out of there and start over. And I talked to my Uncle John about it. And he, was, he agreed it's probably the thing to do, but it's kind of hard to rip out everything your dad did. Mm -hmm. But we ripped it all out and we put in this dry cow barn. And I'll tell you what, um, dry cow, dry cow care, mm -hmm. The only place we spend time on our dairy with our cows is in the dry cow barn mm -hmm. and the post fresh barn. And that's basically it. The only time we go up to the high producing barns is when we have vet check. Mm -hmm. um, we might walk through the barn, of course, to do a little bit of synchronized breeding and things like that. But right here is where we've done, since we built this barn in 2017, our numbers have just went out of this world. It's about dry cow care. It's about moving your cows to the right place at the right time. It's about making sure 24 days before they fresh, they're in the pre-fresh where they need to be. It's about making sure your heifers are 30 to 35 days, 40 days even into the pre-fresh. And I tell you, our problems, if when we have problems, we can go right back to how our dry cow care was. You know, I said, we, we do what's called uh, just on time calving. We have one pen for calving cows. I was in a meeting one time and a young guy, we were supposed to all talk about what was the next facility we were going to build. And this young guy was talking about building a facility that had, he was all proud. He had all the plans and everything. He said, I'm going to build a facility for my fresh cows. And he said, I'm going to have six pens to put my dry cows in before they have calves so nobody calves in the manure. And I'm looking at this thing, and this is against everything Alan's ever taught me about taking care of a dry cow. And I was looking around, and everybody's taking this in. There's about 12 of us in the group. And I don't know how many of you guys know uh, Lambert out there, Lambert Vandermaid in western Ohio, but old Lambert, he'll say what he's thinking. And I looked at Lambert, and Lambert looked at me, and I said, are you going to tell him or am I? We kind of, through our eyes is how we communicated it. Finally, finally, Lambert says, hey, I'd like to talk about those plans a little bit. He says, I don't agree with it. And we started talking about it. And we saw that guy a year later, and he said, I decided not to build that barn. I built one like you guys talked about. The less time we spend moving our dry cows, the better off our dry cows do. If I was going to freshen a cow, I'd love to find her with the feet out, and I move her right away to the calving pen, and she calves, and she goes right to our post fresh. And our problems are so limited, they don't have diet changes, they don't have environmental changes, they don't have water changes, there are no changes. The only change they have is going from being a dry cow to a fresh cow. And we have one calving pen for all our cows. It gets a little bit crowded every now and then during the week or during the day maybe if four or five of them decide they're going to calve. Always on Saturday night and Sunday morning. But um, that's how we do it and I think that's one of the things that we've really done right on our dairy. Now. After we build these barns and everything, and our dairy started to get bigger, we went from 140 cows to, and this is more about the talk that I'd really like to give. You know, of course, in today's day and age, it's impossible to find workers. I know you, everybody's got the same problem. I don't care what industry you're in. We drove up here. I couldn't believe all the signs. I mean, the way people were advertising trying to get workers is amazing. And I've always been one of these guys that, that believes that people have got talent. You just have to find out what their talent is. It's no secret in the dairy industry, Hispanics are a big part of what we do. This young boy doesn't work for me anymore because he had a family member out in Oregon that he had to go out and be with for some other reasons, and so he's not here anymore. But I tell you, when this young guy showed up, one day I was checking the fresh cows, and I was walking down through there with some keto sticks, and he said, hey, boss, you checking pH? He had only been up here from Guatemala for a short time. I know I'm checking for ketosis, and he walked on. And then he come back a little bit later, and he said, uh, he said, what do you do with the colostrum? He asked me, what do you do with the colostrum? Well, here's a guy talking about pH sticks and colostrum from Guatemala. This, guy's got, this guy knows something. How does he know this? And so I got to talking to him through an interpreter. I got my interpreter on, one of the guys who works here. Uh, uh, Roger didn't speak that good of English yet. Come to find out, he spent three years in Guatemala at an agriculture college. Every six months, they did a little different thing on a different species. So for six months, he was doing chickens. For six months, he was doing dairy. For six months, he was an equine. Here, this guy, he's got some talent. And so we quickly didn't take long to foster him and get him moving into some other roles on the dairy. So we gave him a lot more responsibility. I've got a guy who came up there when I first met him. I didn't know if he had any talent. But he's got a little bit of welding talent and a little bit of mechanical talent. He worked in Guatemala on a crew 
that had a lot of trucks, and he kind of was the, was the uh, mechanic. Now, I'm not going to say he could do what we do at Ray's Garage or the local dealership, but he can sure do enough to get me by. And I found out that he does a really good job. I don't like to micromanage people. I've got, you know, this calling the guys all the time and asking them what they're doing, I can't stand that. If you drop all the way down to the bottom, down, down here um, further where it says think before you react, you know, there's people that I know in the industry that if one of these, uh, one of these Hispanics or one of these workers hits a gate with a skid steer, they go crazy. But we got skid steer blight at our place. Do you guys have that at your place? You know, it happens. But I'm going to tell you something. Do you ever try to drive a skid steer on a six-hour shift all day long? I get on a skid steer, and it isn't about 20 minutes to I realize it would be best if I was off the skid steer. <laughs> And that's 20 minutes, and these guys are doing it every day. I can't believe the hours on these skid steers because we scrape so much. And, and these guys, you know, you can't fly off the handle every time something like this happens. You're not going to have a work crew. And these guys got to be feel comfortable enough with you that they'll come back to you and tell you when they've done something wrong. The other day, one of the guys got a hold of me. Boss, I got a big problem. Okay, big problem. What's a big problem? Hey, boss, he said, I break something on the gate. I put it on top of the uh, desk. He said, I didn't want you to know it's there. Well, nothing makes me matter to have, if you have the kind of a personality that they can't come to you when they made a mistake. He's calling me to tell me, hey, I knocked the hinge off the gate. It's on your desk. I did it. Will you please fix it for me? That's all he's asking. Alessandro's a tremendous worker on our dairy. And, and, and I think we have that kind of a relationship, my brother and I, back and forth that we can, ha we can talk about and just do those kind of things. We hold meetings with the guys. We blow through pizza like you've never blown through pizza at our place. But I tell you what, they like pizza. Chicken pepperoni, or excuse me, chicken pineapple. And they'll eat a lot of it. And uh, they, they enjoy that. And so we try to do, we try to keep it positive. I like to go watch, when I talk about managing my people, you know, our guys like to play soccer. We got, they built a little volleyball net down there at their house where, I, where they stay at one of our houses. They've got this homemade volleyball net, but it's kind of neat. They'll go down there and play. They play in this soccer league, and I like to go watch them play soccer. They play in Sterling on Thursday nights. I think half the dairy in the area is kids or guys are over there at 6 o'clock. You wonder where they're at, man. At 6 o'clock, they're in Sterling playing soccer. There are a whole bunch of them. But they like to have fun, and they like if you show up. They like if you watch them and make them part of your family life. So I've tried to do a lot of things. I know a lot of you do. Bottom line is I try to trust them. And I try to give them the impact. And we don't have a lot of turnover. We have guys who've been there for 10 years and 8 years and 5 years. But we do have a couple on the bottom end and move on. But we try hard not to let that happen. I was, was, and I just wanted to throw, told Julian I was going to put his picture up there. That's the old guy in there. I said, Julian, I'm going to put you in the talk. So there he's up there. Um, you know, and then Alan talked about this team approach. And I, you know, the older generation tends to not like to share numbers and things like that with other people. Um, you know, Johnson's been with me for 20 years. I, he knows more about me probably than, than a lot of people. And so I'm not afraid to share numbers with, with my team. And my team used to consist of Alan and, and uh, our veterinarian, Gabe in the back there. And we would talk about things. and and. Um, we really don't make major decisions without running a buyer team because they, they're out there and they see a lot of what's going on. Now, I'm one of these guys, I don't have to have my nutritionist coming to me every Friday morning and tell me about the neighbor. I, I don't need to know about the neighbor. In fact, farming would be a heck of a lot easier if you didn't have neighbors, wouldn't it? You know, if you didn't have to watch a neighbor going down the road all the time and all you could do is farm, you'd be all right. But my problem is I see old Jimmy Winkler's guys flying down 504 getting something done, but I'm spinning my wheels, and it gets hard. So I don't ask him a lot of questions about what's going on. But they do have expertise, and they've, been, they've seen a lot of things. And so you come up with some cockamamie idea that you're going to do, and he says, hey, wait a minute, I've seen that, and it don't work. Listen. I listen to that kind of stuff, and so I think that's positive. So... When we, have, we started out with this team thing, you know that I'm going to talk a little bit, a little bit about my father passing away um, and the importance of succession planning. That's kind of why I've been asked to speak. But we talked about in this team thing, what do we do well? You know, what, what, is our, what, do we, what is our strengths and what are our weaknesses on the dairy? And our strengths are we're, we're cow guys. 
My brother and I and my son Christian, we like cows. What do I not good at? Well, I don't have grease under my fingernails, I'll tell you that. I'm not very good. You know, my, you know when, when my dad and uncle, I was the oldest of five boys, when we were farming and, ba and uh, baling hay or chopping and we had to work on gravity wagons, chains and all that kind of stuff, we'd drag these pieces to the shop and my dad and uncle would say, hey, you go do something else, we'll fix it. Well, I took that to heart, I can't fix anything. And so, um, I'm not ashamed to admit it, that's not my strength. My strength is taking care of cows. What are some other weaknesses we have? Well, because we're not equipment guys, maybe it's in our best interest not to have a lot of equipment. And as we sat down and looked at numbers and things, I see a lot of my friends are trying to do it all with big equipment. I don't own a Fent tractor and all these other things. Some guys do, and that's fine. But I know one thing, this last week when the custom harvester pulled in with seven guys, I didn't have to find any of them. I can't find guys now to do anything. So these custom harvest guys roll in and they whip out, you know, 400 acres and 9,000 tons or whatever it was and they left. I sure didn't do anything in the shop. We did have to pump up a tire. But that was about it. And the chopper broke one day and I went on with what I'm doing. Another strength of mine is I think I'm a pretty good dad. And I, say, I don't say that lightly. I'm not in this business to kill myself. I'm not in this business to work 18 hours a day. I'm in this business, well, I'm on this earth to get to heaven. That's what I'm really on here for. And I'm gonna try to lead that lifestyle. And if we have to work 14, 15 hours a day to get our work done, that's not for me. That's not my strength. My strength is getting out of bed in the morning, putting in a solid day, and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we like to be done. Now, was I pushing feed at 7.30, 8 o'clock the other night? You bet I was. Do I have to plant corn in the dark? Sometimes, but not often. But... So my strength is, is trying to be a family man, trying to be a good cow man, trying to be a good example, trying to be a good leader in my community, in my church. And I want time to do that kind of stuff. So we, when I came back to the dairy and we started working with my family, we soon went on to three time a day milking. Why? Because all the activities happened between five o'clock and eight o'clock at night. And that's when we weren't milking cows. We milked at four and noon and eight at night. So sometimes we had to milk the night shift. But you know what? From five to eight, I could be with my family. We come from a very faith-based area. Dinner's important. Well, you can tell by looking at me, dinner's important. But dinner's important. Family time's important. Sitting around the table is important. We try hard to get there. And I think we were pretty successful. But we had to work some late at night till we got our dairy up big enough till the workers could help do it. So those were our strengths. And then our weaknesses, of course, like I said, was equipment. And as we've, the dairy's gotten bigger, we, we got out of the manure handling business too. We have somebody come in and do it for us. And there's no better feeling. Well, the other day, I'll tell you a story. We, uh, I was, uh, we were hauling sand out of this dry cow barn we built. And uh, I told the guys that I had to meet with my sister-in-law for something here. And uh, I uh, told him, I said, I'm gonna quit at six o'clock and that crew of guys, they, uh, I came out at 3.30 in the morning to feed, start feeding, and uh, I noticed the pit was empty. I couldn't believe it. Here they had rounded up a couple guys and said, we're going to knock it out. It's going to rain. It never did rain, but they had to work done, and I'm thankful. So a high-producing cow will help pay a lot of bills, and custom harvesting and fall manure, all manure, are two areas that we've really cut out. How are we doing on time, Alan? <laughs> Okay, so after we built this team up and everything and we, we, we worked with this team, then, then we got into this thing about what, it, what is truly your cost of production. We wanted to do some things on the dairy that were, were um, I don't know, we were just trying to figure out we were, where we were at. And I decided that we were going to get a, um, a guy came into the area, financial planner, Deem, um, Deem Associates, and they've really helped me out a lot. If you want to see later, I can show you some graphs and things that they did for us, but we really didn't have a clue what our budget was. We didn't have a clue what our cost of production was. We had no clue about any of that. We th you have it in your head, and you, you just know at the end of the month if there's money or not. But, you know, how are you doing year long on your budget, and how, you, you know, your repair expense, and your parlor expense, and all this stuff. And so we really sat down and pounded out a lot of numbers for the last four years 
and it has really been a big asset to our dairy. We just deci we decided that um, we probably couldn't probably couldn't move ahead like we have been able to do without this type of without this type of information. Um, we do a great job managing the people, and we've reduced our employee turnover. But I'm proud of numbers that came out of these things we found out. We found out when we benchmark against other herds that we have some crazy thing like uh, more pounds of milk going for the number of employees than, than he has in his uh, whole portfolio. Um, so we're doing some things right there. And I don't feel like we're really burning the employees out. They like the hours they're getting. So for that, we've been very successful. Um, our repair costs were high. And, and as we started to get out of this equipment business, and really we had a couple of things we really gave up recently that have helped a lot, and, and especially in the manure thing. And, and it just seems like we, we've been able to um, have more money in the account. And in tough times, that's about what it's all about, and that's where we're at. So if you know your cost of production, and you know where you're at in your cost of production, then what's the only other thing you have to know? What's going to be your price of milk? And we've worked with Alan through Land of Lakes, and we've been able to work through that insurance program, and we've been able to basically protect ourselves on the bottom end in our milk price. And it's like an insurance premium, and I've got to pay insurance premium costs, but in the last two and a half years since we've been doing it, we've got checks back two times, two different times. I don't know what the numbers are exactly, how much behind we are because of the insurance, but I know one thing, I'm sleeping a whole lot better because I know that where I'm at, I'm gonna at least be making money. I don't have to make a lot, but I just need to be profitable. And through this program that Land O'Lakes has, it's been, it's been very good for us. Their cap program and the feed side of things is really a good program for us. You know, when the price of feed goes down, we get the downs, you have to pay a little bit of a, maybe a $10 a ton cap, but when the price of feed goes up, you're protected. So the more I can be protected and the more I know where I'm at, the better off I think I am. So we, in 2009, um, as a family, we were cruising along and it couldn't have been better for us. Our children were young, my daughter was coming out of high school, things were going really good for us. And uh, Sunday of the Super Bowl on February 1st, 2009, Dad was out in the barn and we had a great morning together. I remember that it wasn't uh, anything extra special except that when he left, Gave him a thumbs up and he went down to drive. And that's the last time I saw my dad alive. My dad had a heart attack that night. Um, right before the Super Bowl, a lot of people in here who were family or friends know, knew my dad, know exactly where they were when his uh, passing happened. He was a good, good man. He, um, my dad was one of these guys that was more of a, on a dairy farm. He didn't like anything to do with the business side of things. He just liked to work. And he just enjoyed seeing, enjoyed seeing his boys taken over. And he didn't cause friction for that next generation. He wanted it to work. Um, and so as we came back, my brother Eric and I, as we were on the dairy, uh, we would talk to my dad and uncle. They were very receptive to a lot of things we wanted to do. I said earlier, you young guys, you have ideas, and the old guys have ideas. Somewhere this has to mesh. I just can't, I don't get it when the older generation has younger kids that want a farm and can't give that up. Um, there is no better joy to me, except for my personal life with my Lord, that, and my wife, because she's sitting here, <laughs> that I have than when I can see my son come onto the dairy and somebody wants to take this thing over. That is just a pleasure. And so I really want to encourage everybody to try to get to that point. So. You don't want to make big decisions when, when um, tragedy strikes. And in 2002, we had already sat down with a financial planner. And as, as I was back on the dairy now, seven years into the dairy farming, I got to asking, who's a good attorney? And everybody said, use Bob Berry from Critchfield Firm. And I said, you mean Bob Berry, my old fraternity buddy from up there at Wadsworth? And they said, yeah, he's really good. So got a hold of Bob and, and uh, we sat down and he put together a real in-depth in for the time succession plan. And in the succession plan we addressed death and buyout at death and we addressed partners, we addressed how long the young guy had to work before he could come into the business. 
on our particular farm, it's at least three years, and that doesn't mean they get to come in after three years. They have to be brought in. My uncles, I had an uncle who was a silent partner back then who gifted some to us. So when it was all said and done, when I came in in 2002 with my brother Eric, Eric and I um, had a percentage of the farm. My dad had a percentage, and my uncle John had a percentage. When dad passed away, according to the succession plan then, and through working through my, with my other brothers who weren't on the farm and with my family, Eric and I then became 54% owners of the family, and my uncle John is 46% owner. And so my brother and I, at that time then, we uh, own the majority of the farm, and my uncle John, who's a super uncle, very f uh, fun man to work with, um, owned 46%. John, uh, John fed the cows. John's family is not involved in the dairy. John was our feeder for a lot of years. And Uncle John, unfortunately, and about six years ago, five, six years ago, one morning when he was preparing to go for a, on a trip, John had a stroke. And for a year, he was off the dairy until he recovered enough to come back. He was back for a, few, for a little bit of time, and then John had a heart procedure that was done. And when Uncle John had his heart procedure, he never really has worked back on the dairy. He comes around to see us, but he's really now a silent partner. And I, think, I hope that I worded that correctly, but I think I did. So he's still on the dairy. So Eric and I have been working for the last year or so. John had, John had some entities that were on the dairy. John had a house on the dairy. He has, a few years before I'd moved to town, but he had a house that was on the dairy. We have Steinhurst Dairy, which is our dairy part, and we have the land, 700 acres of land that we own. Because all those are big things, we decided that we were going to um, first tackle the house. And so my son Christian decided he wanted to get out of the house, so he bought the house. And in this last year, we've been talking with John about what his value of the dairy is, and we were looking for, we've been looking forward to all this coming to my brother and I. Bear with me. Last month, on August 16th, this happened to my brother. My brother was, um, my brother had prostate cancer. He had some blood issues <clears throat> and uh, in partnerships, you farm 27 years with somebody, it can hurt. I wrote this about my brother for a Facebook post because people wanted to know what happened. Eric had prostate cancer and Eric was getting ready to go have surgery one morning. He came, one of the rules that our wives had at our place was we weren't allowed to wash our clothes in the washer and dryer in the house, the barn clothes. I didn't understand why. We used to have to take our clothes to the barn. <laughs> we took them to the barn and washed them. And Eric was getting his clothes the morning he left for surgery. And he got his clothes, and he was walking out the front door. I said, hey. He turned around. I said, Eric, I love you. I said, I love you. Don't worry about coming back. We'll take care of it. I was talking the four to eight weeks recovery time from the prostate surgery. He came home from surgery. He was home for a few days. And one night the squad showed up. <coughs> Something had happened. And he had, went under full cardiac arrest with a blood clot. He was in the hospital for a few days. And his wife, Tricia, had to make the decision to take him off life support. You know, I've been through this with my, with my dad. You know, I came back 27 years ago to farm with my dad, my uncle, and my brother, and none of them got to walk off the dairy the way we envisioned they would walk off the dairy. Go get parts for us, do things like that, just come ride along, things like that. But I'm going to tell you guys, you're not going to be here forever, and you better have it together when it comes to succession planning. The only thing that's really going to drive a true succession plan is communication. And if you can't communicate, you better start there. There's hope for our dairy, even though it's 650 cows and 700 acres. 
I said the other, I quit hauling manure that night because I had to meet with my sister-in-law. I had to meet with Eric's wife. And we're going to get it done. I don't even know exactly how. There's a verse in Psalms, one of the Psalms that talks about, I wish I had it. I was looking at it this morning. <clears throat> but it talks basically about not knowing where your workers are going to come from, but rely on the Lord. And I guess that's what we're going to do. But Eric was a, Eric was one of, just like my dad. I was the more outspoken one, and Eric was a worker. And uh, these kind of guys are invaluable on a dairy farm. And uh, so now, as we come down the home stretch, my son Christian on the left, that's the guy that was in the video earlier. He decided he's going to grow a beard. <laughs> but he's on the dairy, and he's an excellent asset to the dairy. He works with the cows now. I moved over to doing the feeding right now. Our daughter in the back is a f freshman at law. She worked for in industry, the ag industry, for f quite a few years, and now she's a freshman in law school at uh, Liberty College in Virginia. And ironically, she's always wanted to be a lawyer, and she's always wanted to do succession planning. She's always wanted to do it in agriculture. And uh, that's what she studied. Her undergraduate degree was in, in uh, agriculture. And our son in the front is a, in his master's program at Ohio State, and he uh, loves the dairy. He wanted to do what I did. He wants to work away first, and maybe God has other plans for that. We don't know. We're not going to make any big decisions until he graduates and see what happens. But uh, so that's where we're at. So I uh, just can't tell you enough the importance of having succession planning. You know, it's tough stuff. It's, it's tough to plod through. It's not fun. But uh, you go home tonight and you see your partners. I don't know why I told him I loved him. It's the only time I ever told him I loved him. But I told him I loved him the day he walked off the farm, and I'm at peace with it. So with that, that's our dairy. And I'll entertain any questions, if you would have any. question for you is when you go to have the conversation with for example like my husband's family we will eventually buy out the dairy farm um, my husband's lenient about talking to his parents about you know the planning of that if something were to happen to his parents how would you say about to go about addressing that conversation like where would you start with that <laughs> you know um, I know that all families are different. And I'm not going to tell you that it's been easy on our farm to do, to do all this. The talk I just gave resonates with the women in the crowd. Because the women in the crowd know that their husbands aren't going to live forever. And they know that it's a side of them that they don't ever want to talk about. And so, it has to start with some sort of communication and if they're willing to talk about it. Um, fortunately, we believe in sweat equity at our place. And there comes a point, if you've earned the right, if you've done it correctly, and you've earned the respect of the older generation, there comes a time when they're ready, they're, they know that that conversation's coming. It's just, a lot of times they don't want to bring it up. There's two things they have to face. They have to face the reality that their kids might be able to do it, and that scares them. And also, then, they're getting older. You know, I'm 56 years old. After all this stuff we've done and all these things I have to do, I also got to make sure that we got it ducks in a row for who's coming next. You know, we've used massive life insurance policies. Um... When my father died, 2009, that was a tough dairy year. And we had a pretty good-sized life insurance policy on my father. I had a good life insurance policy on Eric. It wasn't millions of dollars. It wasn't a million dollars. But it was a nice policy. I was able to give, or I will be able here soon, to give his widow a nice amount of money 
up front here, and then we can figure out what else has got to come. But at least I can show a good faith effort. That policy was not expensive at all for Eric. Uncle John, we have a life insurance policy on him that's a little bit, maybe you could say it costs a little more, but it's for a long period of time. And so we don't wish death on anybody. But if one of you figures out how to not die, you got something going. <laughs> and so that's what's happened, you know, it, and so in our industry right now, that's about the best way to handle it. So if you've earned the respect, you know, I, we uh, know somebody in Ohio who, who uh, struggling with a, with a father situation. Maybe they haven't been there quite long enough. You know, it was seven years till I was able to sit down with my uncles and get this put together. And they were so willing to do it. But after seven years, we had proven that we want to be there. One thing we will have in the thing coming forward is um, I have no desire to take over a major dairy and then turn around a few years later and sell it. That's not my intent. And it's okay to have something in a buy-sell agreement that says, you know what, for the next five years, as long as this thing's in the dairy, this is the price. But if you can't make it in a couple years and you have to sell out, then your partner gets X amount more because you benefited from, from the sale of the dairy. So there's a lot of things you can do with good, good financial consultants. But, but you, you can't just b go into a conversation like that some night after there's been maybe a little riff or something. That ain't going to work.
Good morning. Welcome to the 2021 World Dairy Expo. This morning's seminar is the changing landscape of milk marketers and processors presented by Corey Geiger, managing editor of Hordes Dairyman. Till recently, change in dairy markets have been rather subtle. That has dramatically shifted with milk markets now evolving at a rapid pace. While we all need specialized dairy product plants, component balancing has become an issue rising to the forefront. The reality today is the collective dairy industry must produce the right products for the growing dairy uh, export market, making plant infrastructure a top priority. Building on insight gleamed from several global dairy related trade missions, Corey Geiger, managing editor of Hordes Dairyman, will help unravel the complexities of domestic milk markets and global dairy trade. A 26 member or 26 year member at Hordes Dairyman, Geiger has led editorial content for nearly a decade. He is also president of the Holstein Association and other dairy industry organizations. With deep dairy fam farm roots, Geiger earned degrees in agricultural economics and dairy science from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. This seminar has been approved for continuing education credits from the American Registry of Professional Animal Scientists. Forms are available in the back of the room if you're interested in these credits. I would like to ask everyone to please silence their cell phones at this time as well. Corey? Thank you, David. Thank you, David. If you're interested in seeing the power uh, PDF of this talk after the uh, presentation is done later today, we're going to put that on the, uh, on the World Dairy Expo website, and it'll be under the educational seminar. So I'm going to put the entire slide deck out there. Normally, the speakers just do a short synopsis, but uh, I, I think the research that we've done here to make this uh, is something that you might want to sh share more widely. So David talked about that. I, uh, my background is actually I was an agricultural economics major. So and, and in the past 26 years, I've uh, been involved in journalism. Why should we talk about dairy markets here? U.S. dairy is a growth. We're making more milk. If you think about it, when I graduated from college in 1995, we had about 9.3 million cows. We have the same number of cows today, and this productivity has increased tremendously. So in the past 10 years, milk production is up 16%, or 30 billion pounds. This is all US data, of course. In the past 20, 30, 20 years, we've made one third more milk production. We've grown a lot. And what I want to do here is set the stage for what's happening here in the United States. And then we're going to talk about what milk pricing and milk future looks like. I think this is really important here. The milk, this is not milk consumed, this is milk produced for every citizen. During that time, during 20 years, we went from 596 pounds to 679. And what we're going to share in a little bit here, our domestic consumption clearly hasn't kept up with that pace. And that's where exports come into play. This is per capita consumption. So economists would say per capita means how much is every person in this room and every person in the country eating. And we put this on a milk production equivalent. So this is milk pounds. But obviously, people eat cheese and eat butter and those kind of things in it. So we convert that all. In 1980, the average American was eating 543 pounds of milk in all these different product forms. The dairy checkoff came in 1983, as that is a benchmark. And this graph shows all this data over time from 1975 to 2019. The source is the United States Department of Agriculture. 1990, we're up to 568 pounds. And just this past year, 653. And ironically, this afternoon, the 2020 data will be posted on the USDA website. So we'll have 2020 data here uh, probably about 2 o'clock. Americans are eating a lot more dairy products. What that looks like is a lot different over the course of time. So it's evolved. We're eating our dairy. We're not drinking it. We've had 22% domestic. So that per capita number has grown 22% since 1975. That's big growth. The non-fluid category, cheese, butter, Yogurt, ice cream, all those solid products is up 71%. Those who follow dairy 
know that the fluid category isn't doing as well. That's down 41% since 1975. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We're going to talk about those. We do talk a lot about school milk. School milk is very important. There's a lot of discussion. We can't currently put whole milk in school milk. Perhaps one day we can uh, get that changed. But there's other things at play besides school milk. So here's what fluid has done over the course of time. I just want to put that slide up here. The far uh, left there on that screen is 1988, and then we go to 2021. We had a lot of uh, news last March and April and May when the pandemic came upon us that there was a uh, jump, uh, spike in fluid milk sales. That basically went away. So fluid milk has been on a downward trend for 62 years. Economists will use a word called complements. Milk and cold cereal are a really big complement. Another complement would be hamburgers and ketchup, right? They go, people put them together. One third of all fluid milk is poured onto breakfast cereal. Breakfast cereal and hot cereal is down 17% since 2019, and that's a source that is BIS World. So we talk about drinking it at, at, you know, at home or at other places, but this is a big reason for that change. So from a dairy farm perspective, what does that mean when I'm cashing a milk check? In 2000, 33% of all the milk collected from the US national bulk tank, all the dairy farms, went to fluid milk. This year, it's going to fall under 20%. We're could be somewhere between 18 and 19 percent. That's the uh, pace of change in that category. And so the blue data on that graph, that's what's really happened so far. And then the tan or yellow there is uh, projections, and that's from USDA. Another important 30,000 foot view in this day, this slide, and this is why I'm going to put the slide deck on here, because I think uh, after the presentation, you may want to go back and digest this and share this data. And we have a lot of great statisticians. We are blessed. I travel a lot. But the United States Department of Agriculture and all the state agricultural groups gather a lot of incredible data. If you, Europe's pretty good at it. New Zealand is too. But you go to China and some of these other countries, and you just don't know what to believe. We have amazing data here. Mark Stevenson, the University of Wisconsin economist, he was on our dairy live stream that uh, we produce, talked about we're riding the cheese horse. And we're going to talk about that cheese horse. Wisconsin's the number one cheese state. If it, on that chart there, we're comparing 1990 to 2020. Wisconsin is uh, a big cheese state, and California easily holds down the second pole position. But we've had some shifts over the course of time here. Idaho is now the third largest dairy state based on milk production. They have vaulted to the third position for cheese. Uh, in another state, you'll see they're number four, New Mexico. Now you got milk that's near that Texas panhandle and New Mexico there, that's a, a, a tight regional spot there, so there's milk moving back and forth, but a lot of cheese being made there. South Dakota moved up in the 2020s, the I-29 corridor, there's a lot of growth there. And then you see a lot of traditional states there that have been ranked both uh, ways here. Cheese has been in a constant growth mode since 1991. And during that time, in the past 20 years, cheese consumption has gone from 28 to 38 pounds per person. So 10 more pounds, and obviously that takes a lot of milk to make that cheese, so we're absorbing a lot. The question is, have we reached the peak? I don't think so. We're at 38 pounds in the United States, and countries like France, Germany, and Greece are pushing 50 pounds. But in, there's other countries in Europe that are in the high 40 range. Mozzarella married pizza. I was, when I was a little boy, we had a cheese plant one mile down the road called Canson Cheese, and they were one of the first mozzarella, major mozzarella makers. They didn't, maybe were a little bit on the bleeding edge, didn't make it, went into bankruptcy. But there's other places like Laprino that grabbed on to uh, mozzarella right away. And, and think about how people, I mean, People didn't go to as many restaurants back in 1977. And you think now today that we're about 50-50 balanced pre-pandemic of eating at home and eating out. So mozzarella has gone from 2.5 pounds to 8 
to 12.5. So we got these chart comparisons here again. Mozzarella is uh, the leading cheese right now. This past year it had a small blip. It's been in constant growth mode all the way since 1977. But during the pandemic, a little less cheese was going on pizza pies. Another story here is butter. Butter was at 19 pounds pre-World War II. Then there was the supply, the, the troops. Then all this, whatever kind of science you want to call it, came out and said animal fats and butter were bad and, and um, butter troughed. We have done some rebound here in Time Magazine. The, confess their sins, if you will, put butter back in the cover. Uh, if some of you were call in the 70s, they basically had a cover that said butter will kill you, right? And so we've learned a lot more in that carbohydrates is probably far more of an issue than any other categories. So butter consumption now is at the highest level since Lyndon Baines Johnson was president after Kennedy died. And of course, the thing that we've done so well on is way sales. We didn't have a way to capture that. What we knew, and I... Some of you may know I wrote a book here in March, and one of the things that farmers from yesteryear, generations ago, would take after their cheese plant, they'd bring their way back home, and they'd feed it to little pigs, and that was a big deal in Wisconsin. All those little pigs eventually made it to Iowa. There was one thing called the Wisconsin feeder pig group, and I mean, most of the dairy farms in this state in the 60s and 50s had little pigs, and they grew so well. The farmers already knew that, knew at that point that the amino acids found in whey were the most complete known to humanity. Now we have dryers, we can extract that and make a lot of different foods with whey proteins. And people in the United States are really looking for this and people around the world. Exports is a big, big story here as well. Exports, we were non-existent here in 1994. U.S. Dairy Export starts, uh, Council starts then, and we start having in incremental growth. Ten years ago, we were at 13% exports. This year, we're going to, and when I say 13%, 13% of our milk production. This year, we're going to be somewhere in that 18 and 19 range. And what I like to tell dairy farmers is this. All the cows in the country, 9.3, 9.4 million cows, either five or six days a month, are working to fill export orders now. That number was zero in 1994. Big change, big evolution. And the other thing you gotta keep in mind, export category grows. And while this is all happening, we're making more milk in the United States. Milk production's climbing. So sales numbers are hard to always wrap your hands, uh, heads around, but we're at 6.5 billion this past year, and we're probably gonna be on pet trace track here to get to 7.3. So again, we talked about US DEC. And I wanna just compare, because if a category is declining, such as fluid milk, that's the blue bar. And a category is growing, the red bar being exports. This is what it looks like on a milk equivalent basis. And this is a term that economists use to try to put things all in the same playing field. Why do we have to use milk equivalent? So a lot, lot of the milk that's drank doesn't, isn't full fat, it isn't whole milk. So if you skim that butter fat off, those solids are being used somewhere else. So we have to, Look at that. So we're bottling more fat than we're exporting, which means a lot of our butter fat is staying in the United States. If you look at milk equivalent on a protein basis, it's about equal. And we're exporting far more solids than we're bottling. What does that mean? We're keeping the butter fat back and we're selling a lot of skim milk powder. Here's an we're going to talk about three trends on the dairy farm that are taking place because I think it's important to know what's happening on our herds. This is U.S. butter fat percent from 1924 to, to this past year. I have an old book that uh, we have in our office that has some very historic USDA data, so we're able to do that. Butter fat trapped in here because butter fat was in decline. It wasn't pop, it fell out of favor. This past year, we we're at 3.95%, and I predict that probably by year's end, we will set a record for butterfat production here in the US on, on a percentage basis. And we're at the highest level since World War II. Protein, we started really measuring that probably in the 70s. And for those of you who are at sire selection and genetics, you'll know that bulls started getting ranked on protein about that time. 
Protein's a very valuable component in milk. It's probably number one, butter fat's number two. In the eight of the last 10 years, the central milk, federal milk marketing order, which is the 10 central states, kind of Missouri, Nebraska, Illinois, Iowa, protein keeps growing. And think about it. Some co-ops and processors are putting it in supply constriction, so you can't, they have overbase programs. It's expense, milk's 87-ish percent water, it's expensive to ship water, so if I raise my component levels, I'm gonna get paid more for my milk. Very, and so that's one of the key drivers. Butter fat, we can change a lot quicker in feeding programs, uh, with nutrition with cows than protein, but so it's a little easier to grow. And then obviously milk quality has improved. Just think about this. In 2003, our national DHI somatic cell count was 319,000. It took another 13 years to hit 200,000 and we're at this point today. Incredible improvement in milk, qual or milk quality. There's a triple play going on in US dairy farms. We're using a lot more sex semen. This is a data set with 27 million births here from 1981 to 2014. And anyone who's ever worked on a farm or been a farmer and delivered a big burly bull calf from a first calf heifer, you know it sets the calf back, it sets the heifer back. She may never be what reach her full potential. So that red bar is from this data set is how many heifer calves are actually being born to first calf heifers and the number of bull calves. So we're in, in our first calf heifers should be our best genetics. Genomics is the second part of that triple play technology that came out in 2008. We can pull a hair sample, look at that DNA root ball, but that's just part of the story. When I talk in China to Chinese folks, I remind them it's the database, not the DNA that drives all this because you gotta compare the DNA to that database. In pa this past year, dairy farmers ran a million genomic tests on the animals. If you figure we have nine million cows, they've paid about $45 a test to do that. And what are they doing then? We're sorting out our good heifers from our bad heifers. And those the genetically inferior heifers may be going to a second career a lot quicker than anticipated. The third part of this triple play, this is beef Semen sales in the United States from 1979 to 2020. This is from the National Association of Animal Breeders, a trade association headquartered over out in Middleton, but it, it puts together all the sales from the AI studs in the United States, including CMEX, if they're selling semen down here. Pretty flat line product. Now what we don't know is where this semen was put in. Was it put in a dairy cow or put in a beef cow? But I can intuitively tell you this. I do not know many cattle ranchers in the western rangelands that are going out and catching their cows and inseminating them. I would say that 90% of this semen is going into dairy cows and this growth has skyrocketed. Think about it. Four years ago, 2.5 million units. 2018, 4 million. 5.8 in this past year, 7.2 million units of semen going into dairy cows. So we're planting our beef calves. So where does this all mean in terms of our milk check? If you ask any international dairy company or CEO, where do you want to expand? Here's, you know, you go through it. Biggest dairy exporter in the world, New Zealand. Fonterra is a co-op there, but 90% market share. Footprint geographically is about the size of Wisconsin. They have 6 million dairy cows there. Figure we got 1.4 million in the Badger State. So not a lot of opportunity for growth there. Europe. So New Zealand's the largest exporter in the world. The United States is number two as a single country. If you put all of Europe together, they leapfrog the United States, but they have land constraints, regulatory constraints, and this is all taking place. They had a quota system not too long ago that looked a lot like Canada. And then Canada has uh, actually a lot of land mass, but between supply management, they're pretty constrained on their growth. So that where to expand is the United States, and again, the first thing you look if you're a processor, 16% growth in 10 years or 33% in 20 years, there's, there's milk to be processed and dairy consumption is on the rise. So what we're gonna talk about here is international organizations enter the marketplace, it changes the value of processing and it, if you're a domestic player, it costs more to buy if you're gonna buy someone else's plant the other thing is stainless steel and is a very expensive, and you know what the shortage of materials have been during the pandemic. The cost to build a facility is sky high. If you're at that St. John's, Michigan facility with 
what, 480, 500 million, and I'm sure if they started again today, it would be higher than that. So it's growth in the United States market a fair assessment. Here are the top 10 processors in the United States in 2001. The source is Dairy Foods Magazine. They, they focus a lot more on milk processing. What you're going to note is those are all US-based entities. That's just 20 years ago. Dean Foods doesn't exist anymore. They were number one. Kraft was number two. The third one there is uh, Land O'Lakes, co-op based out of Twin Cities. The Kroger Company, a big supermarket chain. National Dairy Holdings. The Schreiber Foods, which does a lot of cheese. DFA, which was formed a few years earlier. Laprino, and Laprino does a lot of mozzarella. F F uh, Fortune magazine called Mr. Laprino the Willy Wonka of cheese. He's a very private individual, but uh, has done a lot of work in internationally. It was a very fun story. If you ever want to Google that, it's worth a read. He's only got about two or three pictures that I've ever been made of him, and I think all three of them landed up in that article. Very private individual. Prairie Farms uh, Co-op there uh, at nine, and Dryers at ten. So just 10 years later, this, this, all, this landscape starts changing. Dean's is still number one, but then Nestle is, came in in a big way, based in Switzerland. Saputo started to develop a pretty big footprint predominantly here in Wisconsin in the upper Midwest. Uh, Kraft Foods, Land O'Lakes, Schreiber. Then here, AgriPure, Canadian co-op that uh, started purchasing assets here in the United States. Laprino, Prairie Farms, and HP Hood, which is a fluid milk processor based in the Northeast. Three international processors 10 years ago, top 10 list, Dairy Foods Magazine. More dynamic change. These are the numbers that Dairy Foods uh, came out with here just a couple weeks ago. Half of them are international. You'll see we got 10 and 11. Those are really tied. Um, Nestle. Barely holds on to the pool position here. Saputo is coming on strong. You'll see 10.9 versus 10.7. Dairy Farmers of America is now in the third position, predominantly because of their purchase of Dean Foods. Now, you see this little sidebar. If Dean Foods was pulled out of there, they'd be all the way down to the eighth position. So a couple years ago, the largest processor in the United States selling milk that was a co-op was a Canadian one. Think about that. Then Kraft Heinz, Schreiber, ConAgra, the Unilever, Lever, that's a British and Dutch based company, and then Lando Lakes and California Dairies are tied here. I want to talk about this because uh, dairy co ops are very important to dairy farming. It, we probably use co ops as much as any category in agriculture. And I think the health of our co ops. There's a lot of discussion, what more could they do for milk pricing? And I, I, part of this talk is I want everyone to leave here with this, at least seeing the whole picture of what's going on in terms of voice, politics, all those kind of things. <clears throat> so Dairy Farmers of America, so these pound numbers, that's where they stood at different snapshots in time. What grew from seven to three, they're an anomaly. What you'll see here is everybody's actually grown their sales, but they've lost market share because we're making more milk. We're selling more dairy products. There's more inflation. So Land O'Lakes goes from 3 to 10. Prairie Farms from 9 to 15. That's even after a merger with Swiss Valley. Foremost Farms, based here in the upper Midwest, goes from 12 to 28. They grew their footprint, 1.3 to 1.6 billion. AMPI went from 15 to 26. California Dairies is another one that bucked this trends here a little bit with DFA. They actually improved their ranking. Agrimark goes from 25 to 39. And then the other ones here, I share them so that people in the audience um, can see what other parts of the country I do. Maryland, Virginia, obviously, where they're based out of upstate Niagara's in New York, Tillamook's in Oregon. And for those who came late, uh, the, the, all the PowerPoint slides will be a PDF here later today on the uh, World Dairy Expo website under when you look up the educational seminars. Also, some co-ops did some very dramatic growth. Dairy Gold, recently now number 22. Organic Valley, number 35, based in Lafarge. They weren't even really a major player 20 years ago. Michigan Milks, come on strong. Bond Guards and United Dairymen of Arizona. 
there's some co-ops that are gone. Also dairy co-op, the members got a really good proposal. It was a tough decision, I know, for those people. They voted and they sold it to Saputo. Swiss Valley merged into um, Prairie Farms and Danish Creamery over in California is no longer with us. So the question I ask is, have US dairy processors and co-ops kept pace on new investment? They have made investment, to be clear. I want to, they have made investment. But have they kept up with the, the international competition? I'd have to say no, based on the data we just showed. The co-ops are making calculated moves as well. So here's that international activity again. On the top group, we've gone through those ones on the far left there. Uh, now this is data, sales data for North America. So that Lala group there in Mexico, that's predominantly in Mexico. I want to be clear on that. But the way this list was assembled by dairy foods, they need to be included. Then we got the Lactalis group in France. Glanbia Nutri Nutritionals from Ireland is coming on strong. We got a big base in Idaho. Uh, Emmy, they got some plants down in Greene County. The Bell Brands and then a cheese variety that's coming on strong based in France uh, is here in the 41 spot. So when you put this all together, 11 of the top 41 dairy processors have headquarters outside the United States. These 4 and 11 held 130 plants in 2017. That number grew by 91 over, the, over that time. So foreign interests may process 11 to 12 percent of the milk. And when you combine that with ownership in grocery stores and that, that number that control U.S. milk may be 25 to 28 percent. That was a personal conversation I had with Roger Cady, who started his career at Washington State and eventually made his way to uh, Elanco. Where does Canada fit in? I, I think, you know, World Dairy Expo, we should talk about that. Um, Saputo's number two. Agar Pierce number five. For the most part, they're good players in, in, in the dairy sector. You've got to remember, we need investment. If we're going to keep growing our milk, we have to have someone to process it and buy it. So think about it. We went from 154 million pounds to 223. That's 45% more milk during the, that time span when Saputo and Agapure entered the market. However, we always have to remember this. Their lo first loyalty is to their home office. The next part is also that if, if I ship milk to an agri-pure plant in the United States, I cannot be a member of them. Only members of that co-op are those in Canada. So I'm not saying this takes place, but you always have to think about it is um, foreign interest when you own something or a pro processing asset, you used to have a little less than stake in U.S. dairy policy or may be a little contrary to it. So Canadian companies and co-ops can't grow at home due to supply management, and that has made the United States a very natural fit. These days, AgriPure is a US-based processor owned by a Canadian co-op. They process 61% of their milk in the United States. That's 4 billion liters and only 2.6 billion liters in Canada. That's how much this has changed. And where's my source for that? That's the 2020 annual report for AgriPure. I'm not saying this is good or bad, but I want everyone to know how we're changing. Saputo grows and grows and grows. By my count, spent about $2.6 billion on purchasing assets here in the United States since 1997. They are an American dairy processor traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange with headquarters in Canada. So from their annual report in 2021, 43% of their milk comes from the United States, 26 plants. Their biggest employee base is here in the United States, not Canada. 29% of their milk comes from Canada, 22% other countries, and 6% Europe. And for those of you who are following along here, that 14.3 number billion is bigger than I said earlier, but this includes the milk from Europe and predominantly that other country is Australia. That's how Canada's largest dairy company views the US market. It's a growth area. It's a place they want to be. It's a place that they can use to fill orders. So I have some takeaways from this here that I want to go through. Uh, Canada's largest companies are investing on both sides of the border as a trade dispute continues to brew. And uh, 
those two largest processors in Canada have larger footprints here than they do at home. And sometimes the processing uh, margins are higher here because there's milk is worth more up there because of the supply management system. And these, when that happens, they have the cash and assets to trade. Now, a lot of these uh, purchases have been made when the loonie, which is the Canadian dollar, is more in a one-to-one -one relationship with the US dollar, is when you'll see more of this take place. Dairy trade is complex. Canada likes US milk, except when US tries to sell it to its dairy products to Canadians. Think about that. Think about that the next time you see a news story. Without Canada's investment, however, where would the plant infrastructure be in the United States? 2.6 would a B billion is a lot of money invested by one company, and that's just what they spent to buy it, not to upgrade their processing facilities. To be long-term effective marketers at home in the world stage, U.S. dairy co-ops and domestic processors, domestically owned processors, must be able to retool. It requires dynamic leadership. The St. John's Michigan milk plant is a step in the right direction. Will there be enough capital and human assets to get new greenfield plants up and running and to retool existing plants? I think the thing here that really we got to also keep in mind when you think back 20 years ago, when we had conversations in the dairy community, if we had American dairy farmers and American allied industry talking, we could pretty much have them talk about that. But now that this market has changed so much, we have to expand our social licenses. We have social licenses with consumers, with the United States Department of Agriculture, Food and Drug Administration, EPA, and more. But now we have to consider what foreign corporate dairy processors want to in consumer domestic demands from outside our borders. And what a European wants or someone in Asia wants is completely different. I've been covering this topic for a while, and I always perk my ears up when others start saying some quotes. And yesterday, some of you may have been in Peter Vitaliano's talk here. And one of the things here, ceding domestic control and investment of US dairy processing is one of my greatest concerns. And Peter's an economist with National Milk. And the chairman of the board of directors at National Milk uh, shared this comment with me. We need to somehow put together an organization with dairy cooperatives can go out and borrow money to reinvest in processing. We cannot allow foreign investment to overtake our domestic markets. Every, everything changes when you lose votes. <laughs> and, and this vote is your vote in your future. So this is from USDA data here. And I, I want to say that you know, this gets a little more challenging here. There are some co states that have a lot of co-op milk and some that don't. And this was in our September 25th issue. So California's share of the US milk market's 18.5%, but they only have 16.3% of the co-op milk. So the, the same trend holds in uh, Wisconsin and in Idaho. But then you look at states like New York and Minnesota, they have 6.9% of the US milk, but 9.2% of the co-op milk. So the conversations, what I, what I put that slide up here for, is the conversations are different in different states based on how the milk is processed, who owns those processing assets. And it's a very uh, big part. And the other thing is, I hear this from time to time, and I appreciate the comment. The comment is this, the co-ops could do more to support my price of milk. The Hordes Dairyman Top 50 Co-op list will be in the October issue. The top 50 co-ops process 81% of the milk. That means 19% of that milk is independent. That's a lot. I mean, it's a lot of independent milk out there. We do need more collaboration. So <clears throat> growing market complexities require all of us, processors, dairy farmers, and international firms like to work together on this. And the US Dairy Export Council has a, a neat, uh, what I would say, uh, system to do that. So it got the seed money from the dairy checkoff. So all of us that are, produce milk. But then processors and marketers, so a, anybody that has a processing asset here can help or pay membership to use US Dairy Export Council's expertise. And then recently to grow that from 15 to 20% of our milk production going to exports, the state and regional groups think dairy farmers of Wisconsin uh, contributed more money to that. Here's some stories that I'd like to briefly share with you. This is Vietnam, a company called Vina Milk. That's all 
fluid milk. What's missing? That's not a refrigerated container, right? So if I'm spending money to get good milk powders into my country and I have humidity of 90 plus percent and 90 plus degrees and cows are miserable because <laughs> of the humidity, we also have conditions for bacteria and spores and all these other things. So Vietnam actually worked with De Lavelle and put in, at that time, the most modern processing plant in the world. Labor is inexpensive in Vietnam, but they did that so that you would have a long shelf life for these dairy products. People wouldn't be touching it through the processing facility, and a robot actually loaded that truck. That was four years ago. Here's another thing. Vietnam is a very young nation in terms of its citizenry, its people. Average age is, I think, 31 years old. Scooters rule the day. Those are all scooters from a trade show. As a, it, imagine everybody showing up at World Dairy Expo on a scooter, right? That's what was taking place there. I was with some dairy farm women on that trade mission, and I am not much of a shopper, and I'm not good with fashion. I barely know a brand name of a shirt. So we're walking through, and I go, oh, there's that little polo guy in there. That must be a Ralph Lauren shirt. What a, that must be a knockoff. And the women are like, oh, no, they make them there. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, oh, really? Two bucks a piece. I bought a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> Next day, I get to a store. If we were in the United States, that Ralph Lauren shirt would have had a security tag on it that would have been removed at, at checkout. No problem with that in Vietnam. What had the security tag? The Canna infant formula that was behind the cash register with the American flag on it behind a locked box. Because these young women here, these young mothers, would uh, work 10 to 12 days a week uh, over a month to earn enough money to buy that can so that their children have a better life. A lot of our ancestors here would do the same thing. They wanted their children to have a better life. That's how valued our dairy products are in some of these markets. And a few years later, the crew there, some of those same people hopped off a bus at the Horton Dairyman Farm, and I couldn't believe how many people I remembered from that trip. They wanted to see US dairy cows. Another quick story about dairy exports here, Japan and curves. Every, everybody know about the curves, the facility, uh, gym, gym facility that's predominantly for women? So they have them in Japan, and a couple years ago, they already had a million women going to them. What was different by the franchises here in uh, Japan versus the United States, they were also buying US whey proteins. So you had gyms and fitness people recommending to the women, and the Jap one thing you need to know about Japanese women, they are the oldest age demographic in the world. Live well in their 90s. What's their number one concern? Will I be mobile enough? I only had one child. Who's going to take care of me? And they're going to work out. And the next thing they're doing is they're taking those whey proteins and putting them in, mix in drinks or smoothies and those kind of things. Because again, those whey proteins have the best amino acids known to humanity. And it'll build muscle mass. Very unique partnerships taking place internationally. So I want to wrap this up so we have a little bit of time for questions here. What's the future? I mean, you all saw what milk production keeps doing. It keeps growing. So we have to find a home for that if our industrious dairy men and dairy women want to keep making more milk. So looking through data that we had in Hordes Dairyman one day, Tom Gallagher here announced he's going to be retiring uh, from Dairy Management Inc. Uh, this week. But by 2026, we will need to grow our export between 25 and 42% of US production if our US milk production continues to grow. I mean, I, I tell dairy farms in my home state of Wisconsin, we've been in the export market since Governor Horde secured the first refrigerated rail car in 1888 to ship cheese to New York. We were just exporting our dairy, dairy products out of state. Now we're exporting them out of country. And remember, 95% of our customers live outside the United States. A couple other takeaways. The pace of this change is going to continue even faster. Dairy markets will change faster moving forward than in the past. We will be better when we work together. I actually have witnessed so far in my professional career, there is more synergy taking place in dairy than I ever saw previously. 
that's a good thing. We need to keep that going. Dairy product innovation takes investment. It's whether it's money from checkoff programs or if it's internal money from processors. We need to, you know, the Idaho Milk Producers Association, our Processors Association developed a consortium and I spoke at their meeting here last month. They had 25 students in the room. Not one of them had a dairy background. But that group went together to fund scholarships and they have them come to their industry meeting and hear what's going on because they don't have a very native dairy industry in Idaho. They need to bring their talent in. It was wonderful to see. And those students were so engaged in asking questions and interacting with the people running the industry right now. We, ha we have to continue to grow our domestic market. We have more room for cheese. We have more room for butter. Think back, 100 years ago, we were at 18 pounds per person. We're at 6.5 now. I, will we ever return to that number? Probably not, but we certainly can get, we can, we can grow butter a lot. Remember, consumers want convenience. We better make something that's easy for them. And that convenience is centered on portable dairy products. And U.S. dairy is global, both on the processing and marketing side. That is going to continue as well. So with that, I think we have a little time for questions here. At least we, we're top of the hour, so we got about 10 minutes here. Does anybody have a question that they'd like to ask? I should probably have someone run the mic here instead of me. <laughs> Dave, would you do that? Since they're recording this. So question, if, if we um, market that's only fluid, let's say for instance Missouri, we have only fluid plants, the question for the next generations is what future do we have? Because processing's probably not going to come to Missouri and put a powder plant or a cheese plant. What's our path forward? Mm -hmm. That's an important question for a to, do, to talk about, the fluid will continue to be a product that especially children are going to be drinking it. However, long term, you're going to have to look at retooling some plants and thinking about other products. I, I, will we stem the tide on fluid milk? Perhaps. Will it rebound? I personally don't believe so. So then you, you, one has to really think about what other products and what markets can we develop. I, I mean, that's my honest answer. Corey, uh, I thought perhaps you might touch on uh, non-dairy dairy replacements. Do you want to talk about that a little bit and what your thoughts are there? Mm -hmm. So every, people see the percentages. We have plant-based products. We have lab-grown products that are coming about as well. We're never going to put a genie back in the bottle. However, what we need to do is continue to innovate because there's a lot of things that we deliver through a dairy product that you can't mimic anywhere else. Now the question is, there's a group of people out there that may prefer to get something from a plant or a lab and maybe have a stance on animal agriculture that may counter to you and I. The question is if, if, if that group is against perhaps a GMO, the salmon, that high growth salmon, will they turn around and actually then eat something from a petri dish? I, I want to see how that plays out. I, I question that that will take place. Maybe I'll be proven wrong on that. But there's a lot of things, you know, one of the buzzwords right now is natural. Is anything about that natural? Not really. I think plant base is here to stay. There's a demographic that's going to have it. What is positive is almost all those households that are buying those things are also buying dairy products from cow's milk. And if we keep that trend going, we will be in a good place. There's a question right here. Oh, you did? OK, same question. Corey, as an educator with dairy students um, at Cal Poly, we face the same 
Am I, I may not have turned the microphone on. Just double check that on the bottom. Yep. Is that, there we go. It's on. Um, aseptic milk is, is the Vietnam milk we're talking about. In the industry, I, I think, you know, the question is, aseptic as school milk is something I'm trying to push very hard because our fluid milk market, you know, where I am in San Luis Obispo is not there. It's non-existent. We're ways from the valley. You know, California's huge, but so one of the things we've done to diversify is we sell to some local co-ops and aseptic we want to put into schools. But the funny thing is, is the schools seem extremely open to buying that milk from Cal Poly because they don't have the exposure to dairy. How can we expand on that and, and just grow that model? Because I feel like if we could, maybe there would be more opening for fluid milk. I thought about bringing that up with his first question. When you talk about convenience and shipping and all these things, well, an American consumer doesn't have a flavor profile really yet for the UHT or aseptic milk, and that is the issue. There is uh, research at some of the food science groups. I know in the North Carolina one with Marianne Drake and uh, Dr. Barbano up in Cornell. We, we, we probably need to, well, not probably, we need to put some energy into that because if we can get a product to last six months instead of the short span that we have right now, that will be a big contributor to any potential rebound on fluid milk. It's gonna take, it's a different flavor. It, it absolutely is, and if you haven't grown up with it, and that's why the research needs to get put into that to, you know, do we have to fortify it with more protein, whey proteins or something to mimic the taste that you get from a cold glass of milk. And then what, I mean, if unless labor rebounds anytime soon, with all the shipping issues that we have, if, if we can get an extended milk shelf life product, th there's a lot of future in that. It's gonna take a lot of research and paradigm shifting to reach that, but I, I think it's worth it. I do. Um, I believe, personally, there is a tremendous future in the fluid market of kids, people drinking milk. I believe that if we were to take the philosophy, apparently, that Vietnam has of teaching these young mothers about the value of milk, we'd improve our fluid sales a lot. Um, <clears throat> just two weeks ago today, I spent four days doing a survey on milk. I'm a retired dairy farmer and feed salesman, and I interviewed uh, 303 people, random people, about milk. <clears throat> and as long as we continue to offer milk table warm versus ice cold, you're not going to get people to drink milk. 88% of the people said we like cold milk. Only 12% said we'll drink it warm if we have to. Nobody wants skim milk. 90% of them said we want nothing to do really with skim milk. <clears throat> and there's a reason for that because the uh, flavor is in the fat. Right. right? <laughs> but as long as we continue to let the government, and I'm not telling you how to do it, get it changed because I don't know yet, but as long as we let the government say we cannot put good milk in the schools, you cannot expect kids to drink milk. And so, if we were to educate the mothers, we were to serve them cold milk, and we served them what they want, and you also saw that during the pandemic, the fluid milk went up during that time. Now, there's probably reasons that I don't know about, but how much money did we see put into advertising whole milk from the DMI in the last, I don't know how long. I almost think it was zero. Uh, so we've got to educate our mothers. We got to serve cold milk. We got to get them off that skim milk. And we have to believe that people do actually love milk. They told me they love milk. Any other questions? 
Kardashians. Uh, <laughs> Is it a question or a statement? <laughs> well, I'm going to make this into a statement now, or a, qu a question, and probably a statement. But we all know that light, like this light right up here, hurts the hurts milk, uh, lowers the, vi the changes the taste of the milk, changes the uh, nutritional value of the milk. Some people don't like it really in, them, in those jugs, but in most cases, you cannot buy it in anything except those plastic jugs that let the light through. Question is, why can't we work with people that will help protect these milk jugs? And as I asked this question at a milk meeting one time, the co-op man, the head of the co-op said, we've known that for years that light hurts the milk. Well, we've known it for years, but we've known nothing about it. If we really want to protect the environment, why don't we get the milk out of those, all those jugs that are ruining the milk? So the question is, what are we going to do about these milk jugs? Yeah, yeah, thank you. You know, that raises a, another question here. And what gets rewarded on school lunch milk contracts? Who gets the reward? The reward is given to the person with the lowest bid. And what you bring up is exactly right. Or the lack of education. I, I, lack of education, I would submit, is number two. It's price. And it's budgets. And so now you, what your discussion was more, I was on large gallon jugs. But then the next thing is we probably use the cheapest packaging on our school milk and deliver that product to a group of people that our future consumers, we give them that experience. The question is, do you, does, does somebody, a processor, want to subsidize that and, and send a better package in for a long-term investment that you won't see for a decade or so? That, because until something like that changes, the lowest bid is going to win when the school board looks that budget over. As long as they're not educated, you're right. Yeah. So, Corey, you made a really good Corey, you um, talked about how the Canadian model is really successful in driving money into the Canadian cooperative system, right? Due to their supply management system. So explain to us why or if a supply management system would similarly drive investment into the U.S. dairy industry. Mm -hmm. that supply management, uh, now there's two things happening in place. The, the supply management would be a, a stronger position here. We do have processors putting shipping controls on right now. I, supply management, the only way that it would have teeth is if it was passed at the federal level. Without that, without 100% participation, it, it's not going to work. That, that, I think, everyone here would have to uh, agree on. Beyond that, those who support it, I, I thought it had an extremely good chance, a version of it, not, nothing like the Canadian mile, but a version of it two farm bills ago. And when a fight, political fight takes place on the House floor, during the final stages of the Farm Bill between the House Speaker and the House Agricultural Committee Chair, Representative Boehner and Representative Peterson, and that went away. I think politically speaking in our generation, there are, I don't see a champion willing to go to battle on the floor again. Some of you know, and so that's the pragmatic part of it. The, the other thing that I thought about a lot on this, some of you saw maybe I released a book here March 29th on a Wisconsin family farm. And this summer I made a fun project going to all the independent bookstores in Wisconsin. There's over 60 of them. And a lot of mom and pop or organizations, it was almost like going to a bunch of dairy farms. They were all different and unique. One paired book and yarns. One had paired cheese and wine. So they were trying to find a way to survive 
or thrive in an era with, where they're battling the big A and the big B. Now, if you haven't ever published the book, the big A is Amazon, and the big B is Barnes & Noble. And so in many ways, I ask myself, you know, like, what could be done to help those bookstores? And short of some kind of regulation, they're, they're going to have, they have to find a way to reinvent themselves. And I think because of all that, it, it's, it's chal it, the challenges I, I don't see at the federal level of supply management system being put in the rule of law. And that's what's really going to have to take place. So with that, Dave, I think we're at the, well, one more quick question, then we're top of the hour pushing here. Uh, who? Um, one of the takeaways I kind of look when you were showing the, the, the how revenues increased exponentially for the, the foreign processors, but incrementally for the U.S. processors. Um, what scale do you think of that is kind of the U.S. production model going to lowest cost or kind of a race to the bottom? I think that's been one thing that's kind of plagued U.S. agriculture in general over the last 25, 30 years, especially since the farm crisis. But is there a way we can turn and shift that so instead of um, focusing on we're going to be the lowest cost producer, build, putting a more quality product out there or something like that? Mm -hmm. Certainly some of that investment was in major growth states. You know, a lot of that, move, Idaho would be an area, the, the um, southwest would be another area, the I-29 corridor. One critique I would have on U.S. dairy exports right now, we're probably really good at shipping commodities out, and shipping lots of commodities out. Focus on specialty products will return more value to the farm. Uh, and one of those great specialty categories is cheese. And so you're either going to be, in the world of economics, you're either going to be a commodity producer, which, what does that mean, race, race to the lowest cost, or you're going to bring extra value in. And I think every day that we can find a way to bring extra value and deliver uniqueness to consumers, that will be a win for dairy farmers. So I thank you. I will uh, get my PowerPoint PDF up. Uh, to the team at World Dairy Expo here. And it, if they get it up today, that may be happen, but I will, I will deliver that to them within the hour and it should be up tomorrow, and you're welcome to use that. So thank you for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs>
fun here for a fun interactive hour. Um, I am Leah James. I am the dairy marketing manager at Gen X, um, and I'm very excited to see a room full of people excited to learn about Donley um, Farm Inc. Um, and just a couple housekeeping um, things. We do have some really great prizes, um, so do fill out the card um, that you sn um, snagged at the door. If you didn't, Kim in the back does have extra ones um, to get that filled out, and we'll give away a bunch of um, free goodies at the end. Um, so we will be um, virtually um, uh, taking a tour of Donley Farm. We've got a pretty fun and an interactive platform to take you through here. Um, we will be informal and take um, questions along the way if you have questions. Um, we've got the tour split into some hot spots that really focus in on the key areas of Donley Farm. Um, so with that, I'll give a quick introduction of, to um, Donley Farm. After selling their dairy in Pennsylvania in 1975, the Tabers relocated across the country to Shoshone, Idaho, where they started dairying once again in 1990 with 250 cows. Nine years later, the Tabers of Donley Farms began expanding the herd to 900 Holstein cows. Donley Farm re relies on the Gen X Herd Monitor cow monitoring system for heat detection, health monitoring, integration, and cloud-based management. The Tabers also dedicate their time to community involvement. Members of the Tabor family volunteer at fairs, have served on the Valleywide Cooper Cooperative Board for 27 years, have had several board members for Gen X over the years, and currently hold a delegate position for Gen X. They've held leadership positions on the Farm Bureau Boards, Executive Council for Land Lakes, and the Idaho Dairy Association. Through their successful management practices and involvement in the dairy industry, it is no surprise that Donley Farms has been awarded numerous production awards for their Holstein herd in Idaho and Farmer of the Year for their county. And now, he wasn't able to join us, but we would like to turn it over for a video introduction from the owner, Don Tabor, um, to sh um, share a little bit of history about Donley Farms. <laughs> I'm Don Tabor from uh, Donnelly Farms Incorporated. We're a uh, family corporation located in Shoshone, Idaho. On the dairy here, we milk about 800 cows. Uh, we have uh, about 925 altogether. Uh, we raise all of our calves. The heifer calves, of course, are raised to go back in as replacements. All the steer calves raised in our one of our other feedlots. Cropland-wise, uh, we farm a little over 3,000 acres. Uh, raise uh, corn for the dairy, uh, all of our own alfalfa hay. We uh, raise malt barley for Anheuser-Busch, and uh, we raise sugar beets for amalgamated sugar. I grew up on a, on a small dairy farm in uh, Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and uh, I always knew I wanted to dairy from a young age. My, my dad always had me out there helping at the barn, and. Uh, when I got uh, old enough to drive, drive a car and stuff, he says, you know, son, he says, I don't care what time you get in at night, milking's at five o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> that was kind of my incentive to not stay out quite all night. So we wanted to do the best we could. So that's why we got into genomics, and that's why we uh, used AI. And uh, maybe that's why I became a uh, director uh, for JetX. So it was because I wanted that opportunity to learn more and to be able to uh, bring it back and uh, use some of the stuff that I was learning at uh, to the meetings and at it on my own dairy. And we we went from a herd of a, with about 21, 22,000 uh, uh, rolling herd average to today we're in that we're at 29,000 pound rolling herd average. I think it's been uh, three out of the last five years we've been the number one producing herd in the state on large la a large herd over 500 cows, and that is what motivates me. I've got to have that uh, 90 to 100 pounds of milk per cow per day, and uh, that's what makes me go. The boys kind of had to drag me into putting uh, all the automation into the parlor and everything, and. Uh, Today, I would say it's all useful tools, collars and everything. I, I just can't believe how uh, the breeder took to that so quick. We hand him a report every morning and uh, he comes in and he says, 
well, I bred these three cows, he said, and he says, they didn't show any signs of heat at all until I uh, stuck my arm in, and he says, uh, they were uh, toned up and ready to breed. And with our other uh, uh, technology, we could pick up sick cows from the milking parlor off of the milk weights, and uh, it would flag them for us, but not like what these collars do. Uh, uh, I'm amazed that uh, we get a list every morning, go check this cow and this cow and stuff, and uh, Usually you find something. Once in a while you don't. But usually you find uh, some diarrhea or you find mastitis or you find pneumonia or something or other. But you're seeing it before, almost before the cow knows it. I, I can't run all the technology, but uh, to me it's worthwhile. Well, with that, we are very excited to be joined in person um, by Matt Tabor and Karen Fields, and I'll give a quick introduction to them, um, and they'll walk you right through the virtual tour of the operation. Uh, Matt, if you want to give a wave, is a co-owner of Don Lee Farms, Inc. He grew up on the farm and was helping uh, on the dairy since a young age of seven. Um, he's married seven years to his wife, Shirley, and they have three children, Cole, Maddie, and Hannah. Um, he has served in the USMC, uh, or excuse me, enlisted in the USMC upon high school graduation and actually served two combat tours in Iraq. So thank you for your service. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, Following that, he attended the University of Idaho, major, majoring in physical education and health, and he actually came back to the dairy in 2011 uh, as a truck driver, a laborer, and got into a management position as the calf manager um, and became, became part owner in um, 2020. Um, he currently manages the calf operation um, as well as designs treatment protocol for the sick in hospital pen, pens. And then Karen Fields, kind of the, the lady that is a jack of all traits, if I um, heard after um, Kristen was out there visiting. Um, she and her husband moved to Idaho in 1988. They purchased a small dairy with 200 acres just north of Shoshone. Um, she immediately enrolled in a dairy tech program offered at CSI to further knowledge of good dairy practices and operations. Um, as the dairy owner herself, she performed many duties, including relief milking, feeding, IV and calves, picking rocks, um, evaluating different hay for purchase and driving skid steer and tractor once again jack of all tier traits yeah <laughs> um, when their youngest son was involved in a motorcycle accident um, was actually in a coma for a couple weeks and in rehab for a couple months they actually sold their dairy and concentrated on the farming operation um, she has also served at Valley Cooperative Board for more than 14 years um, while on the board that's when she met Don Tabor of Don on Don Lee Farms. Um, because of her awesome stats with um, raising um, the calves at her own operation, Don asked um, Karen to come take over the position of calf manager in the spring of 20, uh, 2001. Um, and she observed um, one day and drastically revamped the calf protocols. So she's the lady to ask. <laughs> um, in 2007, she moved to the dairy office and began, began keeping records on all the calves and the cows. Um, the breeder had been selecting sires for heifers previously, um, and now she does the sire selection um, and works with the Gen X calf program um, to make sure they have adequate replacements. So let's give a warm welcome to both Matt and Karen. And we're going to take a virtual tour of Don Lee Farm. And our first stop on our virtual tour is actually the milking parlor. Um, so I will hand the mic over to uh, Matt, and he's going to walk you through that. And Kristen will go ahead and pull that up. Thank you. And everything I, most everything I learned about calves, I actually learned from Karen, walking with her through the calves for the first little bit. She was a great teacher, great mentor. Her. Her uh, knowledge and experience with the dairy industry has been invaluable to our dairy, and we would not be where we are without her. Uh, as you all know, employees, key employees, are vital to a successful to a successful business. And I've got some of the best. Most of my guys have been around longer than I have—15, 20 years. Most of my guys have been there. I've got one milker. I grew up with all of his children. Went to high school with them. Consider them all friends. Most of my friends growing up 
were the were the kids of the guys that I uh, kids of the employees. When you grow up on a farm, you don't get much time to get off and go hang out with your buddies from school. So you hang out with whatever kids are available, and those were the kids that I made fast friends with and uh, lifelong friends with. Uh, this is our par. This is our new parlor. Uh, we originally started with a double eight herring bone in 1990. Um, this parlor, this is the latest and greatest for our dairy. Uh, it is a double 14 parallel. As you can see, the technology that we have up there. Uh, measure, I've got individual milk meters on all of my milking stalls, uh, automated back flush systems, automated flush systems in the barn. Dairy industry, cleanliness is godliness. So you see the venting, uh, that's all part, um, all part of our heat pump system where we take all the milk, uh, the milk goes through a heat pump, we, to cool that milk, uh, we run it through a plate cooler, and we are able to, uh, let me look at my notes here. Uh, we are able to heat our water in the summertime through our heat pump and our solar system without using any energy, with any outside energy costs. Uh, we use the milk to heat the water to 100 degrees. Um, before, we used to have a Delta T, which is your... Uh, that's your variable between your, wa your wash water that we need to be at 165 degrees. Uh, we used to have 100, uh, a delta T of 115. We have since been able to, with all of our technology and everything, we've been able to shrink that to 65 degrees. Uh, we, try to, we try to be as innovative and, improv and improvise and do whatever we can to stay on top of things. Originally, this, this machine was like the latest, you know, these machines were like the latest and greatest technology. I could, I could uh, monitor mastitis cows. I could catch them before my milkers could a lot of times, just monitoring conductivity levels in the milk, as well as milk production drops. All, uh, most, of my, most of my milking crew has been with us for at least 15 years. They are very well versed in what to look for. They all have extra responsibilities. You know, when we're not there in the middle of the night, they're the ones feeding my brand new calves. They're the ones pulling the calves. If we have to pull them, hopefully not. We, we had uh, our original parlor burned down in 2011. We had a, uh, our vacuum pump got hot. Um, it, the piping up into the attic got hot from the vacuum pump and caught the insulation on fire, which spread rapidly throughout the whole roof of the barn. Um, we were able to get everything under control, get the fire put out. And with the teamwork of all of our associates, uh, automated dairy, the team, the, company that we use that comes in and uh, services all of our milking equipment, all of our uh, electrical equipment. Our, we had our electricians there. Fortunately, we were only down for 14 hours, which in a catastrophic time like that, when everything, when the barn's almost a total loss, only being down 14 hours is, is just phenomenally, I, I couldn't say enough about, about the team that we have associated with us. Uh, it was a blessing in disguise. It was an old barn. It was, you know, like I said before, it was originally a double eight herringbone. There wasn't a whole lot of room on the sides. We weren't really designed to get that big. Uh, we, we had retrofitted it to make it into a double 12 parallel. But there was, when, when you raised, when you raised those, uh, raised your, your gates and the cows got out, there wasn't a whole lot of room for them to leave the parlor. So now with big, with a bigger, with a bigger parlor, there's more room on the end, on, on the outside for them. They get out quicker. We cycle them through faster. The cows are a lot happier. They're a lot more comfortable. And I think that is a big re part of, that's big part of the reason why we've been able to increase our production immensely since 2011. What is the weapon for Freestall 1? So Freestall 1, this is, this is the original barn. This was built, uh, we started construction on this back in the mid 80s. Nickel and dime here, nickel and dime there, and by 1990 we were up and running. 
it's seen some better days, but it's still still very functional, still very uh, effective for what we, we want to do. We house uh, we house our fresh cows in there uh, up to about 45 days on one side. And then this side here that we're looking at here, these are all my first lactation, the lower end of my first lactation cows. We, do, uh, we don't really, uh, we segregate our cows differently than most dairies do. Uh, this was an old, just an old uh, timber construction. But the cows, uh, one of the amenities that we like in our barns is the cow brushes. I don't think I have a very good picture up here of, one of the cow brushes, but these cows absolutely love these brushes. They'll sit back right back in there in the, in the holding pen there a little bit. So they will, you'll see them stop there. You'll, they'll stop there all the time. They just sit there. They'll stand there for five, ten minutes letting that brush just run over the back. Keeps them nice and clean. The only downfall to it is the, the you know, when the breeder goes through and chalks all the cows, you know, it wipes off all that chalk. So it's kind of hard to uh, deal with the heat detection, which, you know, where now this, uh, with these collars, this is where these collars come in, and they've really, they've been, they've been a godsend for us. This is yeah. This is our new. This is our newer barn. We built this in 1999, right, right before I left for the service. Um, we house about 500 head of cattle in here, four different strings. It's uh, equipped with a flush system to help. Uh, in summertime, we don't try not to scrape as much as we can. Try to try not to disturb the cows as much as possible. Uh, a few years ago, we went through we retrofitted the barn. We realized our dairy animals were just—they're just getting too big. The, you know, the old genetics—that that big, strong dairy Holstein cow—just uh, wasn't. They, we were having a lot of problems with injuries. So we went at, went ahead, went in, and raised up the free stalls, raised them up all about four inches, and uh, that seemed to solve all of our problems on on, on injuries, back injuries, and they, they've been a lot better. Technologies op operated through our RFID tags, the, the radio tags and the, and the ears, they come in, each, uh, each individual stall has a reader board on it that picks up that number and that's what, that's what uh, goes back into the computer. You can see as we scroll here, that right up there, that's the antenna, those are the antennas, the receiving antennas that we use for the herd monitoring system. Uh, the pen is also equipped with some exercise pens, we've got two Two groups of cows, the high producers, they get to spend all day outside if they want. Uh, summertime, good hot day like it was this day that Gen X was kind enough to come and uh, come and take a tour of our farm with us. Hot day, you won't see very many cows outside at all. That, those freestall barns, the way, it's, the way it's built, the way they're constructed, um, the airflow through them, they stay cool year round. Uh, warmth in the winter, the curtain, you'll you notice the curtains on the side, they drop in the winter time or on a really windy day, we'll drop those curtains, keep the wind from blowing through there and blowing sand all over. Uh, but in the summertime, you get a nice cool breeze coming out of the west through that barn and it, it's, it might be 100, 105 degrees outside, but you're very comfortable standing in there with your cows. So for us, uh, we try, we're, we're a very diverse dairy. Anything we can do, that's why we do a lot of, that's why we raise all of our own beef. That's why we do a lot of, uh, we do a lot of custom farming. Um, we try to stay as diverse as possible. Uh, reusing our manure in places where we can get away, uh, where we can, saves a lot of money. Uh, when you're, when you got a, you know, when you got a bottom line every month, you, you got to save money where you can and make money where you can. Um, we have a couple of settling ponds, pull the, pull the sand and the silt out. Uh, Everything uh, from the old freestall barn, we use uh, skid steer loaders to, put, to push the manure out into the concrete containment pit. And then with the flush system in the other barn, it pushes it from the other side into, into the pit as well. And then twice a day, we run, that, we run the separators and we get down to about, our finished product coming out of the separators is about 40% solids. Probably could be a little bit better, but it's, it's, it's working for us. Uh, all, the, all the liquid then goes, uh, that's, siphoned off of the separating system is then brought out to these lagoons and with the two with the two fields in the back there uh, we will take we will pump that water through another 
through another separator in the back and take a little bit more solid off of if we can. But we pump the lighter liquids onto these two pivots uh, as fertilizer. And then the heavier stuff that settles to the bottom, we will pump that out once or twice a year and spread that, on, spread that out on our other fields. For us, uh, for Idaho, there's, there's a lot of talk about you know, phosphorus usage. Uh, that we generally plant two crops a year on these pivots. We start out, we'll start out with triticale as a cover crop in the spring, harvest that for heifer silage, and then follow right in, right behind it with, uh, with, with silage corn to help utilize more of that phosphorus. Um, we're not so much worried about the nitrogen in the soil. The phosphorus is definitely a lot, a lot bigger issue for us. Uh, you're limited, and I, I might be nationwide, but Idaho, we're limited to 45 parts per million on phosphorus in the soil. So, so utilizing crops that can that can pull that, that pull that phosphorus out uh, is able to keep us going and let it, let us reuse everything. Uh, all the solids that come from that come off of the separators, we truck it out to another lot. Uh, you kind of saw it on the on the broad overview. Down here in the lower left-hand corner, pretty hard to see, but we just truck it out and dump it right out here on, on the hard-packed sand, and we let it compost naturally. We go out once, twice a week. We're out there at the loaders, turning it, keeping it, uh, getting it to dry out as much as we can, and then all that, all that compost when it's when it's finally done composting, we'll bring that back into the free stalls and use it as bedding. That's it, and it's a great way. It's a great way to reuse, uh, reduce, and reuse. All of it. Yep. Yep. And then, and then periodically, uh, we get uh, with the sugar company we sell our sugar beets to. They uh, one of the byproducts they have is a, it's a lime dirt, and we will come back in and uh, we'll, we'll come in with that lime dirt. We use that lime dirt to refill our, our exercise pens when we when we clean them up. We also will put it in the freestall barn as bedding periodically, just to just to use that lime to help neutralize that. The dirt in there and keep and, and uh, help keep our mastitis levels down. And then all uh, everything from our hospital barn and uh, our old the old cows, the old crippled cows. They they all stay. They lay on basically an open lot with uh, lots of straw. That's over by that's that corral over by the maternity pen. Um, that's all gathered up and uh, we'll spread that as well in the spring and the fall. Whatever whatever pivots it's, it's due to get it. You'll have to excuse me, I'm not going to stand up. Um, our maternity pen, actually, you have to start with your dry cows. Cows are dried spring, summer, fall, go out to pasture, a large pasture that has a stream running through it and a water trough with plenty of trees for shade. At about three weeks prior to calving, they get moved to a close-up pasture pen where they are checked at least once a day, probably twice a day. Anybody that's bagging up then, of course, gets moved to our maternity pen up at the dairy, where anyone walking by will be able to look at them and see whether they're in the process of calving or not. If it's a started calving, we'll move them into an individual calving pen that has a head catch for it for the safety of the cow and the handler. We try to let them calve on their own, but if not, then we do have the ability to lock the cow up. Once the cow has calved and the calf is clean, the cow gets moved to a fresh pen where she will stay anywhere from two days to 10 days in this pen, depending upon what her condition is. We will heat temp every cow, take their temperature physically for 10 days, whether they're in this fresh pen or in a fresh transition pen. By doing this, we can monitor their temperature and catch anything that is going on of whether it's a retained, a metritis, a pneumonia. They are physically examined for 10 days. Cows that are bagging up will get looked at in the computer to determine whether they are actually an overbreed or whether they're right on schedule. 
and stuff. These are my babies. This is the next generation on our farm. Uh, when, when calf is born, we, uh, winter time, spring time, uh, late fall, when, when things get cold, I've, got, I've, got a, I've been blessed with some beautiful facilities. Uh, this is my milk house right here. Um, we bring them in when, it, when it's too cold, we put them outside when I don't feel comfortable putting them outside because of, because of the weather. We bring them in, we get them dried off, get them warmed up. This is where I'll process them in here. This is, it also doubles as my, as a hospital facility for me. Uh, if I have down calves, if I have calves that are really struggling, I bring them in here, get them on an IV. Uh, most of my doctoring I do right in the pen, but if, but if, but if they need extra help, ex, extra care, then we bring them in so I can monitor them. We feed, we feed twice a day. Um, there is no, there really isn't any difference between my calves inside the solar barn here and my calves in the outside hutches. We just, it's just a, it's kind of a snake system. Wherever, whatever pen's opened up next, whatever group of calves is uh, weaned next, that's where the next group of calves goes. Uh, I, like the, I like the solar barn for my own personal creature comforts, but as far as calf care is concerned, I would much prefer on, on the calf end of things, my calves outside and the individual hutches are far healthier on, on a general basis, just because they've got more space. You know, we've learned a lot here in the last year and a half about, you know, social distancing, that sort of thing. So you get, <laughs> farmers, we've known, about, we've known about this distancing thing a lot longer than most people. But as far as being able, uh, the, for the quickness of care in the morning, it, I, I can zip through these calves I look at every calf at least twice a day. Um, I feed, we feed uh, for the first 14 days, I feed three quarts, three quart bottles, and then we supplement with free choice water and free choice calf starter, as well as I push a lot of electrolytes. I do have, uh, no matter what I do on my dairy farm, I've been having a scouring problem for years. That is my, big, that is my biggest uh, hurdle to get across as far as getting my calves raised. And so trying to keep these calves hydrated as best I can, especially in the summer months when, because we get, we get really hot, but this solar barn stays pretty cool. You get, a, uh, I've got pretty good airflow in there. Uh, I, we spray, spray it consistently for flies. Flies are always a big issue end of August, first part of September. I know my dairy's not the only one. These are my outside hutches. We feed, I, uh, if after 14 days, I bump them up to about a gallon of milk per feeding. Uh, my, older, my older calves yet that are right before they're weaned, they're getting a little bit more than that. I try, I try to put as much weight on them as possible before, before they wean. Uh, my calf feeder, uh, same calf, she's been with me for 10, 11 years, and she is another one of my invaluable employees because uh, She's, she takes, she loves the calves. She treats them like they're their own. And she's got, she, she's like the mom. I, I, I always tease her a little bit. I like to have fun with my employees. I say, hey, you're, you know, you're the mom now. You know, you're the mom for all these babies. And she, and she takes care of them. She watches over them. If, if she think, if, if ever she's got any issues with a calf, if she doesn't think it's drinking right, hey, come take a look at this calf for me real quick. We have very good communication back and forth, which is very key to keep keeping these calves going. Because a lot of times she might see something that I miss, and I don't take that lightly. You know, if somebody sees something, they got they got to come let me know, so we can get on top of it right away. I can't save every calf, but I can sure as heck try. At two months of age, just because that's about all the that's about all the longer I've got the room for to uh, before they cycle through the pens again. Uh, I, wean, I wean them, and we put them back here in these group pens in the back. I like to keep my pens at about 10 calves per pen. I, I try not to keep anything overcrowded as much as possible. And they stay, they'll stay back here. Uh, they'll stay back here for about a month, three weeks to a month, just depending on how fast I'm how how fast I'm running through the calves. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's a little little less time. 
But then once we leave, once we get out of these pens, uh, we'll feed them. We feed them hay, calf starter here again, and uh, mix in some uh, rumen supplement or you know uh, rumen builders and stuff like that. And then I then from here, this is when we start to segregate the calves. Uh, my two big pens in the back over there. They're, one pen is uh, designated for my beef heifers and all and all of my steers and bull calves. I do raise a few bull calves. I don't keep many. I like to keep one. I like to keep one, uh, at least one bull for my clean, you know, to clean up all my pregnant heifers just in case something, some somebody slips a calf. Uh, and then I sell a few bulls to another dairy. But most of what we do, 99% of what we do is AI. Especially in the, uh, and then when you get into the dairy herd, it's 100% AI. And then the other pen is my dairy heifers. My, We've got, uh, I've got a nice selection of mo mostly Holsteins, but I do, got, I, I do have a few of those nice little, cute little Jersey heifers that, that all the little girls like, especially my daughter. My two, da my two daughters, their favorite thing to do is come up to the barn with me to help me give paste, to, you know, give the probiotic paste to the calves. They call it the yum yums because it it's, a, it's a good palatable microbial paste to help with the scours. And my girls will start calling it yum yums. Got to give the calves their yum yums. So feeding, so we have a dedicated dairy nutritionist. Uh, we've been using standard dairy nutrition for probably 15 years, longer than any other nutrition company we've ever had. I used to, I, I used to tease my dad about changing nutritionists more often than he changed his underwear. But standard nutrition has been very good to us. They are on top of everything. They. Uh, our, our nutritionist, Mitch Deer, he is out here weekly. He meets with us, look, looks at all, looks at our records, looks how much uh, we use the Easy Feed program. The Easy Feed program has been has has worked wonders for us as far as being able to save on the amount of feed that that we waste. Uh, all of our push out feed, the excess push out feed that we take from the dairy cows, we'll refurbish that and run it, uh, feed it to our heifers too. Whatever whatever the dairy cows won't finish twice a week we pull that feed back out and uh, feed it through our heifers uh, we feed a lot of uh, feed a lot of triticale silage to the heifers along with a little bit of corn silage uh, we raise all of our own hay usually, usually we get four cuttings this year we didn't have any water we most of our hay we only got one cutting off of welcome to southern Idaho like some like I heard overheard somebody saying earlier it's all high desert, but the many, the, but the many you put a little water to it, the ground turns into the Garden of Eden. Every year, every year we'll chop about 10,000 ton of corn silage and put it on the pits. Uh, one of the nicest things we ever did, I'm glad we did it. It makes handling the feed a lot easier in the wintertime when things get wet and soggy with all the snow. As we paved, we, we, put, we paved a great big pad out here with, with asphalt. And that's what we try to keep all the dairy feed, the, the cows, for, uh, the feed for all the dairy cows on this. Along, so, and then we feed uh, our, our total mixed ration that we feed is corn silage, haylage, and then uh, mostly ground corn with, uh, with, with our mineral package and uh, cotton seeds, soy, uh, soy best, and canola mixed into it. But the nice thing, the the nice thing about the Easy Feed program is you can. It's taken a lot of time, you know. Before you had we we had a sheet of paper that you had to look at. Okay, I need 1,500 pounds of this, 2,000 pounds of this. Now it's all plugged right in. Now it's all plugged right into the scales of the of the feed truck. So so instead of having to do that math in my head, now it's all right there for me, and it saves me saves a lot of time, you know, getting the getting the feed out. We, we run, we run uh, we'll, the program we're on, we run four loads of feed a day. My dad starts things off 4.30 every morning, like clockwork, he is at the barn. My dad is a rock star, he's 74 years old, he's still the first one to the barn in the morning and the last one to leave at night. It's kind of, you, you, it's kind of hard to take a sick day when you look over and you, see, and you see your dad just out there killing it every day still, just working the circles around you. 
but that's a work ethic that we've grown up with. That's every every one of us. Uh, there's uh, myself and my brother, my older brother Darren. We're we're still on the farm. My oldest brother, he is he's got his own farm, but we're all the same way. We all get up first thing in the morning, and we don't stop until the end of the day when when the work is done. Uh, but we start at 4.30 in the morning feeding cows, and the last load of feed is usually run off about 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. And we all, we all take turns. We've all got, we all have to take our, our turn feed, doing that barn check at night, that last check of the day. That, everybody knows that's when all your problems happen when nobody's left on the, left on the farm. So, so the way we group our cows, of course we have our fresh pen. Uh, we go from our, our close-up pen. Uh, once they calve, they get kicked over to the fresh pen, and from there we put, we put, uh, they stay there about two to five days until, until we know that uh, they can get into a bigger pen. Uh, we'll, hold them in, uh, we'll hold them in a fresh string until about 45 to 50 days, and then we push them out into, the, into our other strings. Uh, one pen uh, on freestall one is my low, like I said earlier, it's my low producing first lactation heifers. I have uh, one pen in, my, in the big barn is my high producing first lactation heifers. And then I have one pen dedicated solely to second lactation cows, second and uh, young third lactation cows if, I, if I'm running out of room. But I try, we try to keep them grouped by age and size. That, you know, that way you don't, you don't have to deal with the bullying as much. Uh, and then I have my high producing cows and uh, my old, then a group of older cows that are usually fourth and fifth lactations, sixth, seventh lactation. I've got one old girl that gets to, she's going to, she's going to get to die on the farm. She's, uh, she's old enough to drive. She's 13 lactations. She does her job every day. She still gets up every morning and go walks right into the barn. When we started, it was funny. We started the, when we started these herd monitoring collars. You know, she her 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 collar came up every single day. Well, she's old. She lays around all day. I don't blame her. Our beef on dairy program, we use a, a, a Gen X calf math program. Our lowest net milk cows all get bred automatically to beef. Our Holstein steers and beef crosses, we raise them to finish weight and they're shipped directly to Tyson. We do not get any difference in the price for heifers or steers, particularly if they have a black hide. We use Angus semen for this reason because Tyson does give us a quality bonus for the black hide. On our genetics, we've been doing genetic testing since 2014. We breed all heifers to three services of sex semen and then we go directly to the beef semen. Our first and second lactation cows get bred two services of sex semen and then back to beef. Third lactation cows get bred straight to beef. We do not want to continue that genetics in our herd because we feel that our younger stock has better genetic potential than the older stock. On my sire selection, I noticed quite early on that the cows were getting too big and I mentioned it to Don and I started pulling in cows with a lesser stature and going to a zero or a negative figure to correct this problem. We use the highest net merit possible that are, is in our parameters for our sex semen. Right now, our net merit for a sire has to be 975 minimum. We breed for net merit, small stature, high combined, high combined fat and protein. The fat and protein has to be 150 or better. I breed for a positive DPR and a positive feed saved. 
Since genomic testing started in 2014, our herd average, again, was mentioned, was 83 pounds per cow per day on two times a day milking. Right now, our herd average for 2020, I use complete fiscal years, is 91.2 pounds, which is an increase of 1.4 pounds of milk per animal per year. Our fat average is 3.9%. Our protein average is 3.17. We are starting to have heifers hit the ground that we have genomic tested that are testing out at an 800 plus net merit. Our low net merit heifers, because we have no market for heifers in, our, in Idaho, we're on a quota basis for fat, protein, and other solids. Net merit heifers that are less than 400 are going directly to the fat pen. We are not breeding them at all. Our heifer breeding age starts at 14 months. Voluntary cow waiting age is 60 days. We breed all of our animals off of a herd monitor system. Our veterinarian does go through and check them, but he would many times come in and say, well, Karen, I would not have bred this cow, but she was on the list. I checked her, and yeah, she's 22 days since she was last bred. We would not have caught that cow as not being pregnant if we hadn't have had this system because it catches them. Otherwise, we would have gone to a herd health check, and the vet would have called her, said open, and would have said, okay, where's her net merit? Where is she in our herd? Do we want to breed her again? Do we want to resync her and go through all the expense of resyncing an animal and trying to get her pregnant? This way, we're catching them at between 19 to 22 days after the breeding cycle if they're not pregnant. Our heat palpitation pregnancy rate has increased from approximately 60% to 85% because we're getting those animals rebred before they ever hit the vet check. As I said, our breeder's attitude is very positive with this system because he comes in, he, I get a list of every cow that's in heat from the herd monitor. I get a list that says, hey, this cow should be pregnant. He also will check the pregnant cows. If they're on the list but showing a heat, he'll check them, let me know if they're pregnant or not. If they're not pregnant, he will go ahead and breed them to whatever we have down for her sire. And we do have a, just a quick um, video that we wanted to share. Um, the um, Gen X representative out at Don Lee's, um, Justin Pregitzer, um, it works very closely with the herd, on the repro and the genetic side of things. Um, and so he'll just talk a little bit about the benefits they've seen since they've implemented the system. My name is Justin Pregitzer. I'm a territory sales manager for Gen X in Southern Idaho. Uh, I get to work with Donley Farms and we've had lots of really good conversations about what, what kind of goals they want to work on in the future and, and heat detection came up in, in some of those conversations and so we started talking about activity monitors and getting some data back from some of the other farms and what they're experiencing sounded very appealing to, to Donley. So they decided to go ahead and do it and we, we've had it in for a little while now and what we're starting to see is they are actually breeding more cows than they had been before. The breeder has noticed that he he's not getting all the silent heats that he thought he might have been. Uh, another thing that's really nice that this system allows us to do is when the breeder's finished breeding for the day at the farm, he goes and finishes his route, and then he has the opportunity to come back if there's a cow that came into heat a few hours later. So they're getting to take advantage of a little bit bigger window for breeding, and uh, the breeder's really been enjoying it because he's, he's getting more cows bred and, uh, and he's very excited about it. So it's been very positive. Another thing that, that we were really surprised to see with this herd monitor was it's finding sick cows much faster than the, the farm was before. And so it gives them a list every single day of the cows that need some attention. And so the employees are able to go track those cows down and diagnose them and figure out what, what's the next steps to take. And they're finding some cows are catching 24 hours before they, they ever would have. And they're even finding some cows that they get to and they don't know exactly how to treat them because they still look healthy 
but obviously the ruminations drop, so something's going it's, on. It's putting some excitement behind Repro now because we're we're really looking forward to the results and, and improving, and, and there's there's a lot of excitement around Repro now because this system allows us to have a lot more information to use in real world, and and we're starting to see the beginning. Uh, pregnancy checks, their, their palp rates going up. We're seeing their their heat detection starting to climb. Uh, so it's, it's becoming very exciting. But for me as a Gen X person is I'm able to see their information remotely. And so when, when they have a question, uh, I'm able to log on on my computer, look at their exact same screen and I can, I can see exactly what they're seeing. So we can look into one cow and, and, and say, look, this is, this is what she's doing for today. Or I can, I can help walk them through any, any kind of questions that they've got. Uh, I can also do that on my cell phone. So I've, I've been able to pull over and, and, and pull it up on my cell phone and, and see exactly what they're seeing and, and figure out what our next steps need to be on how, how to address some of these situations. One of, the, one of the next steps that we're looking forward to being able to, to take is after we get comfortable with breeding behind the systems, what, what we can do to adjust our, our synchronization program because we're thinking that, that that group of cows is going to get smaller and uh, once we're, we're really confident in breeding behind the system, we're, we're going to make some tweaks to our synchronization program as well. So with that, I hope you felt like you had boots on the far, or boots on the ground and Shoshone, Idaho. Let's give a really nice round of applause for Matt and Karen as they walked us through. Uh, and we will um, field some questions here, but I did want to take an opportunity to really quickly introduce um, Hoob um, to Plot. He is the CEO of GenX, and um, GenX is the sponsor here of this webinar, and just wanted to give a quick shout out to Hoob. And John Rudiner joined as well. He is actually the council president for the cooperative, so thanks for coming. And then we also have a NEDAP expert in the back, um, Tara Boner there. She is um, available for questions on the systems. And we have a question right here in the front so thank you for asking a question we got a prize for question answer so let's see what question do you have what is the average age of your milking herd average age of the milking herd well obviously you know, some of these cows, you know, we want, we want to keep these cows, you know, last year we had our first 200 pound cow and she is now a fifth lactation cow. But, you know, obviously, you know, as I said, you know, we have that, we got that old girl out in the hospital pen, you know, all she does is feed a calf a day now, but, you know, um, as long as they keep, as long as they keep breeding back, you know, it's like the old dairy, you know, it's like the old dairyman that, you know, well, that cow looks ugly. Why do you keep her around? She's bred. So, but probably the average, I, I would have to say the average age of our, of our herd is probably in a third lactation. So about that six, six to seven year mark. Fifth lactation, yeah. Another question here in the front. Okay, question is what age are you starting to breed your heifers? Karen reports 13.9 to 14 months is the average um, age of the heifers getting bred. Yep, question in the back there. Uh. What's the uh, pregnancy rate per cycle you're getting? Pregnancy rate per cycle. What are what are you? Well, yeah. What are you? Can, you, can I? Yep. Two point one services per conception. We got to get a prize back there, Kristen. Question here. At what age are you starting to put the color system? So, yep, just to repeat the question, uh, the question was at what age are you putting uh, the collars on, the herd monitor collars on? We do that when we process the heifers. The cows all have collars. Uh, when we bring the heifers and cows in for processing at three weeks prior to having any heifer that comes in gets a collar at that time and is recorded in the computer. And um, Karen?
And just to follow up, you guys do, you mentioned that you pasture, and so um, you do, they are able to get readings on the, 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 the monitors out in the pasture too on those. So, uh, sorry, uh, the, the dry cow pasture that we have our dry cows on is about 200 acres. And so getting a, getting an antenna up that'll reach the whole stretch, you know, we got, is uh, a little challenging at the moment. Um, now in the winter time when we bring them in, when the, uh, when the water goes off and we don't have any water left put on that pasture anymore, uh, we do have, we do have some antennas down at our other, down at our feedlot where we'll bring those dry cows in for the winter and we'll be able to monitor them a lot closely down there. But usually, you know, the dry cows, they're, they're a little less, you know, they're a little less hands-on, so we don't need to monitor them as closely. I mean, we're still out there, we're still out there every day, walk, you know, walking through them, riding through the cows. Uh, once a week, we go out and uh, bring, in, bring in the next week, you know, and the cows that are due to be processed in the next week. And so, you know, and then uh, of course the pipe movers, everybody, you know, everybody watches. Everybody's got an eye, got an eye on the cows. And, and, and they may not be, it may not be their first responsibility to check that, to check a cow. But if they see a cow that just does, if, if they see something that just doesn't look right, you know, it's the old adage. You see something, you say something. So the question is, um, the RFID tags um, in addition to the collars. So we start. We started with the RFID tags about the same time. Um, well, no. Well, it's been a lot longer than that we've been, we've been using the RFID system since before we moved into the new barn. Um, the nice thing about the RFID tags, for whatever reason, our herd of cows. Does not take well to the to the metal bangs vaccination tag that they get. They always fest for whatever reason. Twenty five percent of our herd always festers up. And you get nasty growth coming out of the, from those tags. This was a way to replace it. It's also a way for me to go down through. You know, when I'm doing a herd a herd check with the veterinarian, I've got I've got a handheld palm reader that I can pull up all the records on. I've got a wand. I will go up. I I you know zap that cow quick pull up I've got everything I need to know right there on that cow just from that tag and it's it's it's, it's a multi you know it's a it's a you know it's a multifunctional tag that's it, that's um, it's also it also serves you know we're a hundred percent registered herd so that tag also serves as your registration number like that, that that RFID that when I enter that RFID when they're a calf because they get they get that RFID put in their ear that very first day that number follows them for their life for their whole life cycle. I think there's a question in the back here. Uh, yes, what is your question? Uh, so I was wondering, do you use sexed beef semen or just conventional beef semen? Sure, great question. So the question in the back was whether um, you guys are utilizing sexed beef semen or just sexed um, dairy semen. The reason why is because Tyson does not give any different bonus between heifers or steers on the fat stock. Only if it's a black hide. Uh, another, uh, if I can piggyback off that a little bit, uh, another reason uh, the market, it seems the market is not quite there yet. I, 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 I imagine as I look at, as I look into the future, I think beef on dairy I think you're going to see a lot I, I imagine you'll eventually see a lot more sexed male uh, sexed male semen uh, the, the semen we use is uh, about 90 it's supposed to be 75 to 90 percent for heifers and we're running about 90 to 95 percent heifers with, 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 uh, with those sex semen uh, sires yep question right here in the red Matt, you're right that 100% uh, of your sand is being reclaimed and going back in. Is that pretty typical for uh, you know a dairy as far as with a separator, or is that pretty common?
So you're betting with straight sand. I mean, you don't have to blend. Additional questions for Matt or Karen. Kim, let's pull for some prizes. Okay, yes, yeah, so she'll make her way up to the front. We've got some more prizes to hand out. Um, quick um, uh, shout out to Kristen Brogy, a Gen X event manager. She kind of manned the electronics behind uh, the scenes, so we sure appreciate her help. Um, Kim is helping me, Kim, Dr. Kim Egan, also from Gen X, um, a DVM that we are lucky to have as a key consultant in the greater Wisconsin area. Um, so yes, please do put your cards in the basket. Um, we'll pull for some more prizes here. Um. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, yes, we do have a grand prize. Yeah. So, um, we have... My watch says one, so I think we'll, I'll do the intro and then hopefully more people will roll in. Uh, but good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sage Safran. I'm the Sustainability Initiatives Coordinator for the National Dairy Farm Program at the National Milk Producers Federation. The Farm Program's Workforce Development Pillar is a voluntary initiative that supports dairies in human resources and safety management. We offer free farmer resources like HR templates, safety and HR manuals, and on-farm evaluations. Um, we welcome you to come by our booth. It's in the exhibition hall right here. Um, it's booth 4508 uh, to learn more about our program. The National Dairy Farm Program has the honor of sponsoring this presentation on practical employee management strategies by Dr. Robert Hagebort. As the dairy landscape continues to change with dairies growing larger, automation continuing to advance, and workforce regulations that change and vary from state to state, the demands for the dairy industry's workforce have never been higher. Now, more than ever, it's important to take steps to ensure your workforce is committed and motivated to do the best job possible. As an associate professor at New Mexico State University and an extension dairy specialist, Dr. Robert Hagebort works closely on many emerging environmental and regulatory issues, as well as dairy workforce training and education. With decades of experience, Dr. Hagebort's work ranges from on-farm procedural training on dairies to mid-level leadership development and evaluations. The farm program is excited to welcome Dr. Robert Hagebort. Thank you. 
appreciate that introduction. Thank you very much. So I don't have a dairy. I work for a university. I don't milk cows. I've got two employees. So who am I to tell you about employee strategies, right? Maybe I should sit down and let some of you come up and tell me what you have learned how to manage employees and do that the best you can, right? Because who am I, right? I work at a university. I'm one of those that tries to not live in an ivory tower. And I uh, work out of Clovis, New Mexico, uh, surrounded by dairies. I'm a nutritionist by trade. Uh, in the, uh, a private consulting, did that for about 15 years in Southern California. Last 15 years, I've worked for New Mexico State University and in very similar roles, whatever comes up with dairy on it, in it, or with it, I get sent out or I go out and I, I help work with producers. I have an arrangement with the university that they cut my paycheck twice, twice a month and I still get to work with producers. I love it. I mean, and I can fly under the radar. So that's what I do. One of the things that as a nutritionist I ran into early on is I can prescribe a 100 pound, 120 pound cow ra or a mil uh, pound ration and give that to a dairyman, but we're not getting 100 pounds of milk or 120 pounds of milk, why not? The genetics are there, feed quality is probably there. Something somewhere along the line went wrong, is not going the way we wanted so that we get 100 pounds of milk. And a lot of times that, had, that problem has a first name and a last name, and I'm not trying to point fingers. But something along the line didn't go right either we didn't mix it right, we didn't train the person right. There's issues there with, with personnel that kind of create that, that situation where we may not get that kind of milk. And so I have, for the better part of my career, now almost going on 30 years, I've worked with employees all the time. I, I uh, worked for the King Ranch down in Venezuela. I spent a long, long time living in Venezuela. I'm fluent in Spanish, so that's, that's not an issue. I can communicate with workers. And I can get to the nitty gritty about what's going on, trying to figure out what we could, need to do, can do, should do, and where the, where the bottlenecks are at. And so, but in the last 15 years, um, working at New Mexico State, I've really gotten into, in depth into providing maybe more effective training, training that really is helpful. The other thing in, in the New Mexico Panhandle area, the Southwest, working with some of these large operations, Producers were asking me, we need to have a safety program. We need to have something that we can train our employees on. We're turning them over so fast. We really need to start talking about large herd animals, animal handling, stockmanship, safety in general, chemical, electrical, all those different things. And there really was not something that we could use for that. So we developed that as well. As I said, I am a nutritionist. What do I know about people? I know about cows. I know what goes in the front end. I know what comes out of the rear end. And I and I estimate what happens in the middle, right? Try to explain that. So early on, I recognized that, and I was able to start working with Dr. David Dufresne, he's now a good friend of mine, who does understand a little bit more about the human part of that equation. He's got his doctorate in occupational health and safety. And so I've worked with him now a long time. He understands the human part. He doesn't get the cow part. So between him and I, we kind of team up and we kind of approach this and look at it, what is the human angle and what is the animal angle and where can we go with this? So that has worked really, really well. So just kind of to paint a picture a little bit, and, and I'm not telling anybody anything new, the US dairy industry is changing rapidly. I mean, it is going faster and faster every time that I turn around. And, and what we're working with nowadays, especially in, in, in the big dairies in the West, this is not your daddy's dairy any, anymore. I mean, we're seeing increasing herd sizes everywhere. This is from the Journal of Dairy Science a couple of years ago. But I mean, these numbers are probably very much the same, but all across the, across the globe, consolidation within the dairy industry is a, is, a, is, is a reality. So what does that mean, consolidation? Um, well, dairies become larger, are larger, meaning the, in number of cows, right? Very rapid consolidation. Larger dairies employ more people and on some work that we did, we found about one, uh, one employee per 100 cows, and even that is changing fast. Employees are not just family labor anymore, they're now hired labor, right? I'm not telling anybody anything new, but I just wanna kinda set the stage here. 
employees are usually from a different cultural or linguistic background, right? They're foreign born, as we will say that. Um, the other thing is that employment typically is not based on skills. It can be, but the majority of the starting workers is not. They don't show up, show up with a resume. They show up with the willingness to perform a task, right? They want a job, and so we hire them. But it's not based on what they know. That may be at a higher level of the case, but in generally it's not. So we have very limited, or we really don't know, what the education or the training is that that person has, has received. We really don't know. We're you're taking a huge gamble on the person. We got somebody that is willing to do the job for us, whatever that is on the dairy that we may need somebody. So that person may not be familiar at all working around large herding animals or large equipment for that matter, right? The car they drive may be the equipment that they know to operate, right? So we have an industry, quite frankly, going from where we were, say, 50 years ago to where we are today in transition, and that con continues to change really, really fast. The other thing, and I'll get into this here in a minute, we virtually have no metrics pertaining to our workforce. And what do I mean with that? Well, if I take, for example, metrics for cows, we have a whole show out here that's based on metrics for cows. Right? I mean, from repro to feeding to the parlor, all the metrics that you even remotely wanted to measure, you can find equipment, you can find uh, uh, tools, gadgets to do that right here at this show, right? Related to nutrition, reproduction, parlor, health, calf. We can go on and on, and you can make lists with all these different things that we monitor on cows and that we measure on cows. Everything is expressed in a metric per pound of milk, per 100 pounds, per whatever, right? All these different metrics. What about performance metrics for humans? Our workforce. Can we measure who is our best worker in a particular situation? What metrics do we have? There's one that I really know of, feeder deviation or feeder error in FeedWatch, in your FeedWatch software because it's computerized. So you can actually measure how close that feeder is to what we want them to feed, right? That is a true measure of the accuracy of him or her putting that ration together. What about repro? Services for conception? Eh, maybe. But the cow's got something to say in that too, right? It's not just the person. Maternity? DOA? Well, the cow's got something to do with that too, right? And the calf, that's not just the person, right? Milker metrics, if I've got eight milkers in my parlor, how can I, besides observing and spending a lot of time in my parlor, figure out what is my best milker or what, alternatively, what is my worst milker so that I can improve, improve that milker? How do I know that? There is no metrics that show to me on a piece of paper when I walk in the barn in the morning these are, this is how my milkers performed. You know, they're getting too busy or it's, it, they've got too much time or there's too much stuff going on. I don't know how my milkers are doing except for me maybe observing videotape. And as a, as a consultant, I've done that for years. I've spent I don't know how many hours sitting in a, in a parlor somewhere watching videotape to figure out what is going on, where we can improve things. Not necessarily to catch people in doing something that they're not supposed to, but really figuring out how is that team working? Where can we improve things? Economic metrics, rate of return per employee. Do we have something like that? Right? Nothing, right? We really don't have a whole lot. We got that cow part down. What about that human part? And this is an area where Dr. Dufresne and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how can we come up with effective metrics, metrics that really help me understand what, what is happening with my employees in my, on my place. So what does all of this mean for owners and managers? Well, owners and managers are now not cow managers anymore. They've become people managers, right? As soon as you start hiring more, more people, you quit being a cow manager and become a people manager. Sometimes I gotta tell, tell a dairyman that. 
Do you realize that you are no longer managing cows? You've got people to do that. You need to stop spending time on your cows and let people take care of your cows that you hire to do that and get out of their way so that you can help them become better at what it is that they're doing, which is managing the people that manage the cows. Right? But most owners, managers, were raised to be cow managers. So if a middle manager tells me that he's struggling with managing people, that's not an indictment of that person. It's just the fact that they learned how to be good cow managers. They are very good with cows. Where in the world did they learn how to manage people? They went to school to learn about dairy and farm management. They learned tech skills. You come to a show like this and you learn more tech skills, right? Where do you learn the people skills? Where do managers today, except from experience, right, by doing it and getting better at it and making lots of mistakes in the process, where did they learn, learn the soft skills? Is there a school somewhere for dairy management, HR, classes? I, don't, I know very few. Now, you can go to a business. There's some, there some managers now that, that got a degree and, and got a business degree and did indeed get some HR classes and took a lot of management classes, right? So they picked up some, some of those soft skills in the process, but not particular to dairy. Very few. The other thing, and again, this is not an indictment, but if I were to do a personality test in a room full of producers that I talk to, I really would like to know how many come out as your typical CEO. The guy that is hiring, motivating, delegating, explaining, going, coaching all day long till they come home and they're still coaching. How many of us in agriculture are probably more the quiet kind of person that really wants to be out there with our tractor, with our cows, doing our technical stuff, whatever that is, and not deal with people because they're a pain in the you know what, right? We want to be do that and if it takes for us, and I'm one of those, if it takes for us any longer than 30 seconds to have to explain to somebody how to do it, guess what? We want to do it ourselves, right? So your personality type is not helping you. That's not an indictment, that's not a criticism. It's something to realize that your personality might not even be helping you either. Okay? It's just a realization. So if we look down the road, we uh, are now predicting one employee for 200 cows. Some of these automation companies out here, if you talk to them, you ask them, they're now figuring with one employee for 250 or 300 cows. What that means is we're going to end up with fewer employees more equipment and automation doing the job for us, but those employees, those few employees that we still have left are gonna need to be of a higher skill set. They also need to be able to maintain, maintain equipment and gadgets, technology besides the animals that they're taking care of. So we need a very high level of specialization at each position as we already have that. We have to define what those tech skills are and then to raise the question, and I'll ask that question, who is teaching and training these folks on these skill sets, except for on the dairy? But do we have a certification pro program for milkers, feeders, breeders, outside guys, health technicians, whatever we want to call them? Nope. But we need to. We really, really need to. For you all to be able to say, this guy showed up with this certificate that means that he is a good breeder, at least he knows. Now, if he can breed for me, that's a different story, right? But at least I know he's got that level of, of, of skill to where he can breed or where he can feed or where he can treat my cows. We need a certification program for our workers. The other question is, with the rate we're going, manual versus automation, how much more are we going to do automated versus manually, right? I mean, here in no time to come, we'll be milking cows with ro robots versus manually, right? How many other processes on the dairy are going to be uh, automated and robotic? 
The other thing that we need to understand is that we still talk, sometimes you hear this in conversation, the manual labor that's being conducted on a dairy is still sometimes referred to as low-skilled labor, especially in our political terms, in political jargon. Anything on a dairy is not low-skilled labor. There is not a position on a dairy that is low-skilled labor. It's all very technically uh, advanced. Picking strawberries might be considered low-skilled labor, right? And I'm not trying to be denigrating uh, strawberry pickers. That's the reality, right? You don't need much of a skill set to be able to pick strawberries. But you do need quite the skill set to be a maternity worker, right? You almost need to be a veterinarian to do that right, or at least part veterinarian being able to handle animals and move them correctly and get them from A to B without either harming the animals or yourself. That's a huge skill set. These are doctors in and by themselves, being able to recognize that a calf is sick and then being able to diagnose that and treat that animal according to the protocols and the standing operating procedures that we have. Same thing here. This, these are tremendous skill sets that every one of these people need to possess. Same thing here. This is not just something that comes by, you know, you walk on a dairy by 8 o'clock in the morning, by 9 o'clock in the morning, you're an expert. This takes a lot of time, training, and effort to get these people to where we need them to do the best of their ability. And then I want to relate this, the skill set and the ability of workers the level of knowledge that they have about large herding animals, how does that affect um, their, the outcome, their safety, but also the well-being of the animals, relating that to animal welfare? Because if they, don't, if they really don't understand how, it, how we need to deal with large herding animals, then the whole animal welfare uh, issue becomes a question too. To what extent if we improve the human skill set, and we train and motivate and delegate them to a, to a, to a, to a point where we know that they're, they're doing their job at 100 or 110 percent. If we do that, how much will animal well-being or animal welfare improve? Is that a linear relationship? I know there is a relationship, right? Of course there's a relationship because it depends on the human to do the job. We know that there is a relationship. I don't know if it's linear or not. It could, could be a whole different ballgame. It could be a diff different line. But animal welfare, we talk about that a lot. Let me switch gears here for a minute. So there's a lot of things that we don't know, okay? There's a lot of things we don't know on the dairy. There's a lot of things that we don't understand when it comes to our employees. But we do know, what we do know is we've done a lot of dairy safety training over the years, last couple of years. And these are some numbers that we've come up with. So these are some, some dynamics that are happening in the workforce that I want to talk about and want to make you aware of. So we trained about 1,300 in this particular data set. This is a grant that we had, 1,300 employees. This is all over the U.S., primarily in the Southwest. But we were up in Washington State. We were up in New York. And so we, we've gone all across the country training people. Okay? This is safety, safety awareness training. Um, Percentage male to female, the job positions right here, years of experience. And um, one question we asked them in the survey, how many, how, what was their highest education level achieved? We did not ask them, what did you finish? But what did you start? Did you go to school at all? No. So that was 6.1% did not go to school at all. Did you start elementary school? Yes. 28% said they started. Did you start middle school or the equivalent to middle school in the country where they're from? And another 25% said yes. So we got about 60% of our employees that we interviewed all across the dairy that have a fifth grade level education or below. Now I don't, again, I don't say this to be denigrating to those that, that are in that position, but that means that we have to develop education training at that level of education, right? That's what that means. So we gotta, we gotta understand that some of the folks that may have very limited education may not be able to read or write. Illiteracy is still a huge issue amongst the work workforce. 
So what we, so if we, if I give somebody an SOP that we utilize, they wouldn't be able to know, and they're going to tell you that they read it and understand it, but they don't, right? That's a huge issue. The other thing that we asked, where are you from? Now, if I had done this study maybe 10 years ago, I would have gotten a redundant 90, 80 to 90 percent from Mexico. These numbers are changing and they're changing fast and this has implications. So there is now about 23 percent that come from Guatemala. Excuse me. Push the wrong button here. There's about 23 percent that comes from Guatemala about 2.6% and another 2% from Honduras and Salvador. So we got now about 25% of our workforce coming from Central American countries. Very different from what it used to be where we had 80 or 90% coming from Mexico. And you go like, okay, well, they're Hispanics, right? Nope. Because their native language, if we ask the question about what is your native language, it doesn't mean that they may not speak another language, but what is your native language? 65% said Spanish, 22% said Quiche. Who here has heard about Quiche? Okay, I, I'm starting to see more and more hands go up when I talk about and when I give this presentation. So those folks that come from Central America and are from Mayan descent, right, in those countries that are not Hispanic, they are from Mayan descent, right? If they did not go to school in the city, and did not learn Spanish. They speak one of the 23 or 24 or 25, whatever, I've seen numbers all over the board, different Mayan languages. Quiche is the most predominant one spoken. That's what they speak amongst themselves. So one time I'm doing a training in Spanish safety training or animal handling training, I can't remember. I had about 20 or 30 uh, guys sitting there and we're talking in Spanish. And I have a guy in the back of the room obviously translating or so some sort to another eight guys that were sitting next to him. They were listening to him. I go like, wait a minute, time out. So we stopped for a minute and I asked him, I said, is my Spanish that bad? And he goes like, no, your Spanish is great, but they don't speak Spanish. And I go like, huh? Where are they from? Guatemala? And they don't speak Spanish? No. So what do they speak? Well, that's where I got the explanation. So people that grow up in the countryside, in those countries, and don't go to school, don't learn Spanish. They speak one of the Mayan languages, of which Quiche is apparently the most predominant one. I didn't know that either. And those languages are actually not written languages in our alphabet. They're glyphic languages. So there is nothing written. They then obviously don't read and write. So here we are, translating all of our materials in Spanish and handing them out to our workers. Hey, we complied. We're giving them all the translated materials. We're talking to them in Spanish. We're training in Spanish. And guess what? We're not reaching that part or a large part of our workforce because they don't speak Spanish. I did not know this. And I've seen a lot of and talked to a lot of dairymen that did not know this either. So now, besides that, so we have now a large majority of, of just, these are our general findings, large majority of workers that are no longer coming from an egg background. So most of them in years past would come from a ranch, from a farm, or they at least had milked their grandma's cow. They knew what it was getting kicked by a cow, right? They at least knew what it was to work with a cow. Most of them not anymore. They have no or very limited experience working with large animals or equipment. Like I said, about 60% has a fifth grade edu level education or below. So there's a very high level of illiteracy or low reading comprehension level. That's even more important probably. Then we have very high labor turnover, especially in the first six to 12 months, right? So we got to do this constantly. We're constantly training and, and training again. We have now a shift in the typical workforce makeup to more Central Americans, which are of a different culture. Like I just said, it's an indigenous culture. It's a Mayan culture. That is not the Hispanic culture. Very, very different. And if I were to ask you, I'm Dutch, and if I were to ask you here, say, 
give me three characteristics of the Dutch. Well, I, I think that pretty much everybody talks about cheese and they're stubborn and loud mouths and whatever. I mean, that, that's, I, I've heard all those, right? But if I were to ask you, give me three characteristics about, characteristics about the Mayan or indigenous Central American culture. Huge culture. We've all read about it, how big the Mayan culture was. Do we know any characteristics? What do they believe? What is their belief system? What is their family structure? How are their relationships, man, male, female, marriages? How, what, what, how do they live? Is that like we do in our typical society? I didn't know anything. I've learned a little bit more since by talking and reading. But if we have now another culture in our workforce, should we not at least know a little bit more about who is working for us to be able to validate them and what they are and who they are? They, for one, do not like to be called Hispanic because they're not, right? They're, they have much more in common with our indigenous tribes here in the US, our indigenous people, than they have in common with the Europeans. We just throw them in this big bucket of Hispanics. I thought the same thing. I lived in Venezuela for a long time. I, I had never encountered this till a couple of years ago. Different languages that we now throw in the mix. The other thing, from an ergonomic perspective, and this is where Dr. Dufre comes in as an ergonomist. So we have now our 6-1 Anglo, our 5-1 Hispanic, and guess what? Our 4-1 Central American worker. Again, that's nothing denigrating, that is a reality, that's a fact. So if I can reach a button in a parlor with my 6-1, guess where my 4-1 co-worker stands and has to do in order to reach that same button, right? Or hanging machines. If I'm hanging machines, all these parlors are designed for about my height. I can hang them in my wheelhouse. I can work cows right where I'm at. So maybe I can work eight or 10 hours without fatiguing. Maybe, not anymore. Maybe used to. What about our 401 friends? And I'm gonna show you this. So now instead of dealing with two cultures and two languages that we knew of, we're dealing with three cultures, three languages, and three statures in our workforce. And a lot of us that didn't even realize that. Look at this picture. So here's your typical Hispanic worker. And behind him, there's another worker. Look at his height, follow the rail. Okay, he is working right in his wheelhouse, right? This guy, look at the arm over here. They're both standing on the mat. This is that very same guy that was in the back here. You could look at the angle of his arms. Now, unless he drinks a whole lot more Bull, uh, Red Bull, he's probably going to fatigue much quicker than this guy, right? So if we're wondering about why it is that our guys are not completing the shift the way it should be or that they're cutting corners or why there's issues in the parlor, have we ever thought about this? <coughs> Different stature? It's reality. What about a 4-1 guy breeding cows? Our tall Holstein, maybe jerseys, but what about our tall Holsteins? They gonna work? Fact checking them? That's an issue. So we started doing dairy safety training in 2011, 2012, and then we developed these DVDs that went all around the world, and there's actually a few folks here in the room that have used those DVDs extensively on the dairies to implement a dairy safety program. And so, and, and they're great. I mean, I've, I've heard this from a lot of different people that they were good. Okay, so we would do a lot of extension trainings. Right? We get a lot of these workers in about 10 o'clock in the morning and uh, they get a cup of coffee or they get a milk or whatever, they sit down and we talk for you know, 9, 10 in the morning, we talk for an hour or two. We do training, like what we do in extension, right? We do training, that's what we do. Well, these guys have already worked since four, five, six in the morning. And it was either cold or wet or hot, or maybe it was just a nice morning. Nevertheless, they come in at about 10 o'clock in the morning. 
guess what, and, and Armando Garcia, who is my, my associate there at New Mexico State, he, he's a former professor from the University of Venezuela. He's working with me, doing a lot of these trainings with me. And he's good. He's really good. He's not boring. But after about 20 minutes, that room looks like this. <laughs> it's reality, guys. I mean, 20 minutes talking, and I mean, you're maxed out, and you're going to go, I see some eyes already kind of going, it was just right after lunch. It's reality, right? So how effective, excuse me, how effective are these trainings? So everybody was talking about, we need more training tools. No, you don't need more training tools. What you need is more effective training tools. Something that you throw at the wall and actually sticks. Written SOPs are not learning tools, and how often do we not hand out an SOP, this is how we do business? And what if they can't, what if they can't read? They're procedural tools, making sure that everybody in this room working for the same outfit does it the same way, the same time, all the time, for every cow, be it Monday morning or Sunday morning, right? Reading comprehension is an issue. Comprehension retention, they, even if they were to read it, do they really understand the technical aspects and retain that? We're all adult, uh, as adults, most of us are visual learners. So how good is a piece of paper for learning purposes? Paper instruction is so antiquated. We can do better. We can do more efficient and more effective. So what we did is we took these videos put them on an iPad, kind of cut them up, put questions in between, and then we were able to give these guys a, a set of earbuds, put it on an iPad like this, and so we have 20 iPads in a big case, so we can work, we can train about 20 guys at the same time. They are now training individually, they're going through this with a set of earbuds in their eyes, so now the guys that can't read or have issues with understanding the questions, because they're not all spoken yet, they're not all audio yet, we can take them aside and take them on a one-on-one -on -one tour and explain to them what it is that we're trying to explain. It takes about an hour and a half for safety training, individual and interactive because they have to go through questions. And it may be simple, but it retains their attention with the material. Workers receive a certificate and owners receive a training report much like this that these workers were trained on those topics on that day. So you can put that in your OSHA file, that if there's ever a question on it, that you can say, yes, this particular worker was trained on that day by so-and-so on these topics. Don't underestimate the power of recognition. This is up in Washington. We were doing training there, and this young man came walking through that door about an hour and a half before with a face that looked like war. I mean, he did not want to be there. He was one of those that had issues with reading and writing. And he had done training after training after training, and everybody had come in there with training and given him something to read and understand. And he was frustrated with trainings. He couldn't stand it anymore. Another training. He had worked there for about 25 years. Why would he need to be trained? It was all on a piece of paper, and he could never read it. So he actually went through the video like I just showed you. We took him aside one-on-one -on -one to kind of explain what I just showed you in the other, in, in the other picture on a one-on-one -on -one session and took him through this. And then we gave him a certificate of training and said, congratulations, you passed this training. Well done. When was the first time that he received in his life a certificate recognizing him for something that he did well. Or the last time, I should say. Probably never, right? Didn't go to school. We got file folders full with all these diplomas and certificates of participation, right? We got tons of those things. We don't even pay attention to that anymore. These guys, we've trained in Washington, guys that used to work in New Mexico, and guess what? They got that certificate hanging in their bedroom or above the dining table. They would come in and say, look, I framed it. It's hanging on above my dining table. That's what this means to them. An hour and a half of training. That's what that means to them. 
do not underestimate the power of recognition on a job well done. Usually they get told when they do it wrong, right? This was well done. Then we go through and do uh, effectiveness evaluation and we ask them, did you like the training? Was it simple, this and that? We want to know if they actually learned something, right? So there's a Kirkpatrick model of evaluation and I won't take you through all the details and all the numbers. Uh, but that's what we do in order to evaluate if that training was effective or not. And I skipped a few slides here. And so we know that we actually are, are making a difference. That's the point I'm trying to make. All right, so now we did the same thing with safe animal handling or the stockmanship training that we developed for the farm program. That is actually in, in the, the, uh, the quality assurance, beef quality assurance program. That's actually the farm program that you see online now, the stockmanship program that's on the farm website. We did the same thing. We put it on these iPads. And then actually we took it one step further because try to explain to a worker that doesn't know stockmanship point of balance. You can try to explain it even in a video, but they don't understand it until you get out in the pen and show it. Point of balance. What the heck is a point of balance? Right? So we get out in the pen so we can talk about these concepts like flight zone. Flight zone. Flight zone maybe you can explain, right? It has some natural things to it. You can do that point of balance, herding instinct. So we get out in the pen and we, we actually work with these guys and say, okay, that white cow right, right there, I want that white cow in a pen by herself because I need to treat her. How would you go about doing that? What, and, and you can't use more than two people. I don't want you out there, all eight or 20 of you chasing these cows. I want two guys to get that white cow out there, separate it, put it in this pen over here. How do we do this? Using herding instinct, using cow ability, right? That's what we tend to. So then that's the next thing, taking it out to the, to the uh, outside and actually doing it. So here are some observations. Large majority, again, have no experience in working with large animals or equipment. Many employees know very little about the senses, how cows see, how they hear, how they smell. Very, very few people know anything about how cows actually tick. Many employees have wrong perceptions about how to act around animals. Just look at how many people are yelling and screaming and hitting on fences and doing all kind of crazy shit behind these cows that is totally against the cow's senses. They've learned it from other pushers or from other people around them, but it's totally wrong, right? So we talk about those things. Even seasoned workers who maybe know what to do, right? The school of hard knocks. They may not know why they're doing it. Experienced workers appreciate the validation of those skills. I've seen that many, many times. Owners and managers can make great impact by reinforcing how important animal handling skills are to them. We always ask the managers of the operations to be there and to reinforce how important that is to them. Many owners and managers take this awareness training to build on and practice concepts with workers so they can continue doing that. They can use the videos, they can use these concepts and continue working with workers. What does this mean for animal welfare? Animal handling is much more an art than it is a task. And you're gonna to have to learn that and practice it. It takes two to tango. Correct animal handling starts the day the animal is born, continues for a lifetime. Animal handling skills are learned slowly by observing and practicing over and over again. The best thing you can tell somebody is, sit on this bale of hay or on this fence and watch and learn. And then come out with me and do it. It's something that takes a lot of time Given that animal handling is a skill set, the question needs to be asked, what human personality traits does a cow handler need to possess? And I'm here to tell you that there's a lot of employees that I see handling cows that shouldn't be anywhere around cows. Maybe on the tractor, maybe in the machine shop, but not around cows. They don't have the patience and they don't get it, okay? Get rid of them. Not in that position. It's gonna create issues. It answered the question also, did we select the right people for the job? Well, I know in this job market, we don't have much of, a, of, of, a, of an opportunity to really select, right? You pick the warm body that walks on. <coughs> this is my personal experience. Dairies where handlers understand why they are doing what they are doing. Cows are typically calmer. 
more curious, and less fearful of humans and human interactions. It's what we're seeing on robot dairies right now, right? Less human interaction and cows are calmer, more cow-like. Cows can be cows. Animal well-being benefits as we teach and train employees on the skills and the knowledge. And then this is the big part on strategy. We focus on coaching attitudes. You don't, you don't train attitudes, you coach attitudes. That is why certain teams go to the Super Bowl and continuously can go to the Super Bowl because they have maybe the same skills and knowledge than some of the other teams, but they have the attitude of a winner, the attitude of excellence. And that starts at the top. That doesn't come from them. That's leadership. Motivation, confidence, integrity, honesty, enthusiasm, and commitment. A lot of times when we talk about animal welfare and animal well-being, we kind of talk about it as a concept. We're going to do this, right? We're part of the farm program. Our co-op wants us to do this thing. We're going to do animal welfare. We're, we're going to do the right thing. Like it was an abstract concept. I'm here to tell you it's not an abstract concept. It's an outcome. That animal does not live in by itself. It does not take care of itself. It needs to be fed. It needs to be managed. It needs to be milked. It needs to be done. All these things that we do. Animal welfare is an outcome. It's the positive outcome of an interaction between a human and an animal. It is what we achieve with these animals by understanding correctly what those animals are all about. All about. I can take that animal out there and put human in there and the same thing Holds up, holds true. Human well-being around these 1,500-pound animals that can kill us with one place, good place kick also depends on this outcome, a positive outcome. It's a give and take. It takes two to tangle. Employees typically mean well. But if you cannot anticipate what a 1,500 pound animal is going to do and you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, that's where we end up with accidents. And there's too many stories out there. It's very easy to get frustrated for workers if they don't know what to expect. And frustration is the perfect setup for the wrong outcome. And I think this frustration is part of why we're seeing some of those abuse videos where workers are tempted to be coached into these abuse videos because they're frustrated. They're frustrated working on that place. They're frustrated working with cows. They don't mind kicking that cow or doing whatever it is that they're required to do on that video. They're frustrated. And that comes, that stems from not knowing what cows are all about. Human well-being concerns increase with the lack of understanding of what a 1,500 pound can, animal can do. We talked about that. The other thing is cows, we got to remember that. Cows have great memories. They recognize people well, and they know who treats them well or not. We always think about it from our perspective. But that cow knows darn well that this pusher is a nice pusher, and that pusher is not such a nice pusher. And you can look at the cows, how they respond to certain people to learn the difference. You can observe that. You can see it. Learned behavior on the animal part is an important component of the human-animal interaction equation. What they learn from calf on and where they are today, that learned behavior is extremely important how they're going to react to anything that we put pressure on those animals, that experience. So going back to these strategies, and I'll wrap it up here. What are these practical employee strategies? Well, we've already talked about some of the challenges that we're facing. facing. Labor, that's for everybody in the dairy industry, but everybody in business. All businesses that employ more than yourself and you got one employee, labor is the major challenge. Don't feel alone in this. Labor is an issue everywhere, okay? Managing people is far more difficult than managing cows. Realize it, accept it. It's really easy to manage cows. Managing people is the difficult part. That's your challenge. <clears throat> Most owners and managers are at a total disadvantage because they're great cow managers. Like I said, where did they learn how to become people managers? It's at no fault of yours. 
that this is a challenge, but it is. Any other business faces the same thing. Like I said, even your personality might not be helpful to become a good manager or a good COO, CEO or a good coach. Your personality may not be helping you there. And then like I said, the, the recent changes in our labor workforce put all these labor challenges on steroids. Give it an extra dimension. And then to boot, we're probably now dealing with a generation which doesn't like to or want to, whatever that word mert may be, and we can talk about that, like to or want to do physical challenging work or more work more than so many hours. We are dealing with a different generation that we did in the past. It's a reality. Okay, so those are the challenges. Now, where are the st strategies? Come up with your answers, Hagerford. How are we going to do this? Well, what I see, this is not what I've done, but what I see successful operators do in response to those challenges. First of all, they know their metrics, the cow metrics. They got all the numbers down. Okay, they know that in and out so that they can make informed management decisions. If you don't have your numbers straight, how can you manage people to tell them where they should make certain decisions? You gotta have that down first. Then you gotta get out of your comfort zone and purposely focus on leading people. And that means cutting out, getting out of your comfort zone. That has nothing to do with cows now anymore. Now we're dealing with people, that part that you just dislike. You want to go in the house, you want to do paperwork, you want to do whatever. But this is the part where successful dairy operators succeed. They take that on. They work with these employees. If it's not in your personality and it goes against your grain, don't try. Hire somebody that is good at it. There's lots of people in other industries that are very good HR managers. They may not know nothing about cows, but they can learn the cow part but they got the people part down. If you're not good at it, get somebody that is. Not that difficult, right? Get to understand your audience. If, if you're speaking, like I do a lot, first of all, you gotta understand your audience, right? As dairy owners and managers, do we really know what our audience is? Do we really know who our workers are? If we may not even know what their cultures are, what their cultures stand for, how can I validate one of my workers if I don't even know what is valuable to him or her? If I have never spent a minute thinking about what cultures are working on my dairy, what languages do I hear, what are the interactions between, say, the Hispanics and the indigenous and the Mayan culture? Now, you may not learn a lot because that's all, a lot of that stuff is under the surface. But if I don't spend any time trying to learn who is really working for me, how can I ask them to give the 100%? They just get the paycheck. They could care less. They're not, those cows are not their cows. They go home and they do what they do with the money. In order to get 100% from your workforce, you have to invest in getting to know who they are and who really works for you. Validate them at their point of being a human being. Get to understand what would make more, more, uh, workers more successful in their jobs. Right, one. Get to talk to them, try to communicate, get to understand from your managers what would make them more successful. It doesn't mean that you have to give everything that they want but have a rational conversation about what you think would make them more successful and what it is that they do. Is that training? Is that validation? Is that just telling them a job well done? Hey, that was great. Because I know we'll tell them when it's not done right. Right? Tell them when they did it right. What would make them more successful in their jobs? This is one thing that always comes to the top when we talk to these, these workers and the middle managers. Be a clear communicator of expectations. How can you do a job 100% if you do not know what is expected? Yes, we have cultural barriers and we have linguistic barriers. So communication is tough. Find somebody that can communicate. 
find a way to communicate. Hire somebody that is good at communicating. Whatever means you want to use for that. I mean, there's, there's dairies that have uh, TVs and, and systems in their parlor showing the metrics, showing the communication. I don't care, in the break rooms, with all of the messaging that they want to get to the workers, and it just plays over and over and over again in their language. Maybe it's videos. Maybe it's personal. Maybe it's communication. Maybe every Monday morning that's how you start off. I don't know. Whatever means works for you. If you're not a good personal communicator, find another way to communicate. There's other ways to communicate than in person. But communicate about the expectation. What is expected of that worker in that particular position? And have conversations about that. Do job evaluations. Keep talking about that. Now we're getting in the right direction. This is what we need to do. This is how we need to do it. I think one of the key things really, really, really is, what it really boils down to is that you have to demonstrate leadership and excellence at the top. None of your workers are probably going to, with maybe an exception here or there, but none of your workers are going to be as good as you demonstrate to be. It starts at the top and it trickles down. You cannot compromise on any of that. You are the leader, you set the bar. Set it high. Last but not least, don't forget to be human for the human that works on, work on your dairies. It is a business relationship, and we as Americans in our culture are very business oriented. We oftentimes forget the human component. For them to interact among themselves, for us to interact with them, we're humans first and foremost. I think that this is really critical and I hear that from a lot. Even today we've had some conversations that were along those lines. The farm program has a ton of resources that you may have seen. This is just a shot from their website, their worker safety and human resources. The safety uh, manual is right on there. Uh, the dairy stockmanship training that, like I said, that we, we develop, helped them develop. Uh, the, you, the safety manual that Dr. Dufresne and I helped write for the farm program are on there. Um, these are some of the resources that are available on our New Mexico State University Dairy Extension website. This is the last one that we're currently working, or the most current one that we're working on, cold cow care. Where to make those decisions about sending cows or not, or putting them down and uh, giving, empowering people to make the right decisions. We're actually doing this with a farm program with Elanco and, and CSU, we're, we're, we're currently working on that. But those are all available right there on the website. And with that, I'll wrap it up and see if there's any questions that I can answer. It's, uh, it, if you're looking to, you know, and a lot of our, our dairy farmers are short workers and would love to have more workers that would at least have a basic understanding of agriculture, right? But what it also does, it brings in another culture, another language, and another set of issues to combine what you already have. So it's, it's an opportunity, but it's also a challenge. Those dairies that deal well with these challenges and are, uh, succeed in the HR portion, I wouldn't shy away from it. We, you know, we've seen that not just with Afghan refugees, but refugees in general, right? The International Refugee Center translated at one point in time our, our training videos to send out to refugees from whatever country that were coming in and were working on dairies, and that works good. But you don't go to a dairy with those folks where HR development is an issue because both will fail. It will be a failure all around if you cannot support that development of that workforce. Because for even for those, those, those Afghans coming in in our operations, that's a totally different world. They've never seen something like that. 
right? That would be my response. Any other questions? So I don't know if I gave you a lot of strategies. I hope I gave you something to think about when it comes to workforce. These are observations that I've made. And I really believe that from here on going forward, the operations that handle that HR part well are going to be the ones that are going to be successful. The margins are too thin for anything else. You cannot leave that on the table anymore. Okay. Thank you for coming. Appreciate you coming and have a great afternoon.
two, three. Okay. Muy buenas tardes, damas y caballeros. Muy bienvenido a nuestro programa hoy en la tarde. Vamos a escuchar a, a Dr. Santiago. Y tenemos su, su resumen, todos sus estudios aquí. Fue graduado, es de Venezuela originalmente. Es, es uh, graduado en medicina veterinaria en 1991 y luego se fue a la Universidad de Arizona en Tucson. Yo soy de Tucson también, pero estoy aquí trabajando con un intérprete. ¿eh? Y tal vez hemos conocido allá en, en uh, el registro, uh, bueno, uh, de uh, entrada para los uh, visitantes. Pero uh, fue maestro en la escuela secundaria y luego ha trabajado cinco años en la industria farmacéutica y ha sido un consultor, un técnico asesor en Estados Unidos desde 2002. Y, pero ahora va a hablar sobre el desarrollo de liderazgo aquí. Y este programa va a durar hasta las tres. Y mañana vamos a tener otro programa y espero que ustedes puedan hablar con sus amigos, sus compañeros, para traerlos aquí. Porque ayer había 75 gente aquí. Casi lleno. Necesitamos gente. Porque yo, yo creo que es un buen día que el World Dairy Expo está haciendo estos cursos. Pero si, si no tenemos gente, no van a seguirlo. Entonces, no, nos ayuda. Bien. Santiago, un aplauso, por favor. Muchas gracias. Sí, mire. Buenas tardes. ¿Sí me escuchan todos? Uh, mira, antes que nada, que les quiero pedir disculpas de entrada, ¿no? Por dos cosas. Una, la hora que estamos comenzando. Y dos, este, no me puedo mover de acá. Uh, ahí le tienen que echar la culpa a Greg, porque como estamos en televisión, quieren que uno esté en un sitio fijo, ¿no? Y aparte tienes que tener micrófono en la mano. Así que no piensen que voy a cantar, ¿cierto? En el que mejor que no, porque se van a ir corriendo. ¿Sale? Eh, le queremos agra agradecer a Progressive Dairy el, el patrocinio de estas charlas, ¿verdad? La de, la de ayer, la de hoy y la de mañana. Este, la de mañana, don Juan. Disculpe que le iba a preguntar, pero si no tiene micrófono, no podemos. La de mañana es un panel que va a estar don Juan Quesada, va a estar la señora Carolina Pinzón y voy a estar yo. A, se llama Estrategia para tener empleados comprometidos y reducir la rotación. La hora es a las 2. Ok. La hora va, va, va a ser a las 2 de la tarde, ¿ok? Este, quedan invitados y como dijo Ron, si pueden traer más gente, ¿verdad? Porque eh, este es el otro mensaje que les quiero dar. Por primera vez, eh, la exposición se nos está abriendo para nosotros los hispanos. Entonces, qué bueno que ayer se, se pudo tumbar la puerta con 75 personas, ¿cierto? Este, hoy, así sea una persona, es importante el mensaje tiene que llegar y, y si mañana somos más pues el año que viene daremos más charlas le daremos más preferencia se, se invertirá más recursos Progressive Dairy para que todos los hispanos puedan venir ¿me explico? entonces se les pide por favor esa colaboración esa, esas ¿cómo se dice? boca a boca la propaganda porque lo necesitamos y, y ya les digo, justamente al lado aquí a la una estaba hablando un profesor de la Universidad de Nuevo México, de New México y estaba hablando más o menos acerca de esto. Tem tema, es el mismo tema, quizás un poquito diferentes perspectivas o diferentes matices. ¿Ok? Pero, pero lo están dando en inglés y no lo estamos dando en español. Entonces vamos, vamos a presionar para, para nosotros entonces llevar, como dice Pitbull, este, no, primero limpiamos la casa, después somos dueños de dos casas. ¿Cierto? O sea, paso, vista, eh, paso corto, vista larga. Así dice Pitbull, paso corto, vista larga. Primer año, vamos para arriba, ¿ok? Um, bueno, aquí Ron nos dio la introducción. Eh, les pongo esto acá, lo de la fecha, simplemente para darnos cuenta que estamos al final del año ya. Se nos fue el, 2020, el 2021, ya es el 2021. Eh, es bastante importante porque a medida que va pasando el tiempo, uh, nosotros dejamos de hacer cosas como líderes pasamos a, a algo que yo llamo inacción. Y la inacción no trae solución, sino que agrava una crisis. 
Entonces piensen que ya se nos fue el 2021 con la pandemia, ¿verdad? Que la comenzamos en marzo del 2020 y mire dónde estamos. Me gustaría, si me pueden ayudar, ¿verdad? Con estas tres cositas. Ya veo que todos están prestando atención. No sabíamos qué tipo de audiencia iba a venir para acá, ¿cierto? Entonces yo siempre pongo, después de estar 14 años en una en un zoológico dando clases en Phoenix, este, uno tiene que siempre pedir ayuda para, para que la charla salga un poquito mejor, ¿verdad? Si tienen el celular, que sabemos que lo tienen, porfa, en vibra. Y por supuesto, los textos y eso es importante si, si los toman afuera, aunque como no hay mucha gente, yo digo que los tomen afuera porque la gente se distrae a ver qué es. Uno es muy curioso, siendo hispano, uno trata de ver con quién está hablando, ¿verdad? Entonces esas son tres cositas. Um, Yendo directamente a lo que es el objetivo de la charla, es, es esta, es ofrecer eh, acciones e ideas para que los gerentes y los managers puedan sobresalir como líderes. Y uno desarrolla como, eh, uno, uno sobresale como líder cuando tú eres capaz de tener tu equipo comprometido. Y vamos a hablar un poquito de eso, ¿okay? porque son quizás conceptos un poquito que, que no se manejan, pero que nosotros queremos hablar en el mismo idioma, estar en la misma página que ustedes lo entiendan, de la forma que nosotros, de nuestra perspectiva, la forma que nosotros lo vemos. Estos son los cinco puntitos que tenemos. No sé si nos va a dar tiempo de todo, depende de la participación. Ah, lo último que voy a dejar va a ser la mirada rápida en lo que es nuestra fuerza laboral, de, de que ahora están los, entrando los, los, los boomers. No sé si, si ustedes están pendientes de los boomers. Ya los millennials son más viejos que los, ah, perdón, los zoomers son los que están entrando, ya los boomers, ¿verdad? Este, están pasando de moda igual que los millennials y la generación X como, como nos, algunos de nosotros. Fácilmente, eh, vamos a, con el punto número uno, y es la forma para que ustedes vean, si ustedes van, yo, yo creo que todos comencemos en una misma página, ¿ok? ¿Y qué es cuando hablamos de liderazgo? ¿Qué es? Porque estamos hablando de cómo un líder, eh, cómo un líder puede tener éxito, ¿cierto? Entonces... Vamos a tratar de, de ponernos la misma perspectiva de cuando hablamos de liderazgo. Y, y miren, cuando ustedes escriben esto en Google, esto es la cantidad de resultados. Ustedes preguntan, ¿qué es liderazgo? Y estos son todos los hits que aparecen en Google. Y esto es tomado de hace un par de días. Si lo escriben en inglés, es mucho más, son 872 millones de resultados. La diversidad, eh, la pregunta fue por qué, la, la diversidad de la gente con el acceso hoy día a la web, a la internet, y entonces cada quien expresa su idea de lo que es liderazgo. Entonces todos tenemos un poquito de idea, sí, yo sé que es un líder, sí, pero ¿qué es liderazgo? Y entonces por eso ya les digo, uno saltó de la parte veterinaria a la parte de, de la parte técnica a la parte de... De, eh, organizacional de, de la lechería, del establo. Para nosotros, eh, liderazgo es la actitud y la habilidad que una persona tiene para inspirar, motivar, influir y guiar a otros a un equipo, con la idea de conseguir objetivos o metas que nos podamos poner en común. Liderazgo no es que me dan el título de líder, tú eres el líder del parlor, liderazgo es lo que yo hago. Eso es lo, lo que nosotros, la presentación hoy viene por este lado, de cuando hablamos de que es cuando un líder tiene éxito. Um, otra, otra, ¿cómo puedo decir yo? Definición que, que no existe, que somos muy pocos los que trabajamos esta definición, eh, sobre todo en, en el idioma castellano, es que es compromiso del empleado. Yo lo defino así, es cuando existe una conexión emocional entre el empleado y su compañía, que ahora es su compañía. No es que yo trabajo para Progressive Dairy, es que Progressive Dairy es parte. Yo soy parte de eso, es mía. Entonces eso es cuando nosotros hablamos de eh, empleados comprometidos, son esos empleados que sienten que donde están es lo suyo, están conectados no solo por el, porque le dan el cheque, sino porque hay una conexión mucho más fuerte que es emocional. Por cierto, si tienen alguna pregunta, mientras va la conversación, háganla. Me levantan la mano y, y le damos, ¿ok? La idea es que saquemos lo más que podamos de esta, de esta uh, conferencia. Otra de las cosas, eh, 
A mí no me gusta decir que yo soy conferencista o speaker, yo parto de que soy facilitador. Queremos decir con facilitador es que aquí todos nosotros tenemos experiencias y todos nos enriquecemos. La idea para mí de ustedes haber venido a esta charla, sí, uno, uno tiene una, una agenda, pero nos nutrimos más con el conocimiento que hay en la sala. Entonces piensen eso, si ustedes tienen alguna pregunta, incluso un comentario, levanten la mano y ahí les damos, ¿ok? La idea es compartir lo, lo, nuestras experiencias y lo que sabemos. ¿Alguna pregunta, algún comentario? Okay. Mi, mi forma más fácil de enseñar que es un empleado comprometido es en alemán. Um, esta... esta Lámina me la dio, eh, nosotros damos clases de liderazgo y este muchacho en su proyecto presentó esto. Por supuesto que no sé si habrá algo, alguien en la sala que lee alemán. Podemos deducir que aquí dice algo de millones, costo como que cuesta, pero no estamos seguros. Pero ustedes sí saben que es un empleado que está comprometido, ¿verdad? Y si ustedes sí saben un empleado que no está comprometido, esa es la imagen. Imagínense, y estos son números de Alemania de Gallup. Si sumamos estos tres son 100, ¿cierto? 16 y 15, o sea que nos da una persona, si, si, si lo balanceamos matemáticamente, una persona es la que está construyendo, ayudando a construir esa empresa, está comprometida con la empresa, está unida emocionalmente con la empresa. Por supuesto, tenemos lo que quizás en Venezuela decimos recoge cheques. ¿verdad? Hacemos lo mínimo indispensable para que cuando llega el primero, el 14, o el viernes, o el jueves, cuando nos paguen, estar ahí. Y esa es la gran mayoría. Para darle unos números, porque, porque estamos hablando cómo un líder tiene éxito. Quiero llegar ahí, ¿cierto? Pero yo lo veo desde esta perspectiva. En la medida que nosotros tengamos más personas dentro del equipo comprometidas, estoy teniendo éxito como líder. En la medida que haya más compañeros comprometidos dentro de mi equipo, yo siendo el líder, tengo éxito. Así de sencillo. Les voy a enseñar unos números. Yo utilizo mucho las fuentes de Gallup y utilizo mucho uh, también Forbes, porque hay gente que hace eh, muchos estudios. ¿no? Y hay una empresa también europea. Esto es a nivel mundial y esto es lo último que se tiene todo junto, como el 2016. Los de verde son las personas que están construyendo. Los grises son los que están haciendo lo mínimo. Y los rojos son, perdón, eh, los negros son, o los más oscuros, son los que están destruyendo. Pueden ver que a nivel mundial el cuadro es parecido. No es un problema de Wisconsin, o de Texas, o de Caracas, o de mi empresa, porque aquí les pongo las empresas. Gallup, todos los años, continuamente, tiene 12 preguntas que hacen. Y esto, o sea, esto tiene, ellos llegan a 180 países, 185 países, 160, con mucha consecuencia, con mucha constancia. Miren dónde estamos nosotros. nuestra industria. Es decir, por cada 100 personas, por cada 10 personas que yo tengo trabajando, no llegamos a dos que están comprometidas. Esto, la, la pregunta es por cuáles son los rubros. Esto es el sector eh, eh, agropecuario, productor. Okay. Gracias por la pregunta. Claro.
Okay. Eh, la, la, la pregunta es cómo, a, a ver si yo entiendo la, la pregunta. No, no, no importa, pero a ver si entendimos la idea todos, ¿verdad? La idea es que uno tiene que ser realista y que aunque uno quiera tener este número mucho más grande, pues no va a ser más grande, ¿cierto? Eso lo, lo perdón, ¿cómo, ¿cómo es el nombre? Jeremy. Um, eso es lo que piensa Jeremy, ¿entiendes? O sea, por supuesto que todo el mundo quiere que este número crezca, pero ¿hasta dónde puede crecer este número? La primera cosa como líder, en el momento, y después vamos a entrar a eso, en el momento que yo pienso que no puedo crecer, hacer crecer ese número, 100% seguro que ese número no va a crecer. Exacto. Entonces, en el momento que piensas en el límite, ya estás pensando que hay un límite. Entonces, es, es realista, optimista, eh, pesimista, por, por ahí vamos. Pero ahora, ahora vas a ver de dónde vengo yo cuando te diga las, las características de los líderes, ¿sale? Exacto. Y entonces, es bueno porque ahora vas a ver esto. Hoy día, en Estados Unidos, el primer trimestre, estamos en 39%. En Estados Unidos. Esto es Estados Unidos. Y es porque hay más personas que creemos que es la... Van, van a ver cuál, cuál, los, 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 cómo, cómo hacemos, comprometemos, hacemos engage, la palabra en inglés. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo los comprometemos? ¿Qué es lo que tenemos que hacer? ¿Perdón? Ahora vamos a eso. Él, él dice buen sueldo. Ahora vamos a eso. Miren lo que dice de lo que es la rotación de empleados. Y esto es Gallup. Okay. 50% de los empleados que renuncian o dejan la empresa, la empresa voluntariamente lo hacen por la mala relación que tienen con su supervisor directo. Reflexiones. Lo segundo, otro 25% lo hacen porque no se sienten valorados no siente que su trabajo es reconocido y se sienten víctimas explotados. Y entonces se te van por medio dólar o por 10 centavos más la hora. El ambiente de trabajo, porque a lo mejor le están pagando bien o están decente o le dan el aumento, pero esa persona... Cuando ve que hay, el ambiente no es bueno, que ve... Y, y ahora, no sé si el, el Roberto habló de, de esto en la, en la... ¿Cómo se dice? En la habitación del lado. Pero estas generaciones nuevas, sobre todo ahora los, los, los Zoomers, quieren que el líder sea ético. Y las dos generaciones, los milenios y los Zoomers, quieren transparencia. Cuando no la ven, cuando no la sienten, el ambiente... No es saludable. Piensan que hay favoritos, que se juega el favorito. Que la gente que asciende y que se puede mover dentro de la empresa o la gente que recibe favores es el favorito. Y eso se traduce en un ambiente no saludable. Entonces miren este número, porque si sumamos los dos, de cada 100 empleados que se van voluntariamente, 75 es el liderazgo. De cada 10, 7.5. Esos son los números en todas las industrias. Por supuesto, hay unos que se van, hay un porcentaje que se va porque la familia se mudó, hay unos que sí este, cambian de carrera, otros cambian de industria. Sí, todo eso existe. Pero el número es mucho más pequeño. ¿15 minutos? Por favor. Uh, entonces, miren, la, la, es muy fácil decir, sí, los líderes, el líder, o sea, gracias a que no hay un buen liderazgo, se nos va la gente, ¿cierto? Entonces, a través de todos los años que yo he estado trabajando en las diferentes ramos, ¿verdad? Porque trabaja, trabajamos en educación, trabajamos en la empresa farmacéutica como consultan en, en medicinas veterinarias, trabajamos y en, y en Sudamérica, trabajamos ahora como consultan técnico a nivel de lecherías aquí en Estados Unidos, incluso en, ¿cómo se dice?, a nivel de eh, ganaderías de carne, ¿cierto? Eh, 
Uno ha visto mucho, uno no es que sabe mucho, es que uno ha vivido, ¿verdad? Entonces, ¿cómo, cómo yo hago para que una persona se convierta en un líder? ¿O cómo, ¿Cómo puedo yo tratar de pasar esa información? Y entonces yo digo las tres bolitas, ¿verdad? Un poquito muy simple, ¿verdad? Este, me me hacía la corrección una persona que yo aprecio, estimo y admiro mucho, que deberían ser círculos, pero las bolitas es para ponerle un poquito de humor, porque tenemos estas dos bolitas y después la que me sube y me baja, es practicar a diario, ¿ok? Entonces estas son las tres bolitas, sí, sí, y lo puse para, para, para la gente de Guatemala, billón de quetzales, eso es, creo que... ¿Hay alguien de Guatemala aquí? ¿Cuánto será un billón de quetzales en dólares? Por eso son como ciento y pico de millones de dólares. ¿Ok? Para que tengan una idea. O sea, la pregunta de, de los ciento y pico de millones de dólares. Las tres bolitas. Bien sencillo. Y ahora las vamos a estudiar. ¿Cómo podemos convertirnos en buenos líderes? Tengo que conocer mis valores. Tengo que identificar mis fortalezas. Como persona, como trabajador y como líder, vuelvo a repetir, identificar mis fortalezas como persona, como trabajador, como líder, identificar las áreas que tengo que mejorar. Muy fácil decirlo. ¿Cómo ustedes pueden lograr esto? ¿Quién, quién nos da una idea en la sala de cómo podemos lograr esto? ¿Cómo te, él, él dice siendo muy autocrítico. ¿Cómo te conoces tú a ti mismo? Resultados, excelente. ¿Qué otra cosa podemos hacer? Tu personalidad. ¿Cómo, cómo sabes tú tu personalidad? El reflejo. Ahora vamos a ir ajá, de otra gente. Ahora voy a tocar ese punto otra vez. Cuando decías personalidad, Jessica, para, para matar el punto, ¿cómo sabes tú tu personalidad? Aparte de los comentarios que dice... Exacto, hay test de personalidad, está el Major Briggs, está el DISC, que, que te dan, si uno es honesto respondiendo eso, ese tipo de test, eso está más que estudiado, son instrumentos... ¿Me eh, entiendes? con amplia investigación, ahí es una parte que uno dice, ah, mira, yo hago esto. Y entonces uno se da cuenta que uno es diferente a otras personas, ¿cierto? Que uno es más introvertido, no, yo soy introvertido, yo no soy extrovertido, entonces yo no puedo pedir a todo el mundo que sea igual que yo. Y entonces ahora con uno como que comienza a entender a otros, pero primero tengo que saber dónde estoy yo. Perfecto, perfecto. Y ahí vamos con el punto que, está, que estamos diciendo. Otra gente, cuando dice otra gente, ¿qué gente es esa? Un ejemplo. Ok, está, ya estamos técnicos, test de personalidades. Hay algo que yo veo más fácil y porque tenemos que avanzar no, no lo puedo seguir preguntando, pero viene otro circulito, ¿verdad? otra bolita y ahí le vamos a, a caer. La persona que está contigo o está por debajo de ti, Pídele que te dé retroalimentación. Dale la oportunidad a que te critique. Yo siempre hago en las clases y pregunto, ¿cómo sé que yo soy un buen padre? Trabajo como negro, ¿verdad? Hago lo imposible y creo que soy un buen padre. Les doy valores, le hablo de los valores a mis hijos, le hablo bla, bla. Pero yo no sé si soy un buen padre. ¿Quién sabe si soy yo si, si soy yo un buen padre? Mis dos hijos. Es la perspectiva de ellos la que cuenta para mí. Porque a lo mejor sí, yo estoy proviendo una casa, un carro, les compro el carro, pero le estoy dando lo que él necesita o lo que ella necesita. ¿Cómo sé yo que soy buen esposo? Porque el Sancho me lo dice, no, mentira. Tiene que ser mi esposa, me tengo que sentar con mi esposa y pedirle. O cuando no lo estoy haciendo bien, cuando ve que estoy calmado, Santiago, bla, 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 bla. Es la única forma. Entonces, eso es una forma de conocernos a nosotros mismos. Por los resultados, diga. 
siempre que no sea, es válido una encuesta, es la pregunta, siempre que no sea, a, ¿cómo digo? Pues, eh, don Juan, ¿me puede ayudar? Siempre que, no, que no, uno no ponga el nombre. Anónima, gracias, muchas gracias por ayudar. Encuestas anónimas, por supuesto, que el empleado no sienta la presión. Ahora le digo con las encuestas que yo hago encuestas. El trabajador hispano es muy benevolente cuando lo hace con su eh, supervisor. Así que igual uno ve el trend, ¿cómo se dice? Igual uno ve la tendencia. ¿Me explico? Pero siempre los hispanos evalúan más altos que los anglos. Eso está cambiando un poquito con las generaciones más jóvenes. Los milenios están siendo un poquito, los milenios, eh, los hispanos que son, que están en la edad del milenio, de, de los milenios, son un poquito más severos, más, ¿sale? Pero sí, las encuestas. Es la única forma, desde el punto de vista de trabajo, sí. Yo lo que aconsejo es que uno tenga tanta confianza, porque ahora viene la segunda bolita, que se lo puedan decir a uno. Excelente las la respuestas y el compartir. Segunda bolita. Estamos hablando de conocer a mi gente, ¿verdad? A mi grupo, a mi equipo, a los miembros del equipo. Tengo que saber qué les interesa, tengo que saber cuáles son sus fortalezas o áreas de ayuda, qué los motiva, cuáles son sus metas. No dentro del trabajo, que también se las puedo preguntar o es lo ideal, pero ¿dónde quieren llegar ellos? Y la palabra escuchar. Cuando yo le digo qué les interesa, esto es escuchar. Muchas veces, yo que estoy trabajando en la parte esta de, de, de organizacional, uno quiere darle premio a los buenos trabajadores. Y uno busca, qué sé yo, a lo mejor se, se puso muy de moda las últimas dos décadas la pizza. Pero a lo mejor están hasta aquí, hasta la pizza, y no significa nada. Que le hacen un pizza party ahí en, en, aquí en Estados Unidos, ¿cierto? Entonces, cuando uno quiere... Bueno, eso es otro tema, pero cuando tú quieres recompensar a alguien, tú tienes que saber qué le interesa para llegarle a la parte emocional de esa persona. Para que crezca entonces el compromiso de esa persona con el equipo y contigo. ¿Sale? Pregunto, ¿cómo puedo lograr esto? ¿Quién nos ayuda? ¿Cómo tengo una relación cercana con mi personal? Muchas gracias. ¿Cómo eliminas las barreras? Excelente. ¿Cómo te tienen confianza? Yo lo explico de la forma siguiente. Las personas que tenemos, como te digo, otra persona significante, ¿verdad? Una esposa, un esposo. ¿Cómo comenzamos nosotros con ellos? Y eso es invertir tiempo. No, porque hay gente, no, yo no puedo, por el tipo de personalidad, yo no puedo. Se busca alguien que lo haga. Tienes que conocer a tu gente. Y la única forma es que tengas en algún momento de la semana o en algún momento del mes que te sientes y compartas. A lo mejor es la hora de la comida, ¿cierto? A lo mejor una ocasión especial que uno quiera celebrar algo que se logró dentro de la lechería. Pero comienza con eso. ¿Okay? Entonces, cuando yo conozco a mi gente y me conozco a mí mismo, lo que queda es fácil. Venga. Tienes que buscar, yo le digo, poner un colchón, poner a alguien entre el personal. Yo muchas veces despido a los dueños o incluso al general manager. No puedes tratar con la gente. Cada vez que tú estás cerca de la gente, entonces dale esa responsabilidad a alguien. Y ahora vamos a las, a las ocho características esenciales de un líder exitoso. Pero tienen que saber, y, y hay gente que me dice, tenías razón. Y tengo gente que son hermanos que, que dicen, despido a uno, y dicen, no, ahora despídeme a mí. Porque la vida cambia. Si tú eres un miserable... ¿Verdad? Porque tienes la presión del dinero con las dificultades que tenemos, ¿verdad? En la industria y la competencia y estás tratando de inventar algo. No puedes pasar esa energía a la gente. Entonces tienes que buscar un colchón. 
en el quien tú confíes y en que la persona confíe, que no es nada fácil, pero siempre hay alguien que uno puede preparar. Excelente. Ahora, ya las dos primeras bolitas, estamos claros como el agua de mi pueblo. ¿Qué es practicar a diario liderazgo? ¿Quién me da un ejemplo? ¿Cómo soy congruente? Si traduzco esto en una frase y es dar el buen ejemplo, ¿me la compras? Con lo que estás diciendo, dar el buen ejemplo. Eso es, es una de las prácticas a diario liderazgo. Cuando yo doy el buen ejemplo, ojo, también es liderazgo cuando doy el mal ejemplo. ¿Verdad? Ojo. ¿Entiendes? Pero es eso, dando el ejemplo. Perfecto. Yo siempre... Yo, ¿Perdón? Totalmente. ¿Qué otra cosa puedo hacer? Excelente. ¿Quién se anima de la, de la gente que está allá atrás? No, no se anima nadie. ¿Cómo tomas la iniciativa? Dame un ejemplo de cuando tú tomas la iniciativa. Yo, yo te voy, exacto, excelente. Sí, yo, yo, yo ahora te voy a dar un ejemplo, ¿verdad? Porque a mí me gusta trabajar con la gente con ejemplo. Mi señor entró a trabajar en una lechería, este, también es veterinario. Doris entró y se cayó una vaca en, en el parlo. Y ahí se atrasó el parlo. Y ella vio que la gente estaba amarrada. ¿Qué fue a hacer ella? Ella dejó su trabajo, ¿verdad? Lo que tenía que hacer. Y fue y buscó una, un loader. Este es el tercer día de trabajo de ella, que ni siquiera sabía manejar. Y les puso el loader ahí. Y dijo, ¿cómo les ayudo? Porque siendo mujer, ¿verdad? Mover una vaca, la fuerza. Y encima de Doris, eh, eh, 115 libras. Ahora, si digo el peso, me mata. Pero son 125, 127 libras. ¿Cierto? ¿Cómo vas a ayudar tú cuando estás? La fuerza bruta es la fuerza bruta, ¿cierto? Entonces, cuando tú das el ejemplo, cuando tú ves que está lloviendo, o tú le das el break al empleado, vete, vete a tu break. Y tú, eso. Ahí estás enseñando eso que tú estás diciendo. ¿Cierto? ¿Qué otra forma? ¿Cuál es la forma más sencilla? Más fácil de hacerlo. Todo eso implica nuestro trabajo. La otra es sonreír. Y darle bienvenida a la gente. Gracias por venir de corazón. Si no te sale, si vas a ser pobrita, no lo hagas. Pero si ustedes se ponen a pensar... Disculpa, yo te interrumpí. ¿Qué va? Pero tienes que ser auténtico, no digas buenos días, buenos días. Hey, ¿qué más? Tienes que decir, ¿qué tal? O sea, la gente tiene que sentir que estás conectando y le estás energía positiva. Me, mucho menos, mucho menos. ambiente entonces lo, lo que estás diciendo es que uno tiene que tratar de proveer un ambiente bueno, ya que el trabajador pasa la mayoría del tiempo, si sacamos las horas de 144 horas a la semana 56 o 34 creo que la pasan en la casa con, con la familia, se quitan las horas de sueño las horas de, de manejar, etcétera, yo he hecho ese número pero eso que estás diciendo, correcto totalmente, no, no es correcto, no puedo decir eso lo comparto al 100% ¿alguien más? Ahora vemos, y eso son parte de los valores, pero sí, la mayoría de hispanos respondemos bien a ese valor familia. Correcto. Entonces no es difícil. Ahí, ahí va lo que decía antes eh, la señorita Jessica, 
tu personalidad. Hay gente que no le importa que le, que le pongas el horario para pa, pa atrás y para arriba. Ah, no, hoy vas a hacer esto, es feliz. Pero hay muchos de nosotros que no, no, no. El, el, lo, lo que uno dice la palabra cambio, que don Juan siempre me dice cambio, es algo negativo. Entonces, uno tiene, por eso uno tiene que conocer a tu gente. Y si vas a hacer alguna modificación, tienes que avisarle a gente que se lo tienes que avisar con mucho tiempo. Y hay gente que no. Pero es eso, es la segunda bolita, conocer a mi gente. Si ustedes se ponen a ver al final, estas tres cosas dependen de nosotros, de, de la comunicación, incluso con nosotros mismos. Si yo no, ¿cómo fue la palabra que utilizaron? No fue autorreflexión, fue autocrítica. Para yo hacerme una autocrítica es porque estoy hablando conmigo mismo, ¿cierto? Entonces todo se trata de comunicación, todo, todo se trata de reflexión, pensar. La palabra comunicación es muy amplia. Piensen eso. Vamos, esto es lo, esto se los regalé yo ahí, lo puse en la, en el, en el, ¿cómo se dice? En la, en la hojita que les estamos dando. Y mira, mira lo que pedimos, lo que yo he visto, lo que yo he estudiado, uh, lo que yo he experimentado a, en las diferentes industrias que yo he trabajado. Los líderes, desde mi punto de vista de, de definición de liderazgo, que tienen éxito. Miren los primeros tres. Uno sabe dónde uno quiere ir. Tienes que tener una visión dónde tú quieres ir. ¿Sale? Esto lo digo yo. Vamos a hablarnos en términos técnicos. Yo no puedo poner, les doy el ejemplo, a una, a una persona que no quiere una vaca, que no le importa una vaca, que no le duele una vaca, en que me trabaje con las vacas frescas. ¿Cierto? Porque te va a hacer el trabajo, te va a meter el termómetro, va a decir, no, son tres días, hay que ponerle esto, papá, papá, papá. Pero tú no quieres esa persona. Ese no puede ser el perfil de una persona que trabaja con vaca fresca. ¿Estamos todos de acuerdo? Al 100. Igual, al líder que ponga, no es porque tiene más tiempo en, en el parlo o en la maternidad. No, no puede ser. No es el que sepa más y el que menos errores cometa. No es el que, se, que yo tenga más confianza. No se trata de que yo tenga confianza en él. Se trate de que a él le duela a su gente. Se trata de que le importe la gente. Porque esa persona va a estar entre la espada y la pared. Entonces, si estamos hablando para ser un líder exitoso, es lo primero que tienes que tener, el primer ingrediente. Sí, la visión es importante y te la vas haciendo y la vas modificando. Pero si no te importa la gente, vas a ser infeliz el resto de tu vida. Y vas a ser infelices a las personas que están a tu alrededor. No solo en el trabajo, sino también en tu casa. Porque cuando suena el teléfono, cuando nosotros vamos a nuestro supervisor, cuando necesitamos algo. Y nosotros como hispanos, la mayoría de hispanos, nos cuesta mucho ir al supervisor a pedir algo. ¿Cuántas horas no gastamos y energía no gastamos para llegar ahí? A pedir, necesito un permiso para que tengo la quinceañera. Para decir eso, Dios mío. Entonces, uno sabe que cuando uno es líder, uno tiene todas las metas que cumplir y uno sabe todo lo que nos están pidiendo el lado técnico, pero uno también tiene que saber que gran parte del trabajo es la gente. Lo que decíamos es positivo con, con Jeremy, ¿no? Es positivo. Si tú crees que lo puedes hacer, lo vas a poder hacer. Si nosotros hubiésemos dicho que íbamos a tener un teléfono, un teléfono una calculadora, una computadora, este, una cuestión de música... ¿Qué tenemos hoy día en los teléfonos estos de Smart? Todo. En el momento que nos ponemos el límite, yo, yo, yo he tenido la oportunidad de trabajar con gente eh, que ha estado en las Olimpiadas y ha ganado, y sus hijos han ganado. Y hay uno que me dijo especialmente que llegó segundo de Mar Spitz, y le había ganado en los pre-trials, antes de ir a las Olimpiadas, en los 200 mariposas, y entrenaban juntos en California. ¿Ok? Y Gary, cuando le dieron la medalla, disculpen, disculpen esta anécdota, cuando le dieron la medalla en, en, lo, en, este, en esta cuestión mundial, Mare Speed lo que le dijo a Gary, disfrútala, porque la de las Olimpiadas es mía. Ya lo que le está diciendo Mark Spitz, que era, ¿verdad? Eso sonó muy boomer, o muy tradicional esa generación, ¿verdad? Nos fuimos para allá, le está diciendo al tipo que le acaba de ganar, disfrútala porque la Olimpiada es mía. 
Y Gary me dice, entrenábamos justo todos los días porque éramos compañeros. Y a mí me metió un miedo. Si yo perdí, llegué segundo, no el día de las Olimpiadas, el día que nadé la, el evento final. Lo perdí esa noche cuando dije, este, este me va a jorobar. Entonces, ser positivo, uno puede, y aquí les viene el otro, yo puedo ser positivo en cualquier momento en mi vida, pero en los momentos más difíciles es cuando el líder cambia esa energía negativa, cuando hay la crisis, es que tú eres, tienes que poner esa energía positiva. No es nada fácil. Los otros tres, tienes que tener tus valores claros, ahora les doy un ejemplo de los valores. Las personas, cuando uno hace autocrítica, uno es humilde. Porque uno sabe que uno no lo sabe todo. Y uno sabe que uno comete errores. La humildad es una característica importante. Es empático. Ah, para ponernos en la misma sintonía, ¿quién me define lo que es empatía, por favor? Exactamente. Ponerse en las botas. Sentir el dolor ajeno. Ponerse en, la, en, la, en los zapatos de la otra persona. Hoy día, hoy día, sobre todo aquí en Estados Unidos, ah, en las grandes empresas, están dando un valor importante a la hora de las entrevistas, de tratar de ver... Estamos hablando de las empresas que están en la Nueva York. Ah, ¿Qué líderes? O sea, para contratar a alguien como líder, para subirlo, para promocionarlo, la parte de empatía. Da, miren lo que digo yo. Uno va a dar el ejemplo, ¿verdad? Como líder, porque por eso uno le dan la posición, pero tienes que dar el buen ejemplo. Y la otra palabra que se utiliza mucho, que es la parte de la comunicación, yo siempre digo feedback, es retroalimentación, que lo, ustedes lo mencionaron hace un ratito. Yo siempre tengo que dar y buscar. Y al mismo tiempo tengo que hacer seguimiento. Y esto es lo que ustedes tienen en su hojita, ¿verdad? Estas son las ocho cosas que yo considero que he visto en todos los líderes exitosos a través de todas las cosas que yo he estudiado, a través de todas las cosas que yo he vivido. Esto es, esto es un papel que yo a veces les doy a los muchachos para que identifiquen, son 60 valores que, que yo pongo. Y entonces que pongan, me pongan los cinco, los siete primeros, depende de qué tan profundo uno quiera ir. Pero esto no es importante, o sea, por supuesto esto es importante, pero lo más, para mí lo más que me gusta a mí hacer es, ok, explícame, por ejemplo, uh, para mí la lealtad, ¿qué es ser leal? Bueno, ser leal. Yo, no, 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 dame un ejemplo de qué es lealtad cuando tú estás trabajando. Ahora yo puedo entender, ¿verdad? Cuando yo explico mi valor, esto es lealtad. Y le doy el ejemplo. Para mí lealtad es que venga fulano de maternidad y tenga a buscar, y tú estás en mi equipo de reproducción, y vienes y hablas conmigo. Igual te vas a ir, pero me estás... Establecer una visión y meta general del equipo, así cuando establecemos los valores, esto lo podemos hacer. Uno lo puede traer ya, ¿cómo se dice? Preparado, y, y uno lo presenta a discusión del equipo. ¿Verdad? Y entonces, aparte, ¿verdad? yo como líder, a mí me gustaría conversar con mí, con, individualmente con la gente dentro de mi equipo, qué metas tienen. Les doy un ejemplo. A lo mejor este año yo trabajo en maternidad, ¿cierto? Y yo hago muy mal la parte de procesar la vaca. Eso es una meta individual que yo le puedo decir... Este, a don Juan, don Juan, necesito, vamos a decir, si él es el que no está procesando bien las vacas, yo quiero que, que se logre esto, o, o a lo mejor don Juan me lo dice a mí. Perfecto, esa es tu meta individual. A lo, a lo mejor la meta de Greg allá atrás es aprender a hablar español. Perfecto. ¿Cómo vamos a hacer? O sea, ¿cuál es la meta? ¿Cuántas palabras? ¿Qué? Ah, o sea, me, me explico, pero es sentar y, de, y dentro del equipo tener, ¿verdad?, cada individuo que tenga sus metas que ellos quieran lograr. Y puede ser del trabajo, puede ser fuera del trabajo. ¿Algún comentario? Ok. Una de las cosas donde yo veo que fallan más los muchachos, mientras más jóvenes, este, menos pena, pero mientras más viejos, más hacemos esto. No pedimos ayuda. Tenemos miedo de pedir ayuda. Y no solo pedir ayuda a tu supervisor directo, es también pedir ayuda a tu, a tu grupo. Y es la parte de ser humilde. No sé cómo hacer esto. Quizás vas a otro sitio o, le, o alguien que tú tengas de referencia, vas y lo llamas, que está dentro de la compañía. 
o quizás una persona que te cruzaste en la vida que tú confías en esa persona, pide ayuda. Hay gente que paga mucho dinero por los coaches. Yo soy coach, por si acaso. ¿Okay? Life coach, ¿okay? executive coach. Entonces, hay mucha gente. Entonces, no, no tengan miedo. No, no, no pueden sentir miedo, o, o lo pueden sentir, pero tienen que sobrepasarlo. Aquí tienen ustedes algo. No sé si, si yo transmito, a, a, ¿cómo se dice? Las ganas, que me, lo, lo que me gusta a mí hacer esto. Cuando yo estoy trabajando en algún sitio, ¿verdad? En cualquier departamento. Si a mí no me gusta, es muy difícil que yo sienta pasión. O sea, quizás no puedo ser líder de ese equipo. Puedo ser líder en otra sección que me apasiona y me gusta. Porque es necesario que nos contagie el líder. Sobre todo en los momentos de crisis y difícil. Por supuesto está la parte de autosuperación. De tomar cursos, de venir a este tipo de charlas de venir mañana sobre todo a um, líderes que tú hayas conocido en tu pasado, gente si fue a la universidad o el, a la escuela. Y les doy las últimas cinco. ¿Ok? Claro, no, yo voy un poquito más allá porque uno, uno, comunicación es muy amplia, pero uno habla de comunicación efectiva. Lo que pasa no les quise agregar, pero estamos hablando de comunicación efectiva, de comunicación efectiva. ¿Okay? ¿Alguna pregunta, algún comentario que ustedes tengan sobre esto? Nos quedan cinco minutos. Me gustaría dar otra partecita. ¿Mm? Okay. Sí, perfecto. El, 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 lo que está comentando él aquí es que hay, que, hay una, una línea muy delicada entre ser optimista, ser realista, y el hecho de no serlo, ¿verdad? Entonces uno pasa a tener fantasías y la gente deja de creer en ti como líder. Más o menos... a fútbol. ¿Todos entienden lo que es el fútbol? El Barça, el sol del Barça a morir toda mi vida. ¿Okay? Hoy día, el líder del equipo, el director técnico dice que no tenemos equipo para competir. Y te está diciendo, soy realista. Y es verdad, ya no tienen a Messi. Pero ese no puede ser el mensaje. Entonces, cuando tú me dices, digo, es verdad, no vamos a ganar la Champions. Pero para ganarnos un equipo, nos tiene que matar. ¿Me explico? Si no podemos vencer micoplasma a menos que hagamos A, B o C, pero sí lo podemos contener. O buscar formas de contenerlo. Y lo monitoreamos. Y necesitamos que ustedes, nosotros a largo plazo nos podemos deshacer de micoplasma sin matar todas las vacas, ¿verdad? Este, pero tenemos que, o sea, es un proyecto, paso uno, paso dos, y tenemos que ir dando paso corto, vista larga. Ahí es donde te va lo de, de Pitbull. Paso corto, vista larga. Entonces, ese es el optimismo. O sea, tú no te puedes sentir, no, con el micoplasma no puedo, ni modo. Entonces, lo que tú dices de optimista, y yo estoy de acuerdo, o sea, tú no puedes prometer, no, vamos a ganar la Champions. Pero sí puedes prometer, vamos a competir en la Champions. Se te va. Ella, ella dice que, que, que al final es, es tan delicado. Si el líder no es optimista, por cualquier detalle se viene todo abajo. Totalmente de acuerdo. Miren, porque aquí hablamos de ser optimista. Y esto es una clase de coaching que agarramos, ¿verdad? Esta es la forma que trabaja nuestro cerebro. Tenemos un pensamiento. ¡Puf! El pensamiento genera una emoción. ¡Puf! Y la emoción genera una acción. Es así de sencillo, así somos nosotros. Si yo vengo con un pensamiento negativo, ¿cómo va a ser la emoción? 
a fuerza. ¿Y cómo va a ser la acción? A lo mejor, y esto es lo que pasa con la gente que, que es víctima, no toma nada. ¿Para qué hago algo si al final? Entonces esa es la parte de optimismo que hablamos nosotros. ¿Verdad? Igual, pensamiento positivo, emoción positiva, acción positiva. Una de las cosas que no me quería ir sin decirles esto, yo lo diferencio de esta forma. Aquí viene el jefe, aquí viene el líder. El jefe manda, el líder da apoyo, pero a veces tiene que dar dirección. Depende de la experiencia del, del operador. El jefe controla, el líder motiva. El jefe exige, el líder inspira. Por supuesto, no escuchamos a la gente cuando somos jefe, ¿verdad? Eso es lo que hace un jefe, no escucha. No me importa esto, hay que hacerlo. Un líder escucha. Y al final... Entonces, como líderes, después de todo lo que nosotros hemos hablado aquí esta hora, estos 55 minutos, uno puede escoger. Porque yo digo, es el supervisor el que escoge. Si se convierte, va por el camino rojo, y quiere ser un boss... O va por el camino azul y se quiere convertir en un líder. ¿Quieres inspirar? ¿Quieres motivar? ¿Quieres dar apoyo? ¿Quieres dar dirección? ¿Quieres escuchar a la gente? ¿Quieres? Ahí es un líder. Y aquí viene un pensamiento de una persona que está en la sala, está Don Juan. El liderazgo no es que el liderazgo comienza con uno mismo. Eso lo dice Don Juan Quesada. ¿Okay? No creo que tengamos tiempo para las generaciones. Yo sigo si ustedes quieren, o los que se quieren se pueden, pero eh, básicamente en las generaciones lo que yo quería eh, que vieran era, um, en, hoy día en la fuerza laboral tenemos estos cuatro grupos, ¿cierto? Eh, se, se dio mucha promoción a los milenios, este, ya el milenio más, eh, más joven tiene 25 años, ¿verdad? 26 años casi, y están los Zoomers. Um, algo que es importante... Eh, la diferencia entre estos dos grupos que tenemos que estar es um, ellos les gusta trabajar en equipo a los milenios esta gente prefiere ser más independiente uno tiene que estar pendiente de eso uh, estos hacen todavía más tareas les gusta hacer más tareas que los milenios um, estos tienen que dar nivel de empatía y estamos hablando acerca de, de, acerca de la diversidad ¿no? o sea van, van un poquito más allá que los milenios uh, miren las diferencias ellos buscan flexibilidad en el trabajo, ellos buscan estabilidad en el trabajo, lo que hace que quizás estas personas se muevan menos de empleo, se mantengan más de empleo. Um, ellos quieren tener una vida donde está todo balanceado, tengo mi familia, tengo mis amigos, tengo mi trabajo comunitario, tengo todo eso. Estos valoran más el poder ascender dentro de la compañía. Ok, y el salario. A, a los milenios le digo porque yo soy muy directo y muchas veces duele cuando uno es directo, entonces uno tiene que ser como sugar coat, ¿cómo se dice? Como darse la, la pastillita suavecita. Sí, bueno, esto no está tan bien. A mí me gustaría si pudiese hacer esto, cuando uno está dando el feedback, la retroalimentación, el, el, zoomer, el boomer, el zoomer quiere que se lo digas directamente, porque si lo arreglas y lo entiende claro, sabe que puede ascender dentro de la compañía. Entonces son algunas diferencias y bueno, aquí tengo... Cómo las lidero, se fomenta el crecimiento. Uh, eh, últimamente se sabe que los Zoomers aprenden mucho con videos de YouTube, es una herramienta principal para ellos. Uh, hay que crear conexiones no solo profesionales, sino también personales. Uh, hay que tener revisiones formales trimestrales o semestrales, pero um, no formales, se pueden incluso hacer semanales. Este, tienen que entender para qué el trabajo que ellos hacen, para qué sirve, que, cuál es el resultado final. Y quieren que uno sea más un coach que un jefe. Okay. No sé si hay preguntas o comentarios. ¿Perdón? Muchas gracias. Ustedes, o sea, lo hicimos entre todos. Jeremy. No, no entiendo muy bien la idea, Jeremy. Tú tienes gente, 20 personas que no quieren...
O sea, estamos hablando que la gente, ustedes ven que mucha gente lo que quiere es que a cierta a, a cierta cantidad de meses me toca un aumento por derecho, por decreto. Los más jóvenes, claro, porque ellos, nosotros como hispanos, no nos gusta pedir aumentos. La generación joven tiene menos pena. Aquí en Estados Unidos la cultura es que uno tiene que ir a pedir el aumento. O sea, eso son unas diferencias, por eso lo escuchan más de los jóvenes. Pero yo siempre, y eso es un trabajo que uno tiene que hacer, por eso uno tiene que hacer evaluaciones este, anuales, de manera que ellos sepan dónde están en su trabajo, a qué nivel están. Porque si yo te doy una evaluación, bien sea que utilice letras, bien sea que utilice números del 1 al 4, bien sea que utilice números del 1 al 10, como ustedes quieran, yo he hecho dos millones de evaluaciones, es el momento que tú le estás dando feedback a la persona. ¿Cierto? Y entonces tú le dices, mira, aquí tú tienes un 3, ¿verdad? Entre el 1 al 10, por esto, por esto, por esto, por esto, por esto, por esto, por esto. Ahora, si tú hicieras esto y esto y esto y esto, esto va a subir. Entonces, una vez que tú tienes las evaluaciones hechas, es muy duro. Si sí los hay, frescos. Eh, si sí los hay, um, que te van a pedir el aumento. Pero no tienen, cuando ellos saben cómo se en la evaluación, su boleta de calificaciones, les cuesta mucho decirte, échale más al cheque mi experiencia. Ahí Greg me dice que estamos fuera de tiempo. Una preguntita más. Por favor. Excelente respuesta. Excelente. Lo que le agregaría yo que no dije en la primera intervención es, desde el momento que lo contratas, tú le dices, nosotros revisamos los aumentos o de los primeros tres meses que ganas esto, después se te aumenta, el próximo momento viene al año. O si tienen un corte, en los 15 de abril nosotros revisamos qué personas se les aumenta o qué personas... ¿Me explico? Pero la gente, eso es establecer las reglas claras desde el principio. Entonces ya la gente no te molesta cuando viene el aumento, cuando viene el aumento. A lo mejor algunos te van a llorar, eh, mira es que estoy apretado, tal y qué sé yo, perfecto. Pero establezcan las reglas claras y como dice él, a veces no puedo dar dinero, pero te puedo dar conocimiento. Excelente. ¿Estuvo? Oh, Jeremy, me está matando el... Autocrítica I will share eh, com, com, ah. Sí, pero lo que pasa es me estoy tratando por, por el tiempo. Um, yo sé si, me, eh, eh, si yo mejoré a través del tiempo. La pregunta es, ¿cómo yo sé que yo he mejorado a través del tiempo? Porque otra vez, si te conoces a ti mismo, preguntándole a la gente, pidiendo retroalimentación a la gente, ya sabes. Si tú ves que tienes menos turnover, hay, hay ciertas métricas que se pueden utilizar, sí. No se pierda. Sí, pero, pero si, si no es solo retención de empleados, sino que yo mejoré algunos aspectos de mi liderazgo, siendo, yendo al detalle, ¿verdad? ¿Cómo yo sé que mejoré? Porque uno pregunta, mi hijo me dice, yo todos los años a mi hijo, el día cerca de mi cumpleaños, le pregunto, ¿cómo voy? Ahora eres más paciente, sí, pero sigue siendo demanding, sigue siendo exigente. Y entonces ahí entra la conversación de exigencia. Igual lo puedes hacer con trabajador, ¿cómo? Me, me estoy pasando, te estoy, y te va a decir, o sea, cuando uno le da la oportunidad.
Totalmente de acuerdo con, con, con lo que dijiste, totalmente de acuerdo. Uno, uno sí puede ver su crecimiento ahora, sigue siendo subjetivo. ¿Entiendes? Y aunque tú se lo preguntes a otra gente, quizá la gente, entonces, eh, te evalúa más severamente, ¿no? Pero se trata de crear esa, esa confianza a través de la comunicación que hablábamos al principio. En la medida que la gente te puede hablar openly, o sea, yo, yo te puedo decir que mis hijos me critican a mí. La primera vez que yo le pregunté a mi hija, eh, este, hazme una crítica, se puso a llorar. Si tú eres no sé qué, no, yo no puedo ser el mejor. Y entonces, ¿sabes lo, que, lo único que, claro, en su mente de, de 11 años, dice, pues, comes mucho dulce? Y esto se aplica para el trabajador. A lo, a lo mejor, ¿sabes que Cuando vienes acá, ni siquiera nos dice buenos días, Santiago, vienes, estos últimos días vienes, me disculpa la expresión, encabronado. Qué bueno. Entonces, nos vienes con una carota. Me lo tienes que decir. O ya se te quitaron las carotas, sabemos que estás haciendo un esfuerzo, pero en la medida que hay comunicación, ¿verdad? Pasa eso. Y es, y es un trabajo continuo. Y uno nunca, la idea es uno superarse. Aquí les, los dejo con una frase. Creo que es, justamente se la comenté agregante eh, de, de Lombardi, del coach de fútbol. Tú nunca alcanzas la perfección. Pero en el camino de buscar la perfección, logras la excelencia. Muchas gracias. Gracias por la participación. Mañana a las 2, mismo Vaticanal.
we'll go ahead and get started then this morning with uh, our first presentation. Uh, first of all, my name is Dennis Hancock. I we'll go ahead and get started then this morning with uh, our. We'll go ahead and get started then this morning with uh, our first presentation. Uh, first of all, my name is Dennis Hancock. I get to be the center director for the U.S. Dairy Forage Research Center. It's a USDA Ag Research Service-based 
um, center that is here in Madison. We also have our research farm at Prairie du Sac and a location in Marshfield as well. So uh, we have a, a good slate of seminars scheduled for this week and really excited to bring this one uh, from uh, Dr. Bernard, who's going to be talking about summer annuals, warm season uh, annuals for your forage systems in the dairy industry. I think there's some real opportunities for, for that for us. And um, John's got a lot of experience with that in Georgia, and I'm sure he's uh, got lots of great information here to, uh, to share with you. So with that, John, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I'll start handing out the, the handouts. Well, good morning. Get this. Is that a little better? I try, I try to speak up, and, and they've got the sound turned up, so make sure everybody hears me good. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with you this morning. I appreciate the invitation to come up and talk about using warm season forages as part of your forage program. Now, from my perspective, I think about a forage program. It's not just one forage. Most everybody grows multiple forages there, and you've got to look at that entire system, not only the cropping system, but how they go together to provide feed for your cattle. So how do you integrate those in there? And warm season annuals, um, Oh, there we go. Um, learn the technology here. There's been some increased interest in using warm seasons and annuals, and there's a variety of things that push that. You know, a few years ago, it was a real wet spring in a lot of the country. It delayed planting of corn to the point in many places it's too late to plant corn. So you looked at an alternative, and a lot of that uh, wound up being a warm season annual. In some cases, it may be the way it fits into your cropping season. Other parts of the country, uh, you got drought conditions. Uh, in Georgia, uh, the saying down there, we're only seven days from a drought or being too wet. It depends on what the weather was. Water availability is certainly a growing issue in many parts of the country. Uh, irrigation is there, but is there enough water to run? And then when you get into places like California's experience as well as other parts of the country, water is limited. And so you're being cut off on terms of use of as much water is maybe what you need, so you may have to look at other alternatives. Sometimes we get in a position we didn't quite get the yield of forage off of our main crops, and we may look at a summer annual, uh, warm season annual here to provide some additional forage to fill in that gap. It may be, uh, well, the other thing I think that has driven some interest is over the last decade or two, there's been a large improvement in number of varieties that can deliver some high quality forage that can be used not only lactating, but all different uh, type of diets. Sometimes, depending on your labor situation and your equipment, it may be something you wanna look at just to spread out your labor and equipment usage, rather than have that big slug that's tied into harvest of one crop, okay? So there's a lot of other things, and there may be some other reasons here that you look at using warm season annuals. Um, With anything, there's pluses and minuses. And I think you've got to look at that and understand that with whatever. In the case of warm season, one of the first things that we talk about is they do have a higher degree of drought tolerance than most other forages. They're more efficient in terms of the way they use water here to grow forage. In some cases, they're a little more tolerant of lower fertility soils. Now, they're not gonna grow on real poor soils and give you the same yield as a, a better soil, but they will tolerate a little better maybe than corn or alfalfa. There are some varieties that have some very short growing seasons, so the potential to grow some forage in a short time frame, particularly if you're a little short. Some say they're less expensive to grow than other forages. Uh, that may or may not be the case. I tell you, you need to put a pencil and paper to that to figure out is that the case for your situation or not? Certainly these can be a source of digestible fiber, okay? Corn silage, you know, we, th we think of it as a forage, but in reality, it's 50% corn grain on a good corn silage. So it's a 50-50 blend of forage and concentrate in reality. This is 100% forage, just to put it in perspective, 100% fiber for the most part. On a negative side, because you don't have that starch, 
you've got a little lower energy content. So the boost in energy is going to come from improvements like BMR. And when we get into BMR, non-BMR varieties, because of that extra fiber and the lower digestibility, it may limit intake and production, particularly if you're looking at higher producing cows that don't have the capacity to eat as much. When we get into other cattle that don't have that limitation for intake, it's not as big an issue. You do have more limited weed control options with a lot of these warm season annuals compared to our corns that have a lot of uh, traits in them, uh, maybe some of the other forages. There is potential for nitrate and prussic acid toxicity, particularly after a drought, after insect pressure, certainly uh, frost. Uh, I will say that prussic acid is not an issue in millet, which is an advantage there. Um, these can be very difficult to harvest as hay just because it takes a long time to dry them down. They're good for making baleage or chopping uh, into silage, but understand the limitations here. Okay. If we look at the water use part of it, sorghum is roughly two times as efficient as corn uh, in terms of pounds of forage produced per acre per inch of water, okay? And if you look at forage sorghum, it's a little higher. The BMR is someplace in between that as a, as a BMR forage sorghum. So there's been advances in the drought tolerance of corn, but I don't think we're quite to the same level yet. And that is an interesting thing to kind of watch and see how that comes along as well. But this is one of the big niches that is, is helping to drive some of the, the adoption here of these. Part of the difference is differences in root structure. Corn doesn't have as quite as deep a root system and certainly not as abundant compared to some of these summer annuals. So that makes a difference. When you get into cost and fertility, uh, and this is based on Texas recommendations, it takes about the same amount of nitrogen to produce the same tonnage of forage sorghum as it does corn silage. So there's really no savings there. You can argue there's a little bit of savings in terms of phosphorus. The bigger savings in terms of fertility comes in potash. It takes less potash per acre than corn. Now, seed costs are much lower for most of the, the warm season annuals than corn, because you don't have all the traits and things like that in there. But the thing you've got to look at, there is considerable variation out there in the population of varieties that's available in terms of dry matter yield, and there's also variation in terms of quality. So you've got to do your homework on variety selection. Some things that have really helped move these up to uh, consideration is uh, over two decades ago, identified varieties that had brown midrib gene in them. This is a natural mutation that occurs. It's not a GMO trait. And that BMR uh, trait basically means there's less lignin. And I always kind of use the analogy, lignin is kind of like the mortar you use to put the brick together or the block together to hold everything solid. It interferes with digestion. So as you lower lignin concentrations, it allows the fiber, the NDF, to be more digestible. And that's how the cow gets more energy out of consuming a BMR variety versus a normal. But there's trade-offs. You get a little lower yield, dry matter yield. The average was somewhere around 10%. Some of the newer varieties won't have quite that much yield drag, but it is something you have to acknowledge up front and you need to look at that variety test data to see how the variety you're looking at compares in yield versus other. Now, I will tell you at this point too, the BMRs are not as drought tolerant if you get into a too, true drought, okay? They aren't going to perform as well in that situation. But that's one of those things we don't know that's coming until it hits us in most cases. The other thing that goes along with this, because the BMR, you don't have as much lignin there to give the rigidity to that plant, it's more susceptible to lodging, particularly if you think about forage sorghum that's getting up there 10, 12 foot tall. And again, I spent over 20 years in South Georgia, a lot of tropical storms come through there, you have wind events up this way as well. There's nothing that hurts you thoughts about harvesting a crop when you see it all laying down, okay? It's not pretty. So the Brachitic Dwarf, basically it's about a six foot tall variety. It's not as susceptible to lodging. It has a bigger stalk to it. Uh, and when you get those two traits together, then you've got a forage that will stand up with some of the winds. It won't stand up to a, a hurricane. Uh, 
I don't think anything will from that standpoint, but it still reduces that lodging potential. And when you put the two together, it gives something there that you can really work. And you don't seem to get a, a reduction in yield because you've got a bigger plant. The other thing that's come along, uh, you find this probably more in some of the sorghum sedan grasses as well as some of the millets. There's some high sugar or sweet varieties out there. The higher sugar concentration helps them ferment a little better, but it also provides a little more energy there to support microbial protein synthesis there for the cow, provide a little more energy in total for milk production, okay? So that's a good thing. Uh, there is a population of photosynthetic uh, sensitive varieties. Uh, these basically have a delayed maturing. So they keep growing and you can get tremendous tonnage off of them, okay? So if you're looking for high yield and that's your criteria, these have a place there for you. But the quality is not going to be as good as some of the others because it continues to grow there as so, long. At least the gains in quality improvement, digestibility haven't come along as fast as, as the others. I'm not aware of any of those that have the BMR trade in there. Again, when you put those two together, you'd have an increased uh, chance of lodging there. So you have to be careful about that. Should you consider warm season annuals? I would say yes. Should you plant them? That's a different question, okay? I think you, you need to go through and think about what your needs and what your options are. And this is true for any forage, and it's a good practice to sit down and, and after you've got all your forage harvested, look at what did it turn out yield-wise? What was the quality? What changes do I need to do? What different mixes do I need to make? I look at things like agronomic factors, soil fertility, weed control. The big thing is water availability. The practice that we use, and it's all quite common in South Georgia, on our irrigated land where we didn't have limitations of water, we would still grow our corn, but on our dry land, we would go with the forage sorghums because we could be better assured of making a good crop, and we didn't have to worry about the problems of alpha toxin or some of the other mycotoxins that could come in that drought-stressed corn. So how does that fit into your situation? You may have different criteria, but that's some things I think you look at. Growing season, again, some of these may be as narrow or short as 60 days. Some of them will be out 100, 120 days. So does it fit into your system? What's your forage inventory and what do you need to feed if you've got a, a hole? And that may be the difference between whether you select BMR or a normal variety. If you're feeding lactating cows, I would tell you for the most part, you want to look at the BMR varieties because of the higher digestibility and the because of the higher digestibility, you're going to maintain the intake and production. But if you've got dry cows and heifers and you may need some extra fiber for fill, then the normal variety may be the best option then. So you look at those and see how it comes in. There may be other factors for your particular operation that you need to take into consideration that I hadn't thought about or listed here. You have a number of options as far as uh, things you can grow. Forage sorghum probably is the most common. Sorghum sedan grass uh, gets a lot of acreage as well. Sedan grass, millet, I see a little more information about millet coming out and use of that beyond grazing. Uh, forage soybeans, uh, there's not a lot of those, but they can fit in there, uh, particularly if you're looking at planting, interseeding with millet. Cow peas the same way, or iron, iron clay peas. Uh, they have some fits. I think as we look at these alternatives, you need to think about what is that final product going to look like? And compared to corn silage, yeah, protein content's a little higher, but these are grasses, so we're not really growing them for protein content. They have higher fiber concentrations because they don't have as much starch. There's not as much grain up there. Remember corn silage, I said somewhere 50% grain on a good corn silage variety, maybe a little less, 40 to 50. These may be only have 10, 15% in a traditional forage sorghum if you let it go out to a soft dough stage of maturity. When you get into the sorghum, uh, sedan and sedan grasses, uh, you've got even less uh, starch there. Ash content will be a little bit higher too. Now when we look at the forage soybeans, because they're a legume, they should have a higher protein content. The fiber is going to be more similar to what it is to corn from that standpoint, but it's less digestible because it's got a lot more lignin. Think about how rigid that stalk is of the soybean. The leaf is what's digestible there. So. When you look at it, just think about what the resulting material is going to be. You do see the difference here in NDF digestibility 
for the brown midrib compared to the normal. And that is its uh, advantage here. Some of the early work we did, we looked at um, and other parts uh, here that, yeah. Oh, this is a population of samples that was submitted to Cumberland Valley Labs. I assume you're gonna find a similar uh, breakdown in analysis if you go to Dairy One or, or Dairyland or anybody else. But these representative samples that were shipped in from January of 2020 through uh, 1st of August this year. And, and if you look at it, there's a pretty good um, number of samples here for, for the corn salvage and forage sorghum, but the numbers start to drop off quite a bit, and certainly if you look at forage soybeans, it drops off considerably. So, good question. Uh, this is one of the first trials that I did with forage sorghum at Georgia, and we grow winter annuals. We have a triple cropping system down there, so it's a little different than what it would be up here. Uh, we've got a much longer growing season. We don't have the harsh winter. So we'll plant a winter annual. In this case, we were using ryegrass. Sometimes we use triticale, sometimes we use oats. We use a mix of things. We try to schedule that around uh, our harvest schedule and planting. Uh, so, you know, you do things for different reasons at times. It's remembering why you do those things. Uh, but we also have some dry land that we raise forage sorghum. So I wanted to look if, if we're not able to grow enough corn silage, what happens if we feed these? And is there any advantage to altering the ratio of the two? So we fed them diets of 50-50 forage sorghum to 50% ryegrass silage or 75-25. And these diets had 40% forage in them. The big difference in terms of formulation, they were all balanced uh, and they were supplemented with either ground corn, it's a GC, or it was hominy feed or a combination of the two in this case because that was some of the uh, energy sources people were using around this time. Again, this, this work's getting a little, little bit older now. But bottom line, there really wasn't any differences until we got down to energy corrected milk. And that was in favor of feeding a higher proportion of sorghum to ryegrass. And I think if you look at that and think about it, it's because those diets had about 24.5% starch versus 21% for the 50-50. That starch is really important for an energy source in there to fuel not only fiber digestion, but also microbial protein synthesis, fat production and such. And you kind of see that there. And that also equated into a higher efficiency as measured by energy corrected milk by, uh, per unit of the dry matter intake. So this is what we can do. And these were mid to late lactation cows. Again, this was uh, somewhere around 2007 uh, when we did this work. So it's, it's getting a little bit old at this point. But that is some of the potential that we can do with that. Rick Grant did some of the earlier work looking at the BMR forage sorghums when he was at Nebraska. And this was a slide I think that helps explain some of the things that we see in terms of differences. Uh, and this is all in vitro digestibility, uh, looking at NDF digestibility. And the first thing is lag. When a cow eats a meal, there's a period there between that forage is consumed or the diet is consumed and the bacteria can attach and actually start to break down that fiber. Okay, And if you look at this, there is a delay here in uh, the time that the bacteria start to digest this normal forage sorghum compared to the corn uh, or to either the BMR forage sorghum or the alfalfa. Again, that's the interference of lignin to some degree uh, coming in there. There's no differences in the rate. Once the bugs started to break down that fiber, they broke it down at somewhat similar rates or at least no statistical difference. Because of that delay, 30 hour in, uh, in vitro uh, NDF digestibility was lower for the normal forage sorghum compared to all the others, okay? So I think this is the thing you gotta kinda keep in mind here. Normal forage sorghum has had a bad rep, particularly in lactating cows, because it is slower digested, it doesn't produce as much energy. The BMR looks much more favorable compared to the alfalfa and corn, not necessarily on par with it, in, in all cases, but fiber digestibility was equal at 30 hours. Now, yesterday Mary Beth was given a talk and she talked about uh, sometimes we do things in research that's different than what you might do in the field or what you should do in the field. In this case, this is the first trial and they wanted to look at the value of these forage sorghums compared to diets based on either corn silage or alfalfa. 
So what they did, they formulated the diet for the corn silage, and then they basically fed that same diet, except they substituted the alfalfa or the BMR forage sorghum or the normal forage sorghum for the corn. So the first thing you see is NDF increases substantially when we put in the forage sorghum. You don't have as much starch, you got more fiber, so it makes sense, okay? Uh, alfalfa, because it has a little lower fiber concentration in this case compared to the corn silage, did drop. Uh, statistically, no differences, but I think we would all agree that these cows ate less than, than those on the corn. And that shows up in milk yield here, which is lowest for the normal as well as yield of fat and protein, energy correct or fat corrected milk here, and efficiency. When we come on down through uh, the BMR forage sorghum and alfalfa, we're somewhat comparable here. The corn silage in this case worked the best. But when you look at these diets, you know, the corn silage is maybe a little higher than what we might formulate for NDF intake, but it's pretty close to some of the recommendations here, or at least it better in line than, than some of the others. Now, they did a second trial with the same forages. This case, they used 35% uh, of each of the normal forage sorghum, the BMR forage sorghum, and the corn silage, plus 17.5% uh, alfalfa. They balanced each of these rations. So you look at NDF was very similar and, and right in line with what we might think here. In that case, no differences in intake. Uh, in this case, BMR, uh, the cows supported higher milk yield than on the normal, but statistically it wasn't different than the corn. No differences in fat percentage or yield. I didn't put the yield up there just to save some space on the slide. But when you look at 4% uh, fat corrected milk, it was highest for the BMR, uh, intermediate for corn, and normal. Now that may not normally be what you see in all cases, but bottom line, it will s support similar milk production as diets based on corn silage when we have them formulated. Um, we did a, a trial sometime a little later. As I mentioned earlier, we do three crop rotations. Okay, We'll plant two corn crops a year plus a winter annual. It's a tight schedule, but it can be done, and we can produce a lot of forage. This is one of the advantages in the south that kind of counteracts some of the heat stress we have to deal with from time to time. But this is, uh, we planted our first corn crop, and uh, it's the first column there. Then in, we harvested that in July and replanted the second crop uh, that we harvested late October, early November. Uh, we planted the same forage sorghum, and this was a brachytic dwarf BMR variety uh, at the same time as the first corn crop. What we did with the second crop, rather than replant it, the forage sorghum will retune or regrow from that stubble. So we fertilized it, did a little weed, weed control there uh, right after we harvested. We let it grow, okay? So then we harvested at the same time using the same equipment as corn silage. So if you look at the, at the chemical composition of that resulting forage, very similar for both crops, higher, for, higher fiber concentrations there for the forage sorghum than the corn silage, which we expect, lower starch. Starch digestibility, and this is one thing I think uh, we've got to keep in mind, a lot of the kernel processors are not going to process that grain sorghum to the same degree of effectiveness as corn. They're designed for corn, okay? Uh, and one of the groups here talked about there is a different process or roller that you need to put in there that's different uh, than corn if you're going to do a lot of this to really effectively process that, that grain. So the, the later crop harvested later in the year, we didn't have quite as much heat there in the end of it, so that starch is a little more digestible. It's not quite as mature as what that first crop is. When we fed it to the cows, no differences in intake production. And these were mid-lactation cows, so they performed fairly well here uh, in that situation. The only differences we see is some higher MUN concentrations, particularly with the forage sorghum, but also with that second crop corn silage. Now, the only thing that bothered me about this trial was those two fall crops, we had eight inch rain event one night. And that delayed us from putting nitrogen on that crop for about a week and a half, two weeks, compared to where we wanted to do it. So we repeated it. And when we repeated it, 
we basically got the same results. The only little thing that popped up, uh, fat content uh, was a little lower there with the second crop corn silage. Uh, MUNs were higher for forage silage, no differences there for the corn silage. So it will work from that standpoint. Again, we balance these diets uh, within each of the species of uh, corn or forage sorghum to make sure we had similar levels of fiber, similar levels of energy. There's a meta study, and a meta study, if you're not familiar, you, you go into the literature, you look for all the work that's been d published on an item, and then you try to sort out, put all those studies together and sort out what does the whole body of information tell us, okay? In this case, they looked at normal forage sorghum versus BMR, and that's the first column here. And basically what it says, forage sorghum, normal forage sorghum versus BMR, normal forage sorghum is not gonna support as much intake, milk yield is gonna be lower, fat percentage and yield is gonna be lower, milk protein yield was lower, and lactose yield is lower. So from a component standpoint, if you're going to formulate those diets from that standpoint, you need to be thinking about that to maintain that. Now also remember like that very first study I showed you where fiber wasn't balanced, that study is included in this set of data. There's only nine studies. There's not as much research out there on some of this as you would find for corn silage. There's a lot more information out there because it's been used much more here over the years. When we compare BMR forage sorghum to corn silage, Statistically, no difference in intake uh, or milk yield. Fat percentage tended to be a little bit lower for the corn silage versus the BMR. Uh, milk protein percent and yield was a little higher, which I think makes sense. Again, those, that corn silage is gonna have more starch. So unless you add a lot of grain into that diet, you're not gonna have the same energetics or fermentation in the rumen as what you would have uh, with that uh, fiber source. So it, it, this says you can put it in those rations, can make it work there pretty good. Now, what about grain sorghum? There's very limited information out there on that. It has a lot more grain than a normal forage sorghum would have. Uh, and um, as such, it has some interest there. But again, there's not a lot of information. This is the one trial that I found. There was another study back earlier um, back in the early, uh, in the late eight, 1900s, uh, 1990s, um, that um, Keith Bolson did, uh, but it was much lower production. Here, uh, if you look, these cows, um, not a whole lot of difference here other than the forage sorghum, the normal forage sorghum, uh, those cows did not produce as well. When you fed grain sorghum, not quite the same milk production, but statistically it wasn't different. But again, you get a little lower milk, uh, milk protein yield, and you have some issues here with MUN. They're gonna run higher, okay? That's kind of the bottom line on that. So is this a strategy that works? A lot of people look at that because we can get more grain, a little more starch, not as good as corn, but it is a, a option here from that standpoint. What about sorghum sedan grass? And there's very limited data on that. This is a study from Minor Institute. And again, you can look at the forage composition but the BMR forage sorghum, very good fiber digestibility, 58% versus 46 for the corn. Uh, and then they formulate diets with either 35 or 45% forage from each of these, plus about 9.5% alfalfa. They fed it to some cows. And this is, this is the study I keep looking at. Uh, and I think the bottom line in this, you know, when they're feeding the corn silage, 35%, that's a high concentrate diet, low forage diet, okay? So there's not as much uh, forage in it compared to the others. Uh, so it should support higher levels of milk production, okay? But when you look at the 45%, again, we have some alfalfa with this or alfalfa grass with this. You know, uh, NDF in the diet is a little bit elevated, but not near as much as when we put in uh, sorghum sedan grass. But milk yield was very comparable here on the 35% is here, but when we go up to the higher levels, I think because of the lower intake here and restriction because of the fiber, we hurt production. So it's one of those things realizing that the fiber content, while it can be digestible, can bite you in a lactating ration if we don't account for that extra fiber there. So we can push it too far. 
So it's, it's kind of doing your homework and doing that. And, and particularly if you're in a component market, it not only affects meal fuel, but it also can affect um, component yield. In this case, percentage protein, yeah, it wasn't that different, but you get a, uh, slightly less milk protein than you do here with the corn silage, uh, particularly when you push it up to 45%. Now, the big problem with all the members of the uh, sorghum family, sugarcane aphid. In 2013, sugarcane aphid changed its diet. It, it modified it. Rather than staying with sugarcane, it decided it liked sorghum as well. And we didn't have any controls. It can be fully devastating. It can kill a crop here from that standpoint. From grain sorghum, it can reduce pollination. And these um, aphids, they get on the underside of the leaf, they basically suck out the sugar, and they make a mildew in there, and that can complicate harvesting, particularly for grain sorghum. It doesn't seem to complicate uh, harvesting for silage as much. So we have to look at it. Now, the, the one thing to date is that sugarcane aphids do not affect millet. So this is strictly looking at members of the sorghum family. So it's forage sorghum, grain sorghum, sorghum sedan grass, sedan grass, Johnson grass, okay? So what has happened here over time, yeah, we've looked at methods here for control, and they vary from state to state as far as what is approved, but breeders have looked at tolerance out there among some of the different varieties, and today in the variety test trial, they're rating those varieties for that and publishing that information. So if you're looking at this, you want to select varieties that are more tolerant. Thing to understand, none of them are resistant they're all susceptible to some degree, but some have more tolerance, otherwise won't be hurt as bad. And when you go out there and start to look at these, you've got to look on the underside. So some things that are that, uh, practical that you can do for controlling Johnson grass, you want to get rid of it. I mean, most of us want to get rid of it anyhow. But the thing about Johnson grass is sugarcane aphids will overwinter on it. So it gives them a hiding place there to carry over that population. So we want to get rid of that. Plant varieties that have tolerance, plant early, that seems to help because the aphids come on during the hotter part of the year. Plant treated seed, that seems to give some resistance there. Scout early and often, and it, you can't do this from the pickup. You gotta get out in it, and you gotta look on the underside of the leaf. And when you start seeing ladybugs flying around before you get out in there, that's a good sign that, that there's some sugarcane aphids because ladybugs eat the, the uh, sugarcane aphids and then treat with an approved heck, uh, insecticide. And those vary from state to state as far as what's approved in terms of the, the amounts too. Now, let's shift gears and talk about millet a little bit. Uh, there's some information out here on this. Most millet that I saw in the southeast was grazed um, for dairy cattle or beef, uh, but we do have some put up and fed in dairy cows. This happens to be from Canada, okay? So it can grow in some of the northern climates. But this is a study looking at a sweet variety compared to a normal, compared to a corn silage based diet. And the thing you see, again, we're fighting um, intake here because the higher fiber levels, the intake was depressed. Uh, the depression in milk yield was not as bad for the sweet variety as was for the regular variety. So the extra sugar does help support a little higher milk yield and it helps maintain higher uh, milk protein compared to uh, the regular variety. This is a study here from Penn State. Uh, it's pretty interesting, I think, from that standpoint in that they harvested this millet here at roughly a foot tall. And they fed it to some early lactation cows. And it's hard to find a lot of any studies out there with early lactation cow data, okay? Um, they substituted 10% of the corn silage with pearl millet and they fed it. It took a little bit of a hit in milk production, but milk fat tended to be a little higher here uh, at 3.7% versus 3.45, so milk fat yield was essentially the same. Milk protein yield, uh, numerically a little lower, but not different. So when you put it all on an energy corrected basis, it's very similar. So it is an opportunity, and it's, it kind of shows you one way you can use these to stretch your corn silage when you're short on corn silage, rather than going to an extreme. Now we took it a little bit higher in a study that we did, uh, well, yeah, there we go. 
where we looked at a pearl millet, and it was a BMR variety versus a Perkitic Dwarf BMR variety forage sorghum. And we fed these uh, at basically 20% of the dry matter with another 32% of the dry matter coming from corn silage. And we fed it again to mid-lactation calves. No differences in milk production, okay? So they did very well there. A couple of things here to finish up on. This is some work that we started uh, just prior to COVID starting and prior to my retiring. Wanted to look more into the millets and see what the opportunities was. Because we're looking at some things here uh, differently down there. What do we follow that second crop in? Particularly with more hurricanes, more tropical storms blowing through part of that area. And we wanted to look at, at uh, a normal variety of millet. Uh, we used the tiff leaf millet that was developed there at Tifton. And then we used a, a, a BMR variety. Uh, it happened to be the seed variety. Then we planted uh, iron clay peas or forage soybeans or then a 50-50 mix of those. And we planted late in the summer after that first corn crop was harvested or we planted earlier in the spring. Now the first planting we planted it, we had a little shower, everything grew, but then water cut off. This is all dry land and we didn't make anything. That's how severe a drought can be down there. But then it started raining uh, and we were able to the following year uh, follow up with this or follow up that fall with, with the uh, summer planting uh, in late July, early August. And that's what you, what you see here. And the, the takeaway I would tell you from this is that if you look at the growth of the millets, they love warm season. If you plant a forage soybean late in the season, it doesn't have enough time to grow, or it didn't down there. When we planted these in the spring, we got a little cooler time frame. The millets didn't do quite as good. And typically, we used to say that the sorghum sedan grasses would grow better in the early spring, tolerate a little cooler weather, and then we should plant our millets a little later because they love the heat. But we did see some synergies here from planting the mix of those. I will tell you that the uh, iron clay peas grew exceptionally well in that spring crop, but they were 100% lodged. The only reason I was able to get a yield, I hand cut, okay? I couldn't have machine cut and harvested anything. If you look at the quality of those, okay, it's kind of what you'd anticipate when we go to the soybean uh, or the combination, we get a little more protein. Fibers drop a little bit here with the, the soybean meal. But all of these, when we ferment them, that protein is going to be very degradable. So much more so than corn or, or some, some of the other forages we deal with. So to kind of pull some things together, you need to look at varieties. There's a lot of variation out there. Yield drag, I think when you look at some of the newer BMR varieties, it's not as bad as some of the older data would suggest. But there's differences there among those varieties. So do your homework. And certainly varieties differ in tolerance to sugarcane aphid. So do your homework on variety selection. We like to harvest the grain sorghum, uh, forage sorghum there when that uh, grain hits a, a um, dough stage of maturity. So that grain is going to be more digestible. If you let it get a little more so, it's kind of like BBs. Unless you can get it processed good, it's going to pass through the cow. So I think that is reality. So if you're doing some things, talk with whoever your kernel processor uh, operator is or who you buy your kernel processing equipment from to make sure their processor is going to actually process those grain uh, pellets there. Nitrate prussic acid can be an issue if you get into a drought uh, or if you get frost, uh, particularly late this time of year, or even insects can kind of precipitate, particularly prussic acid. Uh, if you think that's a problem, it's a good to sample. If those levels are high, give that plant about five, seven days, and those levels will naturally come down if you've had some rain from standpoint of nitrate or if you don't have any other insults such as frost uh, when we look at the sorghum varieties. Melvin is not uh, an issue in terms of prussic acid. Uh, fermentation will decrease those concentrations, but not necessarily eliminate 100% of it, so it depends on where you're starting at. Again, that five, seven day window is going to put you in a safe variety and then fermentation will generally take care of the rest of that. From a standpoint of nitrates, harvesting it as hay is not going to change that. It's going to stay there. I know when I was an extension agent in Tennessee years ago, calls come in about January, I got some dead cows, I just put out a bale of this feed. What happened was nitrate toxicity. 
we saved the good stuff till later to feed when it had that snow event or real cold. So don't get caught like that. From a feeding standpoint, I would tell you early lactation, mid lactation cows, the BMR varieties are going to give you more energy, support better intake, and certainly be uh, better when you look at the milk tank. Whatever varieties you use, you need to balance those rations, keeping in mind the differences in the NDF as well as energy that that forage is going to provide you. Non BMR varieties, we could position those in late lactation cows that don't. Uh, they've got plenty of capacity to eat and maybe don't need to eat as much as what they will or as good of quality. So if you're short on corn silage, you could push this out there and push more corn silage to the higher producing cows. Certainly dry cows and heifers, it's a good fit there. And there's a lot of data to show that these work very nicely here with those. Corn silage, alfalfa is still going to be the king and queen of forages. But I think when you look at warm season, uh, forages, they can have a place in your forage program here to provide some digestible fiber, energy, and help fill those bunkers there as you need it. So with that, I appreciate you being here. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer those. Yes, sir. Yeah, how does the uh, NDF digestibility of a warm season BMR variety compare to a BMR corn silage? I don't know if anybody has done that. I suspect if you look at NDF digestibility based on the normal corn silage varieties and think about some of the values of seed, they should be very similar. The thing you still get with corn that you're not going to get with the, the warm season is the additional starch and energy. They're still going to have a higher energy value there all the way through. Again, you got to, you're not, it's not necessarily apples to apples when you're looking at these because a, a corn silage is a different forage in itself. But the, the fiber in the BMR forage sorghum is going to be at least as digestible as that in the corn silage or maybe even slightly more. But energy that the cow gets out of it may be a different issue in total, okay? But it is something you need to look at. Yes? Okay, in um, what was the yield on our second crop versus the first crop? And we didn't have the best soils there at the station. We had some uh, land that had a little more roll for South Georgia. Um, and, and, um, but we would get somewhere 25 uh, ton per acre on the first crop at 35% dry matter. Second crop would be somewhere 16 to 18, depending on what the weather was. Uh, it's hard to get that second crop matured out. Generally about Labor Day, we finally start getting some nighttime cooling and day length starts to shorten down a little bit. We still can get some heat but that takes a long time to mature on out. So that hurts us on yield. Well, on the, on the forage sorghum, uh, we would cut it at the same height we were cutting the core. No, it would be about six, eight inches high. No, you don't have to raise it up. It'll stubble out, and rather than coming back one plant, it'll come back multiple plants through there. So it, it bushes out a little bit. I think in the interest of time, we'll, we'll cut off questions there. John will be around for yes. additional questions afterwards. Let's uh, show John a round of applause for uh, his presentation this morning. Really good Thank talk. You.
Well, thanks for being here. Uh, I know this looks like a small group, but uh, we're very special because I know uh, it's we all have one thing in common, and that is we're all leaf lovers, right? So that's that's why we're here, and and for good reason. Because what we're going to do today is, as Dennis mentioned, we are going to uh, cover a prediction equation that we developed that can uh, take the nutrient profile of a ground sample of alfalfa and predict its leaf content with, uh, with high accuracy. We're going to start out talking a little bit about the implications of, uh, of, of leaves versus stems in alfalfa, uh, a lot about the development of the equation, and then lastly, how it can be applied uh, by growers and uh, dairy producers. I, I think everybody knows that, that um, leaves are a major factor affecting the quality of alfalfa. And in fact, uh, in our audience today, uh, Dr. Undersander at University of Wisconsin has studied this extensively. And what he's reported is that leaf percentage can account for 71% of the variation in the quality of alfalfa. And the major reason behind that is because there's a huge difference in the relative forage quality, or RFQ, between leaves and stems. And you'll see various numbers quoted, and I'm gonna show you some different ones, slightly different ones that we have from our lab. But uh, the important thing is, is that the RFQ value of stems is probably, of leaves, excuse me, is probably five to six times greater than what it is for stems. So if you lose leaves, you're gonna start losing forage quality in alfalfa quite quickly. And that's important for growers because they really do need to know what percent leaves are in their samples because uh, this will allow them to better manage the uh, growing and harvesting of their alfalfa. So the inspiration behind this whole effort for me <clears throat> relates back to some analysis that uh, we have performed in our laboratory uh, outside of St. Louis at Gray Summit, Missouri. So uh, obviously being an alfalfa company, we run lots of alfalfa analysis. And every so often we'll get a sample of alfalfa that looks like this. These are two actual alfalfa haylage samples uh, that had been submitted and uh, run for crude protein, neutral detergent fiber digestibility, otherwise known as NDFD, relative forage quality, which is a calculated index, and then neutral detergent fiber. What's interesting about these samples is they, they both have a reasonably high crude protein. They have extremely high NDF digestibility. This one's actually based off of a 28-hour NDFD. So our lab average for that would probably be in the 42 to 43 percent range, so quite high. But as you can see, uh, these, these RFQ values uh, are extremely low. I mean, some people would actually say this would be dry cow hay. And the reason behind that is because the NDF percentage is so high. Normally, you would think for a sample like this, it probably should be in the upper 30s. Now, if that protein was a little bit lower, say down in the mid-teens, and this uh, uh, NDF was up in the, uh, oh, let's say the low 50s, maybe even mid-50s, I would say that this sample was, had some grass contamination in it, it was probably an alfalfa grass mix. But what we found out upon further analysis is really what it suffered from was just leaf loss. It had a very low leaf percentage. Here in a moment, uh, whoops, we're going to uh, talk about the fact that standing alfalfa will typically have an average leaf percent of about 50%. So this has lost a considerable amount of leaves somewhere along its life, either in the field or during harvest. So again, Dr. Undersander has uh, explored the differences between leaves and stems in quite detail and has published results from that. And again, uh, we're going to show you some data from our lab on this as well. But uh, suffice to say that the difference between crude protein and leaves and stems is quite large, being much higher for leaves than it is for stems. Uh, furthermore, conversely, you'll see that stems are much higher in NDF than they are uh, in leaves. And the same effect has on, on fiber carbohydrate. That's what really drives then this big difference in relative forage quality. Now, any time that I see differences this big, what that tells me is that there's an opportunity to use these big differences in nutrient profiles to develop equations to be able to predict these two components. 
And that, you know, that's not just for leaves and stems and alfalfa, you can do that in lots of things. So I always like to say that uh, for those of you that have done experiments in maybe your graduate programs, you know, variation is always your enemy. You're always trying to control variation when you're running experiments. But when you're trying to develop prediction equation, variation is actually your friend because the more variation you can create, you can actually leverage that in order to develop these prediction equations. And that's exactly what we did uh, in, these, in this whole effort. The one thing, however, that I was also interested in is what kind of differences would we see in NDF digestibility in ash, which uh, Dr. Undersander hadn't reported here. So what we actually did this last summer was we collected uh, standing alfalfa samples at our West Salem, Wisconsin research facility. And uh, we took uh, 12 varieties that had been cut at three different harvesting schedules, 28, 33, and 38 days. So we got 36 samples. Uh, we obtained 100 grams of samples of each one of those. We dried them down at a fairly cool temperature so we didn't damage the NDF digestibility because that's one of the things we wanted to look at. And then after drying, we hand separated the leaves from the stems, weighed those two fractions so that we could know what percent leaves were in those samples. <clears throat> now, we didn't, delight, or weigh, or we didn't dry them down to absolute dry matter, similar dry matter, so at least we knew that, uh, what the percentages were. After the samples were ground at uh, one millimeter grind size, we analyzed them for all these nutrient components that eventually we're gonna to use to build this prediction equation. And that included dry matter, ash protein, again, neutral detergent fiber, neutral detergent fiber digestibility. All of these came out of what we call the Calibrate High Quality Forage Analysis Test. And this was done at our Forage Genetics Digestibility Lab at Gray Summit, Missouri, which is outside of St. Louis. So what we found from that was very similar to what Dr. Undersander had found, and that is there's this big difference between crude protein, between leaves and stems, being about 30% versus about 12% on stems. Big difference in NDF content, in fact, a very large difference, about 60% in stems, about 20% in NDF. So this is looking real promising because big differences allows us a greater opportunity to build prediction equations out of this. What's also interesting, though, is there was a lesser difference in ash content, but there was some difference, and interestingly enough, the ash content of leaves is higher than it is for stems. The NDF digestibility, surprisingly, why it was greater for leaves than it was for stems, like you would anticipate, the difference wasn't nearly as large as I thought it would be. Uh, consequently, remember this difference being lesser in ash and NDFD because that's going to be a little bit more uh, interesting once we get into the prediction equation. And of course, what this ended up in was, as Dr. Undersander had found, big difference between the RFQ in leaves and stems, maybe not as large as what he had seen, but we're still seeing about a 5x or five times greater RFQ for leaves. Other interesting thing in this particular data set, when you look at the standard deviation, which is a, a measure of the variation amongst those 36 samples, in no case did the standard deviation exceed 10% of the mean. And I would have thought that maybe the composition of leaves and stems within a plant would actually change, or across plants would actually change more than that. But Dan's shaking his head. It really is pretty standard. So, you know, leaves and stems are a fairly known commodity you know, regardless of, of, you know, where it's grown. And in, in, uh, maybe even variety. So if we go back two years to 2019, this is when we started collecting samples then to take all this information to develop a prediction equation. So during the summer of 2019, we took 160 samples of alfalfa that we collected from FGI research stations at Wisconsin, Idaho, and California. Because again, we're looking for variation. We wanted to see samples of alfalfa that had big differences in, in NDF content, big differences in leaf content, differences in protein, so we could develop a really robust equation. So to do that, across those stations, we had 43 alfalfa varieties, three cuttings, first, second, and third over four different cutting schedules, being anywhere from 28 to 38 days. 
Now, before anybody asks a question at the end of the, of the uh, presentation about what influence did all of these have on leaf percent, I can't tell you because these samples were all collected from ongoing research trials. They were not collected in a balanced way across all of these locations, so I really can't pull out their main effects. Again, I was just looking for variation so we could develop this prediction equation. Again, like we had done before, we dried them at a fairly low temperature. We stripped the hand stripped the leaves from the stems. We weighed them, recombined them, ground them over one millimeter screen, and then analyzed them again for dry matter, ash, protein, NDF, NDFD at our lab at Gray Summit. <clears throat> so then we started comparing those leaf percentages that we, we've measured by stripping the leaves from the stems with their nutrient profiles in a process they call stepwise regression analysis. Now that's not real important, but what it means is we start building prediction models based off what's the best one nutrient model, you know, one nutrient containing model, two nutrient, three and four, okay? And what we found out from the process was NDF crude protein, NDFD and ASH were all significant terms. They all did a, were all contributing to our ability to predict leaves just from these nutrient profiles in a ground up sample of alfalfa. Subsequently, we found that ASH contributed very little to the prediction equation and we just dropped it from the equation. <clears throat> and the major reason I did that was because of potential soil contamination. Shouldn't have really anything to do with leaves. It's kind of a wild card. NIR really doesn't pick it up directly anyway, so we just left it out. And we're going to talk more about that equation here in just a minute. So the resulting prediction equation explained 84% of the variation leaf percentage in the 160 samples. And that's all I'm going to talk about that equation right now because nobody should ever use a prediction equation to validate it. So that's what we did the next, the next year. We picked out in 2020 40 brand new samples from two of those research centers. It was the one in West Salem, Wisconsin, the other one in Davis, California. Did the same thing. We dried them, stripped the leaves, weighed them, figured out what the percentage was, recombined them, ground them to over a one millimeter screen, analyzed for all those nutrient profiles. But this time what we did was we put them through that prediction equation that we had developed in 2019. So here's a completely independent set of data put through that equation. And what you're looking at is how good a job did it actually do in predicting what we measured in a totally different set of samples. <clears throat> and this is what we, we discovered. So what's plotted here is the predicted percentage of leaves in those 40 samples versus what was actually measured. And I plotted it here so that we could look at some statistics. Now, the first thing you'll know is that it you know, kind of would have been nice if these samples had been distributed across the spectrum of leaf percent. But again, I was just grabbing samples from ongoing experiments. The luck of the draw was is we got them at each extreme of the distribution. Now, that's what drove this high R squared value, so you can pretty well ignore that. But what is nice is that when most prediction equations fail, they fail at the extreme of your sample range. These actually perform pretty well at the extreme, so much so that the standard error of the prediction was 2.8. Now, what that means is that 2.8 is on average how much it is off. So it's off by 2.8 percentage units of leaves. That's the difference between each one of these predicted points and what its actual value was, okay? Now, that probably doesn't mean much to you, but typically when you're trying to predict a fixed value like protein or NDF, and in this case leaves, you should be able to do as good as about 5% of the mean. And as I'm gonna show you in a minute, the mean percentage of leaves in alfalfa is typically about 50%. So 5% of that's 2.5% leaves. We got down to 2.8. This equation's about as good as you can expect, all right, as far as its error. However, it did have a bias of 3.2, and what that means is it was over predicting by 3.2 percentage units of leaves. So here, when it was actually 50% leaves uh, observed, or 45% uh, leaves observed, 
it was actually predicting about 53. So we needed to fix that. So what we did was we took these samples, we threw it into the 160 that we had from the previous year, reparametized our prediction equation, and we came up with what we call LEAF, leaves enhance alfalfa forage. So now we have 200 samples, and what it does is it predicts leaves and alfalfa in a ground sample, strictly from its neutral detergent fiber, protein and uh, NDF digestibility measure in that ground sample. Here's what the statistics look like. So here's the predicted values, here's the measured values, the R squared value is 84. So it's explaining 84% of uh, the ability to predict leaves. The other 16% is coming from something else. Um, and the nice thing is we got rid of the bias because that line right there is the best fit line and it lines on the, or lays on the line of unity. So now 60% measured is 60% predicted and the standard error of the prediction is still 2.8. So I've spent a lot of time basically indicating to you that um, when you get this on a lab report, it's, it's had a lot of work put into it, and it's pretty doggone accurate when you consider it's just a ground sample of alfalfa that you're using to predict it. So now that we've got this prediction equation, what we thought we'd do is let's go in and see what we can do with commercially available alfalfa samples in the marketplace, and, and what does it mean? You know, what, what can we do with this equation? What do we do with the numbers? So we grabbed 360 samples that had come through our lab from across the United States in 2019. They were analyzed at our, our lab, like I said, at Gray Summit. Had a wide range in quality. They varied in NDF content from 16 to 67%. That's pretty wide range for alfalfa. Crude protein, 8 to 30. NDFD from 34 to 62. And the calculated leaf percent was 10 to 77%. That's about as wide as you can anticipate for alfalfa. And here's what that distribution looked like. These are number of samples for that 360 sample set, which are representative of really a fairly broad spectrum of commercial samples from 2019. This is the same, a similar distribution chart from the original 200 calibration samples. The average from the calibration sample was 52% leaves. From the uh, samples from uh, the field from 2019, it was 48. So typically standing alfalfa based off this data has about 50% leaves. Now that's before you cut it down and start hassling with it, right? It's 50%. Standard deviation is about 10%. What that means is that typically the mean plus or minus one standard deviation is two thirds of the population. So if you want to know what typical alfalfa look like, it would be 50 plus or minus 10, 40 to 60% leaves based off this data. Now, you know, is it gonna look like that every year? I don't know, but for, you know, for these sets of samples, it's probably a pretty good starting point. So the next thing I did was I took that sample from 2019, that, that sample set from 2019, checking my time here. I put it through the RFQ equation, which again, Dr. Undersander helped develop years ago, and I plotted it against the percent leaves. And what you'll see is that it's a curvilinear, it's actually an exponential relationship, which means the more leaves you, pers you are preserve in your hay or silage, the bigger payback you get on RFQ. That's a pretty good thing, all right? So then I developed this equation and I back calculated what the RFQ would be for different percentages of leaves over this range that we said was typical for alfalfa, 40 to 60 percent. So what you'll see is that, you know, for 50 percent alfalfa from this set of data, RFQ is 172. That's pretty typical to, you know, Randy Welch, what people would say was around a 180, you know, for, for a typical good alfalfa. But at the low end at 40 percent, 132 at the high end of 60 percent leaves 224. Seems pretty reasonable. What I was really interested in, however, is what effect does the rate of change in leaves have on forage quality as we measure it using RFQ? So I did that by measuring the slope of that line between 40 and 60%. It's slightly curved, but I did linear. 
And what you get is that a one percentage unit change in leaves equates to 4.6 units of RFQ. And that's pretty big. And what it says is, is that you don't have to lose very many leaves before you can turn really good standing alfalfa hay into dry cow hay pretty quickly, okay? So once we knew this, and Dan and I had been communicating back and forth, and, and Dan says, well, you know, I wonder what this means financially. And I said, well, I don't know, I guess there's a number of ways you can look at it. So Dan, being the inquisitive fellow that he is, got out a spreadsheet and he started sending me stuff, right? And then I'd send stuff back. So what Dan did was he, he developed a model, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this, Dan. But uh, based off of the tonnage loss, because I think everybody realizes that, you know, you do lose tons when you lose leaves. So let's say if the standing alfalfa is 50% leaves, and by the time you got it into a bale of hay, it's only 45% leaves, you lost five percentage units. If you usually yield about four tons of alfalfa per acre per year on that field, you've lost two tenths of a ton. That's 400 pounds. Now, that may not seem like a lot, but uh, you know, for those of us that can remember uh, what Richard Harris said in MacArthur Park, you know, if you leave the cake out in the rain, what are you gonna lose? You lose the icing, right? And the leaves is the icing on the cake. That's what ran off. So it has a really disproportionate damaging effect on the alfalfa, those 400 pounds of leaves that you lost. That was so, but you have the tonnage loss you have a crude protein differential loss because as we saw in all these graphs, there's 35% protein in the leaves versus the average of about 20 for the whole crop. But more importantly, there's this quality loss in RFQ because you know we said that there was this 4.6 unit decrease in leaves for every 1% that you lose in, um, in leaves. There was 4.6 unit loss in RFQ and if you assume about a $1 discount per RFQ unit, that's about a $4.6 loss per ton of hay from one percentage unit loss in leaves, which says that of the $7 per ton per unit loss that Dan calculated up, the vast majority of it is quality loss. It's the RFQ loss. And that's because if you remember that, that previous graph, as the leaves increase, the RFQ goes up in an exponential way. So that's why you can lose value on hay pretty quickly uh, with leaf loss. So at this point, I wanted to recognize uh, work that Randy Welch and his team have done uh, with Winfield over, gosh, Randy, the last four years. Randy's had a passion for uh, tracking leaves in, in very creative ways from the time that it's been standing until the time that it's ended up at a harvested state, and uh, these losses can vary considerably depending upon the way it's done, obviously, and, and where it's going to end up. And from that, uh, that's helped develop some, some goals that you can try to uh, shoot for when you're looking at these values that are generated by this equation. So we talked about 50% you know, is what you would expect on average when it's standing in the field. Well, you can't really expect that to be what you should expect in a bale or a bunker because you're gonna have some losses during harvest. Five percentage units is not unusual. So if you've got greater than 45% leaves in a sample of a baled hay or in a bunker of silage, that's probably okay. You probably don't need to take any action. You're gonna lose some leaves, you probably can't help it. If it's getting down to 40% leaves in that sample, uh, you probably have had some leaf loss occur that you probably can do something about. There's probably room for improvement. And then lastly, you know, if it's less than 40%, you've got some significant leaf loss, you probably need to uh, contact your agronomist and really talk about some things that you can do to prevent that leaf loss. Because at this point, if you've got some elite genetics in that field and you've done a really good job of, of planting that crop and nursing it along, and you've got 10, you know, this is 10 percentage units, 
which is 20% leaf loss, uh, it's probably going to look bad on a lab report. And you tell that hard work is basically left on the ground in the field. So what can you do? And this is a better topic for Dan to cover than me, so I'm going to go through it really fast. Uh, things like fungicide application, uh, particularly in, in periods of time when uh, it's very humid. Uh, disease pest resistant varieties is another good way to try to evade it because unfortunately any stress that's put on the alfalfa plant usually results in loss of leaves. <clears throat> and then finally, the biggest one of all is probably harvest management. And Dan, I don't know what the biggest part of that is, but I'd say it's probably uh, turning windrows when they're, when they're too dry, less than 40% moisture. You're gonna have a lot of leaf loss. I did wanna spend just at the end here, just a couple of quick um, comments for people who, uh, who like to measure things like this in the commercial lab world. And this is a little bit more information about that equation. As I mentioned, the significant terms in that equation were NDF crude protein, NDFD, and ash. The component that was the most descriptive in that equation, and it had the highest sum of squares, which is a statistical term, is NDF, and it's a negative coefficient. And that makes sense because stems had a higher NDF content than leaves did, all right? Next in order was crude protein. It has a positive coefficient. It had an intermediate sum of squares, so it was the next most important coefficient in that equation. And then lastly was NDFD, and interestingly enough, it's a negative coefficient. Sometimes these uh, empirical equations will fool you. Ash contributed very little, and we left it out. So somebody could say, well, why don't we just use NDF as a way to predict leaf percent in alfalfa? And the reason I wouldn't do it is because of this. Including crude protein and NDFD will help the improve the detection of samples containing foreign material, which in alfalfa case is going to be grasses and weeds. So this equation probably should not be used in samples that have grass in them. And it's for two major reasons. One is it wasn't developed with any samples that had grass in them. It wasn't validated with any samples that had grass in it. Thirdly, I don't think you can interpret the results. And the reason why is because if you have a sample of alfalfa that's got 20%, let's say I had a sample and you got 30% leaves in it, and you know there's grass in it. Let's say it's got 20% grass, so it's 80% alfalfa, so it's 40% leaves on average, so a 30% leaf percent, that's a good value. But let's say unknown to you, it's got 50% grass in it. It's only 50% alfalfa, which means it's 25% leaves. 30% leaves is a good value, so you can't really interpret it. So it's not only unreliable, it's uninterpretable. If you got grass in the samples, don't use this particular equation. Lastly is the fact that um, nutrient values used in this equation came from the Calibrate HQ test. Um, consequently, uh, there's no reason to believe that this equation would have validity with values that came from any other lab test or any other values of NDF crude protein and NDF from other labs. And here's an example. <clears throat> These are two actual samples of alfalfa. This one's called Rounds Third. This one's Big Square Hay 2021. These are the values that came from the Calibrate test, and that's the leaf percentage that resulted from it. This came from another commercial lab. These were their inputs, and it predicted leaf percent that was eight units lower. Nothing wrong with these values. It's a lab bias issue, but it does have a fairly substantial effect on the resulting leaf percent. However, in this case, when you compare this different sample, it was only off by two, so you just never know. So how do you get access to this? Submit your samples to a licensed lab for the Calibrate HQ analysis. These are the labs that are currently offering it today. Uh, if you have any questions, however, you can contact info at calibratetechnologies.com and they can provide you some more information. So, in summary, leaf uh, test is a predictive equation to help determine leaf percentage of alfalfa in a ground sample. It can help growers make management and agronomic decisions on their operations. Leaf percentage can account for 71 to 88% of the variation in forage quality, making it very important. 
Uh, leaves have a relative forage quality on average of about 440, whereas stems are around 80. Typically alfalfa has a 50-50 ratio of leaves to stems. Ideally, you should have at least 45% in your sample. If you're falling down to that 40 to 45% range, there's room for improvement. If it falls below 40, you've had significant loss, probably need to do something about it. And uh, not only could leaf loss account for changes in quality, but can impact, impact your overall yield. With that, I, I appreciate all your time, and uh, I'm available for questions. And it is warm in this room. Uh, you, you're to be congratulated for uh, staying. <laughs> Yeah, so Dan was asking um, <clears throat> if we had any idea what the uh, variation would be in the genetics, uh, across genetics, or across varieties, right? Yeah, and, and again, our data set was unbalanced. I didn't look at it <clears throat> because I thought it would become interesting and I might be biased. <laughs> but um, the nice thing is, now with this tool, people can actually go and, and look at that and see, we are, we're gonna start incorporating this and following it in our breeding program. I don't know if, you know, it's not necessarily a target, but it's just something we'll follow and, and we'll see. Because I, I don't know if anybody knows what the heritability of leaf percentage is. Um, I don't know if it's high or low, but uh, it's probably something, it's obviously something that's worth paying attention to. Yeah, Dan. We didn't do a clear test of all varieties, but I have worked with a bunch of varieties, and there isn't much difference among the commercial entries. You can get extremes on both sides, drought stress samples, things like that, but under normal growing conditions, that 45 to 55 is a pretty good number at the bud stage, which is one thing that he left off. As it matures, you'll have some leaf loss. Excuse the interruption. You know, I appreciate that. That's what happened when you have a ruminant nutritionist give a, a talk about plants. Yeah. Another question. Sure. You compared the equation using that versus a commercial lab equation. What if you use commercial lab on both, you know, consistently use the same lab? Would that make, would you be able to predict at least the, the range of variation? Right, yeah so, yeah, so if a lab were to go through the same process, they should be able to develop an equation that's just as accurate. And, and that's one reason, you know, if, if, they, if, if a lab would want to do that, uh, you know, we have said that this methodology will work. It's a lot of work. I never thought that stripping 200 samples of alfalfa would be that much work. It's a lot of work to do. Yeah, that's yeah. That's what students and interns yeah, are for, right? That's right. <laughs> but uh, the only thing uh, I think that's probably important is the, predict the NIR prediction equations that you, you uh, need to predict the import inputs also have to be extremely accurate. So if anybody does do it, uh, my recommendation for the sake of the alfalfa industry would be to try to get those standard error of the predictions as close to two and a half as you can and, and keep monitoring and make sure to keep it there because it's obvious if it gets very much if it gets larger than that knowing how important one percentage unit error could be uh, it's probably not going to mean anything anymore and, and what we were trying to do is develop a test that was reliable enough that the industry would want to use it and take the time to stick with it to try to do a better job and uh, you know further improve the you know the reputation of alfalfa in the marketplace but but that pro the process does work and um, uh, it's but it's a lot of work 
I think we better cut it off there. Um, I can attest to how much work that is. I, I, for my PhD, I separated out uh, samples. Uh, I think there were 64 plots times th uh, five times a year times four years. Yeah, it, it's a lot of work, I can tell you. And I appreciate you all working on this. I, it's a great innovation. And, and I, I do have to point out, uh, I have to give you my USDA statement here. Uh, the mention of a product or a company does not imply a, uh, a favoritism or recommendation of that product. Uh, but we thought that this equation, this uh, innovation was significant and something of, uh, to bring forward to, to everyone's attention. It's got some major uh, nutrition implications, but also especially agronomy implications and management. Uh, how we manage the, our crop as we take it out of the field, and and also even things like uh, fungicides, uh, trying to protect those leaves and, and making sure that we retain as much of that leaf material as possible. So, uh, Dave, really appreciate you coming up today. Let's show uh, Dr. Weekly our appreciation for a great presentation.